Cardiocon, uh, welcome to day two. Uh, we are live now with this first session in Hall B, Grunzig Hall. Here we have a case of cardiogenic shock, and it's my pleasure here to uh, invite you all. The results of yesterday's quiz. Remember, we have quizzes that are happening. Last year, uh, last uh, uh, session, we had eighty-nine attempts, and we'll be declaring the winners at the end of the session today. And we have another quiz based on again the same. Uh, all the formats and the questions that we have based on the all the debates and the sessions that are scheduled today. So I encourage all the fellows to go ahead and uh, uh, start the uh, attempting that. So uh, uh, can we have the slides, please? So the first bout is on cardiogenic shock. So for the session, I invite Dr. Abhimanyu Kothari, Dr. Kilol Kaneria, Dr. Harsh Gonia as moderator, Dr. Raj Rawal, Dr. Gaurav Singh, and Dr. Jigisha Sachde as Chairperson, over to Chairperson to do the honors of introducing our elite speakers. What of you need to unmute? Yeah, please. Uh, our uh, first speaker will be Dr. Bhupesh Shah. He is a DM cardiologist. Uh, he is a senior interventional cardiologist at SCG Hospital and uh, associate professor at uh, SVC Hospital. He has completed his fellowship in cardiac science from. Uh, Charles Nicolas and Duran and France, and is a gold medalist in pharmacology also. Our uh, second speaker uh, would be from USA, uh, Dr. Aditya. He is a cardiologist and associate professor at uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center. Uh, he inserted impeller device and a stent through axillary artery instead of a femoral artery in the groin in a challenging case. Uh, he has a special interest in uh, cardiovascular diseases and interventional cardiologists. <coughs> Our uh, third speaker would be our own uh, Dr. Chirag Doshi. He is a CVTS uh, sir, senior surgeon at UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology in Ahmedabad. He is also HOD of uh, at uh, CVTS at UN Mehta. So uh, we are uh, dealing with a case of hyperacute uh, MI, uh, a young male uh, with a history of fever since two days. Uh, with a tachycardia with a hypotension on a <coughs> lower inotrop and he is also having fever since two days and a saturation of 94%. He also had an episode of VT which is uh, successfully deceverted. His uh, RT-PCR is averted and on ECO he has a moderate MR and EBG is showing acidosis with lactate of 4. So uh, what would be the preferred mechanical assist device for uh, primary PCI in this patient? Can we have the ECG? Uh, this is a 12 lead ECG showing a hyperacute MI with ST elevation in anterior leads. So, our preferred uh, uh, mechanical assist devices, whether it be Ampilla, ICMO, or IBP. So, I would like to invite our, uh, this is Anjo, showing osteoproximal LED occlusion. So, we can see the complex anatomy, osteal involvement, and again, there is a lesion in mid LED also. So, what are the things to learn here? Uh, acute anterior wall MI in COVID times. Whether we will go for the same strategy or anything new is there. Device assisted primary PCI in cardiogenic shock. What is the current status of IVP over the new assist devices? And what is the mortality benefit versus cost benefit uh, of MPLA? So, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Bhupesh Shah, to initiate his talk. Sir, please. Yeah. Just share the screen. Can you see my slides? Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, friends uh, and seniors, and uh, congratulations, Dr. Kamal. And uh, this is already being described the history of the patient, but. Uh, one or two important things which I like to mention here, that is the one is the history of fever here. In the Even in the patient is having the corona era, but still with the proper precaution, we can take this patient in the cath lab. Another thing was uh, low dose noradrenaline patient was uh, requiring. Third important thing, there was the ischemic mitral regurgitation, that is the 30 to 35 percent. So most important thing, when the patient uh, present with cardiogenic shock, ideally we should have the shock team 
And the most important thing is the types and the trends of the complication of the institution we need to know, because that is very, very important. Uh, let us uh, just go through very quickly the various stages. That is A, B, C, D, E, the A, the risk, B is the beginning, and the C is the classic. So here, we can say that this patient is having the NTOL MI that is <laughs> And the uh, patient is having a cardiogenic shock. I think we can uh, put him here somewhere around class uh, C. And there was one history that was, uh, DC shock was given, so we can have one modifier A here. So in these circumstances, we know that in all of uh, we cardiologists, we are very much tuned with the IBP. Our staff is very much uh, well versed with the IBP, and uh, we do not have any shock team in certain institutions. So I think in our setup, and also in this case, when the patient is having the class C approximately and uh, having the one modifier A, I think uh, IBP we can think of and uh, we can proceed for the intervention because we know in cardiogenic shock. Intervention which have shown that it reduces the mortality in the patient. That is the first thing. And what is about class C here, lactate which is more than two, that is low dose of the noradrenaline or supports which are being required. And we need to have more markers. What is the renal function in the patient? What is the urine output of this patient? What is the cardiac index? What is the right atrial pressure, pulmonary waste, etc.? So this is short team, which is a combination of the cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, intensivist, and then we have to take the uh, uh, decision in this particular case. So I think in this particular case, as the patient is having the ischemic mitral degurgitation, I think... Uh, uh, Still, uh, IBP, which is very important choice in this case because ischemic mitral regurgitation is there. Patient is having the blood pressure around uh, 80, 89. And this is, we need to differentiate between the decompensated heart failure versus acute cardiogenic shock. Here, uh, in uh, another multiple uh, predictors which are included in the ACS, MCS mortality risk score, this is very tricky. Because in this age, which is more than 60, which is given one point, lactose more than 2.5, one point, kidney injury one point, and the stage E one point. So if we go for the ACS, MCS so here, the patient is young. So only lactate. So here we can say there is only one point which comes as far as the mortality risk score is concerned, or point, only one score is there. We can see the predictor mortality and the observed mortality in the range of 20 to 25 percent which is there and uh, if we have the shock team of course this is the very important criteria uh, we need to know whether the patient is having the right side heart failure or not because right side dysfunction which usually uh, gives the high mortality in this patient but as the patient is having acute myocardial infarction with mitral regurgitation i think instantly we should put the patient on the IBP. Why IBP was uh, out, we know that uh, ESC guidelines which have considered that routine use of the IBP in the patient with cardiogenic shock is uh, uh, class 3. But we can see here that those patients who are having the mechanical complication like the ischemic mitral regurgitation, ventricular septal defect, still IBP is very, very important in this particular condition when the patient is having acute myocardial infarction. We need to establish the LED circulation as early as possible. This is how IABP, which was according to the European guideline, it was class 3, but still look at the American College of Cardiology classification, it is again the class 2B and the uh, level of evidence it is C. Why it is like that? Because in the majority, if you can look at this uh, ESC guideline, many of these uh, were based on the expert opinions. So I think we in our particularly setup, particularly in Indian countries, when the patient is having the acute myocardial infarction, Patient is on the low dose, no adrenaline, though lactate level was a little high. I think an uh, intra aortic pump, uh, aortic pump should be implanted. And first of all, we should open up this uh, uh, LED territory because there is revascularization, is the only thing which has improved the mortality in the patient. And IBP shock uh, 2 trial, we know that mortality was lower than expected. Ejection fraction was a little uh, high in that case. But 86% uh, of the cases, uh, we can see majority of the cases, this uh, IBP implantation, it was done after the intervention was over. This is very, very important. Of course, there were certain data that 
pre intervention and after intervention but majority of the patients ibp was implanted later on but this is a subgroup analysis when the age is less than 50 if the patient is having no history of previous myocardial infarction there is no history of hypertension some positive signals were still found in this trial as a result of which this is the young patient no prior history of myocardial infarction and uh, our purpose is to revascularize LED as early as possible. I think IBP is still effective and it works because these are the certain uh, studies such are there when the IBP was implanted before angioplasty, IBP after angioplasty. So if uh, IBP was implanted before PCI, we can see that is definitely it is the positive signal and the p-value was quite uh, significant in, the, in this case. And uh, this is the various, I think, uh, in subsequent this, uh, lectures, we are going to know more about uh, Impella and this uh, ECMO devices. We know that uh, IBP is very important. And later on, we can also upgrade to the further Impella or ECMO as and when required when the patient is having the history of, I mean, we are doubtful about the history of fever. And uh, we do not know what is the status of COVID in this patient. But still, when there is some myocardium, it is preserved. IBP, I think, still works. And we know the journey of Impella because in the previous trial, uh, Impella usage in acute myocardial infarction, the shock which has increased significantly. And uh, later on, it has shown the positive, you know, the PROTECT2, PROTECT3, now PROTECT4 trial, which is going on. And the most important thing is that prevalence of the acute limb ischemia. Because if we are going for the higher version of the mechanical support, the most important thing is the large board devices which are required. And we have to know most important thing, selection of the patient, right device in the right time, which is important, and explantation of the device is also very important. So if there is acute limb ischemia, and if it is left untreated, almost 100% mortality would be there in the hospital. So when we are going for the large board devices, very, very aggressively, we have to observe this patient. So this is the various uh, shock uh, trial. We can see IBP implantation. I think this is very important. And that is difference between the acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock and the acute heart failure because in the acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, hypotension, hypoperfusion, and ultimately they have congestion. While in case of acute heart failure, they are congested first, then hypoperfusion, and then hypotension will take place. The most important of our duty is that these are the cardiogenic shock loop. We have to prevent the patient going deep into the stage E. Uh, so this is how if the patient is not improving, then we can escalate the mechanical uh, cardiology support. And this is the cardio catheterization intervention this last month journal we can see that uh, what they are saying that this is very important we do not have still major trial we do not have much data and uh, still uh, uh, this M mcs mechanical cardio support these devices they are very expensive invasive intervention with inherent industry physician and the health system financial interest that may increase the utilization we know so a lot of trials which are still which are uh, required uh, to have this uh, Impella and the ECMO. We know that when the patient is having the D and extreme stage, this uh, Impella and the, this uh, ECMO devices, this is very important device. But still in this particular given case, I think uh, uh, IBP, we have to implant this patient and as early as possible, we should open up. Then we have to observe this patient and if urine output falls and cardiac index, which goes down, we can escalate. So before escalating the therapy, I think IBP is very important because whatever this uh, observation was, the majority of the cardiologists, I think 50 to 60% cardiologists instantly, they will put uh, IBP. So management of the cardiogenic shock is quite complex. Sky shock classification is a simple way to describe the patient and uh, only proven therapy to improve the survival in acute MI shock, that is the revascularization. So by all means, we have to revascularize the patient first. Significant knowledge gap uh, about data supporting the various percutaneous MCS device and uh, every device has the profile of risk and the benefit. And managing the sick patient, it is very critical to match the need with the tools which are available. So I think uh, this is very important. We can say that IBP still works in many patients, and particularly those who are having the mitral regurgitation, ventricular septal defect. When we want to have uh, 
very very rapid because our stock is also well versed particularly in our uh, indian setup so this is very substantial amount of the ibp use is there in our country need to be little a uh, bit more aggressive in terms of replacing the cardiac function ecmo and impella they are also alternative so this is i think in absence of the clear guidelines and the decision regarding the escalation so largely i mean largely guided by the goal of normalizing the hemodynamics i think uh, drugs which are being given our goal is to have the less uh, amount of this vaso support to the patient because they are again very dangerous first we need to put on the ipp then see what is the urine output of the patient what is the cardiac index of the patient whether the patient is in hypoperfusion multi organ defect or not and then we can escalate therapy to the impella and tandem and if there is right ventricular dysfunction then additional right ventricular support which is required so this is i think so <coughs> our uh, escalation which is done in the acute myocardial infarction with the cardiogenic shock so in this given patient having ischemic myocardial infarction i mean acute infarction ischemic mitral regurgitation is there and uh, our indian setup i think impella i mean ibp which is available in every setup while impella is not available so i think this is the uh, IBP, which is still effective and is going to work in this case. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Bhupesh Bhai. It was an excellent talk. Now you you explained your part really very well. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Aditya Bhardwaj from USA. Sir will explain about the role of impella in such type of the scenario. thank you thank you very much and uh, thanks for having me this is really a great conference uh, congratulations to dr kamal sharma and, and his team and so uh, today i'm going to argue for using impella as um, as the best strategy in this case or i would say at least as a first line strategy so uh, we we've, we've heard about the the clinical scenario we've looked at the ekg and the angiogram so just to summarize uh, basically this is a young patient with um uh, covid and acute mi cardiogenic shock and uh, like we talked about he's he's somewhere between sky stage c to d i would argue that he's actually stage d because he's failed uh, the first line which is usually um, uh, vasopressors and inotropes he's failed that and now he's requiring uh, mechanical circulatory support so he's he's deteriorating uh, he he also has ischemic uh mitral regurgitation it's moderate his lactate is 9 um i mean i think that's a, that's a very important uh, uh thing to remember that this is a really sick patient a lactate of 9 uh, all studies have shown that lactate is a significant predictor of mortality in these kind of patients so i think uh, uh it, it's very clear that we have a very sick patient who uh, who really needs help So uh I, I'm going to first uh, talk about uh you know a brief comparison between the different types of mechanical circulatory support uh give a brief overview of the different uh uh catheters within the impella family uh the hemodynamic benefits of impella uh best practices for use of impella and then uh, finally the use of impella for lv unloading even if we chose to put in an ecmo in this patient so uh um, Uh, so the types of uh, percutaneous mechanical circulatory support this is something that i think we're all pretty familiar with we have the balloon pump we have impella tandem heart and va ecmo uh, i'm not going to go into great details of all these because i think uh, it's pretty clear but i think the mechanism by which these different devices act is really important so like we know balloon pump acts by the mechanism of counter pulsation uh, impella is a, is a is a mcs that directly unloads the lv it it takes the blood out of the left ventricle and ejects it into the aorta tandem heart like we know is is basically an la to ao conduit and va ecmo like we know uh, it it's a uh, it, it basically draws blood from the venous side oxygenates it and pumps it back into the into the arterial system uh and we are all pretty familiar with the sheet sizes so definitely balloon pump has the lowest sheet size impella is somewhere in between 13 to 14 french and ecmo uh definitely uses much larger bore axis um but i think the thing to remember about impella is that it it decreases after load like we're going to talk about that's a very important factor and how it's it's very different from va ecmo which on the other hand increases after load impella increases mean arterial pressure it increases cardiac flow cardiac power it decreases lv edp and uh, lv preload 
um, it increases uh, coronary perfusion and it decreases myocardial oxygen demand. I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit as we go along, because that's a very important thing to remember if we're going to say that this patient should get impella first. Uh, before I go to that, a brief overview of the different devices in the Impella family. I think Impella CP and 2.5 are the most commonly used left-sided devices. Uh, CP gives you a forward output of uh, around three and a half to four liters per minute. 2.5, which we almost never use in cardiogenic shock, only used in high-risk PCI, uh, and really not even used much these days, gives about a two and a half liters uh, of additional cardiac output. Impella RP is a right-sided device. It's used for right-sided shock, and uh, it's put in percutaneously through the femoral vein. Then Impella 5O, LD, and 5.5 are all surgically inserted pumps, usually used by the cardiac surgeons. Um, and this, these require uh, arterial cut down or Impella LD is by way of direct surgical insertion. Now, all these three pumps are, are comparable to ECMO in terms of the forward cardiac output they provide. So it's usually five liters or above uh, that, these, that these devices provide. But again, like I said, they're surgically implanted. So hemodynamic benefits of Impella. So why do I say that this young patient should get Impella as the first line mechanical circulatory support? It's because of all these hemodynamic benefits that the Impella provides. So first and foremost, like we know, it increases flow across the aortic valve. So it increases the cardiac output and it uh, increases end organ perfusion. It increases mean arterial pressure, also uh, accomplishing these two things. But by far, the most important benefit of Impella is that it directly unloads the left ventricle. It decreases LV end diastolic pressure and LV end diastolic volume. And this is a very, very important uh, feature with no other mechanical circulatory support device provides. So what are the benefits of decreasing the LV end diastolic pressure and the volume? It decreases wall tension, which in turn decreases microvascular resistance, which in turn has two really beneficial effects. It increases the myocardial perfusion and increases the myocardial oxygen supply. And, and as a result of decreasing the left atrial pressure and decreasing the pulmonary congestion, there is decrease in oxygen demand. So, so this, is, this is a patient who's had a large myocardial infarction and he's in heart failure and cardiogenic shock. So one of the most beneficial things that you can do is increase the oxygen supply to the myocardium and decrease the oxygen demand by the myocardium. That itself is gonna help the native heart recover and you can actually prevent this patient from ending up with a lot of scar and potentially prevent situations of going into an LVAD or a transplant. Now, in addition to that, uh, Impella, uh, by decreasing LV and diastolic pressure and volume, decreases the mechanical work. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And there's hypothesis generating uh, studies from animal models suggesting that there's cardioprotective signaling and preventing reperfusion injury. Uh, now, there's all this stuff that I just said is all backed by data. Data comes from the CVAD registry, which is a global um, uh, multi center. Uh, registry uh, uh, comprising of uh, Impella patients. So, uh, you know, there, there are a large number of patients in this uh, registry. And here you can see there is different uh, um, hemodynamic uh, parameters that Impella improves, in, in, improves the mean arterial pressure, cardiac output, cardiac power output, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, and it decreases the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Cardiac power output, this is a very important hemodynamic index to remember when we're treating patients with cardiogenic shock. It's mean arterial pressure into cardiac output divided by 451. And more to come on that in just a little bit. Now, comparing Impella to balloon pump, um, uh, there was the ISAR shock trial, which is a randomized control trial. It was a really small trial, but nevertheless, it looked at uh, Impella 2.5 versus balloon pump in treating patients with cardiogenic shock. And just from this uh, trial alone, we see that Impella, and this was 2.5, it was not even the CP, um, significantly improves uh, the cardiac output. So you have the nat native cardiac index, which actually goes down. So the patient's native heart is resting while the impella actually takes over the function of the heart. And balloon pump, like we know, very modestly increases cardiac output, maybe by about 500 ml per minute, if at all. And, and this is actually a really cool slide, uh, which uh, I, I like to show uh, in my presentations. So this is basically a side stream dark field imaging that is used to look at sublingual microcirculation. This was done in an animal model. This was a, a patient, um, uh, an animal patient who was in cardiogenic shock. And this is with the Impella device turned off 
versus Impella device turned on. So like we talked about how Impella improves cardiac output, it improves end organ perfusion. So like you can see here, there's significant improvement in the sublingual microcirculation 48 hours after being on Impella support as compared to the baseline. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so I think this is also a really important slide. So I think we're, we're all aware of the hemodynamic support that different types of uh, uh, interventions provide, whether it's inotropes, balloon pump, ECMO, uh, or the Impella family of devices. They all increase the cardiac power output by different amounts, which, which we just talked about. Now, what about myocardial protection or PVA? Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that here. So when you talk about myocardial protection, let me tell you, inotropes, balloon pumps, and ECMO actually have a negative effect on, on myocardial protection. So it's almost counterintuitive and it's ironic that ECMO increases afterload and so do inotropes and vasopressors, which increase the afterload are, are putting further stress on an already failing heart in a patient with cardiogenic shock. So Impella is the only device which actually protects your myocardium and, and helps with native heart recovery. So going back to pressure volume loop, I think now we need to go back to the basics to understand why Impella is beneficial. So we're all pretty familiar with the pressure volume loop. Uh, so you have the left ventricular pressure on the y-axis and left ventricular volume on the x-axis. And we, this, as we know, represents the cardiac cycle. And so what exactly do we mean by myocardial protection and how does Impella do it? So there's something called the pressure volume area, which is a measure of the total mechanical energy that correlates with myocardial oxygen consumption. So it's made up of two things. There is the stroke work, which is the area under the pressure volume loop, which is a measure of mechanical energy. And there is the potential energy, which is, the, which is a measure of the stored energy. And, and the sum of these two is called the pressure volume area, which is, the, which is the stroke work plus potential energy. And this is the entire area under this pressure volume um, uh, graph. And so uh, I would actually refer those of you who are really interested in uh, basic physiology to read this paper by Dr. Brownwald published in 1999 in Jack, which extensively talks about this concept. Um, so like I said, you know, pressure volume area, it's a measure of total mechanical energy that correlates with myocardial oxygen consumption. So what Impella does is, so this red uh, line that you see here, the red pressure volume loop you see here is after a patient has been started on Impella as compared to this blue pressure volume loop, which is at baseline. So putting a patient on Impella actually shrinks their pressure volume loop by decreasing their left ventricular end diastolic pressure and volume. So what that does is it reduces the P PVA because it reduces the volume under this pressure volume uh, loop. As a result of which it reduces the mechanical and potential energy, therefore reduces the myocardial oxygen demand. Now, in addition to that, I told you that my, uh, Impella also increases myocardial oxygen supply. And the way it does, this, it does that is by decreasing the wall tension. And for that, we need to go back to the law of Laplace, which states that the wall tension is proportional to the maximum pressure by volume. So like I said, Impella reduces left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure, reduces the wall tension, reduces microvascular resistance, as a result of which it increases myocardial oxygen supply. Um, and this is, again, a very important concept to remember how Impella actually improves the coronary flow. And it does that by increasing the aortic pressure and by decreasing microvascular resistance. Both of these factors are, are an important driving force for, for coronary blood flow. And this is, again, a really cool picture. Uh, so this is actually... Um, uh, uh, the planar images from a gamma camera in a patient who had three vessel disease, who had CTO of his circumflex and RCA, uh, which was untreated. And uh, the LAD had a severe stenosis, which they opened up with Impella on and off. Like you can see here, uh, in the absence of Impella, despite opening up the epicardial artery, there's a significant perfusion defect as opposed to a protected uh, situation where you have the impella on, you open up the epicardial artery, and there's actually good myocardial flow in this area because all the capillary blood flow is recruited by way of unloading by the impella. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, pathophysiology and hemodynamics. So you, you may say, show me the data, show me the clinical data and best practices for impella using cardiogenic shock. Uh, how many minutes do I have here? 
Dr. Aditya, your time is up. Can you just sum it up in one or two minutes? Okay, sounds good. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, so, I, 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 so really quick, I'm going to quickly go through this algorithm of National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative, which you all know uh, is it was a was a multi-center trial uh, that was done in the U.S. and we at Loma Linda were actually part of it. We were one of the highest enrollers. So the basic concept of the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative is early identification of cardiogenic shock pre-PCI pre use of Impella. So I think that's a very important thing to remember. So it's not just important to open up the culprit artery, but it's important to unload the LV before you do it. And the use of right heart cath, which uh, Dr. Bupesh uh, Shah also talked about, uh, important to look at these indices, look at the cardiac power output, look at the pulmonary artery pulsatility index and decide which is the right kind of support device to use. And why was NCSI so important? Because we achieved 77% survival in NCSI. Uh, this is uh, you know, significantly better than all the previous shock trials like the IABP shock trial, culprit shock trial, and so on, which had survival only in the 40s to 50%. And this was the publication uh, that uh, we, we published. And before I finish uh, one last word, I think next we are going to hear about uh, use of ECMO in this situation, which is, which is definitely not unreasonable. But uh, the only thing I would add is that even with an ECMO in place, most centers in the world are today using Impella to unload the left ventricle, even with an ECMO in place. And I think data for that comes from this really nice circulation paper in December 2020, which uh, basically showed that the, you know, they, they looked at consecutive patients all of them got ECMO, about half of them had an Impella in addition to unload the left ventricle. And patients who had unloading with Impella in addition to ECMO had a much uh, reduced mortality at 30 day, despite a higher risk of vascular complications. So I think like we all agree, there is definitely a trade-off, but despite that trade-off, I think patients, when you unload them with Impella, they, they do better. So like I said here, uh, Impella has all these different hemodynamic benefits. Um, it helped, the, but the most important thing is that it helps with native heart recovery by decreasing oxygen demand and increasing supply. And when we're using Impella, it's really important to remember the best practices, early identification of shock, pre-PCI use of Impella, and use of right heart cath to guide decisions for escalation and de-escalation. And finally, I think even if we're considering ECMO, there should always be an Impella to unload the LV. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya Bhardwaj. It, it was an excellent talk. You very well explained about the Impella. Uh, of course, it's cost effective. We'll discuss later on. Uh, now, I would uh, like to invite Dr. Chirag Dosi. Actually, it's a pre recorded talk of uh, Dr. Chirag Dosi on ICMO, role of ICMO in such type of scenario. So, we can start the recording of the Dr. Chirag Dosi. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kamal Sharma and the organizing committee of CardioCon 2022 for having me here. I'm an esteemed company and I'm honored for being invited. I think Dr. Bupesh and Dr. Anand have elegantly put forth their points, but still I would like to suggest that ECMO would be the ideal choice for these 34 year old patients. And let me try to convince you as well. So let's review the case scenario. A 34 year old man, hyperacute MI with a two day history of fever, which I think cannot be ignored. As we all know, during this COVID times, we have seen so many sudden cardiac death in young individuals and a lot of them had coronary thrombosis. So this young male is tachycardic, hypotensive, on noradrenaline support and his saturations have st already started falling. So he had to be intubated. He had primary ventricular tachycardia and has been cardioverted with an ejection fraction of 25% with moderate mitral regurgitation and hypokinetic anaerobic territory. But the most alarming thing in this scenario, which stands out are his lactates are nine milligram percentage. And this is very important to consider in the decision making process. So we all know the sequence of events that follows a myocardial infarction. So this chart shows the sequence of events that 
eventually led to progressive myocardial dysfunction and eventually morts and death. There have been several trials that have evaluated this problem. The IBP shock 2 trial, which was a randomized controlled trial comparing IBP and OMT, which showed no mortality benefits at 30 days, 6 months and 1 year. Then came the IMPRESS trial comparing IBP and Impella. There was again no mortality benefits at 30 days. Then the most significant thing which occurred in the field of cardiogenic shock was the Detroit cardiogenic shock initiative and with their protocolized approach to the problem, they managed to improve the survival rate for cardiogenic shock post MI to 76% from 50% for the first time due to two decades. And this was a real eye opener for all of us. So early and effective device support is critical for survival. So as we can see, both the numbers of vasopressors and lectin levels correlate directly with mortality. Our patient already has in hospital mortality approaching 60% as denoted by this red line. Also stepwise escalations of support, delays treatment and almost 65% of cardiogenic shock patients receive Impella or ECMO only after failing IBP. So we have to intervene before the hemodynamic problem becomes a hemometabolic problem. And for this, the reason we have to provide adequate circulatory support to provide systemic perfusion, adequate ventricular support by LV or RV unloading, optimum coronary blood perfusion, adequate hepatic and renal unloading, and this will for the basis of our discussion regarding MCS device choice. Also, the pressure volume loop will help us make the selection. It forms the basis of understanding why we choose a particular device for MCS. The area under PV loop here in green corresponds to ventricle work, which directly corresponds to oxygen demand. So the device which reduces PV loop to the maximum best unloads the ventricle. And IBP works on the basis of counter pulsations and reduce relative myocardial oxygen demand. But having said that diastolic augmentation alone does not equal increased cardiac output and recent trials fail to show the clinical benefit. It is also important to note that counter pulsation require native LV pulsation as well and therefore has its own limitations. The more dysfunctional ventricles, the less functional an IBP becomes. In the PV loop diagram, the area remains the same as the afterload reduction is offset by the increased stroke volume and the ventricle is not sufficiently unloaded. The axial flow impeller devices unload the ventricle better than an IBP. Axial flow pump have drastic effect on PV loops as you can see here by they provide good unloading of the ventricle. But axial pumps have inherent disadvantages. They are very sensitive to afterload and their high RPM causes more hemolysis and seen in blue this graph increased level of plasma free hemoglobin in the blood compared to ECMO. Also in cardiac shock, we can never forget that about RV support. Only LV support isn't enough. People have stated using bipela, that is impella CP for LV and impella RP for RV. As you can see, VA ECMO is the only device on both groups and provide biventricular support. We all know impella has certain contraindications like mural thrombus in LV or RV, mechanical aortic wall, HOCM, aortic wall stenosis or calcifications, moderate to severe AI, severe PVD, significant RV failure, combined cardiorespiratory failure, and there are certain mechanical complications of MI as well as cardiac tamponade. Now let us consider the ECMO. There are five cardinals consideration for initiation and management of ECMO. 
one patient selections b convention strategy c lv venting strategy distal limb perfusion strategy or exit strategy that is bridge to recovery or bridge to destination therapy as we see with the red arrow with higher flows on peripheral va ecmo without an adequate venting strategy the shapes of pv loop changes what happens is lv afterload increases and lv edv and lv edp both increases and that is det detrimental for a myocardium which want we want to rest to simplify things the blue pressure volume loop is of a relative normal heart and the green pv loop is that of a heart in cardiogenic shock so what happens after applications of va ecmo without venting the afterload and lvdp and lvedv increases as seen in pv loop but we see that as soon as the vent in, we introduce lv venting to this scenario the blue pv loop is representing an ideally decompressed ventricle as we see there are several direct and indirect options to vent the heart we can do a small mini thoracotomy and directly vent lv or use a trans aortic catheter so each lv unloading strategy has its own advantages and disadvantages we will not discuss in the details right now so one thing to note from this article by next et al which compared impella and ecmo in a porcine model of acute myocardial infarction that ecmo has denoted by the red line results in much lower heart rate compared to impella and as we all know lesser rate translate to lesser, lesser myocardial oxygen demand also we have added advantages to assist cabg in non pci amenable lesions and this article by hamico et al confirms the mortality benefit of ecmo in such situation so in that study whenever the patient become hemodynamically unstable all lactate increase above 4 millimole per liter introduction of an ecmo perioperatively improved the outcome drastically so it is imperative that we take prophylactic steps to prevent lower limb or limb ischemia look at this patients he has a peripheral ecmo in one limb and in other limb there is ampulla and pa catheter introduction so a 6 french or 8 french sheath in both limbs to provide integrated flow which will prevent distal limb ischemia so our colleagues in italy have written an elegant review article which suggests that ecpella that is ecmo plus impella provides the best unloading strategy for a ventricle in cardiogenic shock Finally I would like to bring your attention to another excellent article by Kapoor and Esposito and they recommend a primary unloading strategy when the patient is in cardiogenic shock followed by reperfusion why they stressed on the aspect of time time is money as we all know but more importantly for us time is myocardium and primary unloading stop irreversible myocardial injury and leads to better myocardial protection and recovery they have also given an algorithm to guide us based on the measurements with help of a pa catheter and let's find out where our patient is with cardiogenic shock refractory to one anotrope with a cardiac index less than 2.2 surely with hypoxia and primary vt he is an ideal candidate for ecmo and lv venting and which would be one of the ideal option in this patients to achieve our goals of systemic perfusion ventricular unloading and coronary perfusion so thank chairpersons if we can discussion i think dr chirag doshi is here i don't know whether he can unmute himself uh, dr doshi can you unmute yourself we can have then discussion on that as well 
I think uh, my question to all of you, uh, Bhupesh Bhai, uh, Dr. Aditya and uh, Dr. Chirag, if you can hear you, would this COVID scenario change the dynamics of using a therapy amongst the three? Case mentioned that the patient had probably rat positive or, uh, you know, would, would having a COVID make it tilt towards ECMO? And I mean, in the first phase, it was different. In the last phase, it was different. I think now we have already courage to enter in the cath lab. And I think uh, IIBP is such a thing which is available everywhere. And Dr. Aditya has very nicely presented uh, on the uh, Impella. But I think if you ask cardiologists, 50-60% they have ten tendency towards IIBP. If you ask cardiac surgeon, they will think about uh, uh, this Impella and ECMO because that is there, there really because large bore... Uh, uh, this insertion which is required i think aditya yeah i mean i think the only situation where i would think of ecmo as first line is if this patient is in refractory uh, respiratory failure if we are having difficulty oxygenating the patient uh, because of uh, covid pneumonia in addition to cardiogenic shock uh, then i would think of va ecmo but if it is purely for uh, hemodynamic support i think uh, you know um, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, Impella is first line. I mean, we do it in the cath lab. Uh, it's uh, very quick to insert. Um, so I think we can get away without ECMO. So hemodynamic shock and the biochemical shock. So if patient is going for the biochemical shock, then of course we can go for a very escalation therapy. But when there is only hemodynamics are concerned, we need to prevent them to go into the cardiogenic shock loop, which uh, Dr. Aditya has shown. And Dr. Chirag has also shown. I think this is biochemical shock we need to prevent by all means. Chairpersons, moderators, any other question? I think uh, all hemodynamic parameter has shown that Impella is slightly better than IVP. All trials have shown that. Uh, but in uh, resource limited nations like ours, IVP will always have a place. Uh, we all know Impella is uh, available only uh, only at uh, limited centers. So IBB is going to stay in India, uh, and definitely Impella uh, in future would be a, a better option in such cases. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think this is one thing that uh, frequently comes up. Uh, so definitely the upfront cost of uh, Impella is more. But I think, uh, you know, again, uh, native heart recovery is, uh, is a big deal, especially for younger patients, uh, for all patients, but uh, definitely so for younger patients. You know, if you're able to uh, uh, prevent their uh, uh, myocardium from scarring, uh, you know, able to recover their LV function, prevent them from going into end-stage heart failure, uh, I think down the road, a lot of cost is recovered from that. Just uh, managing a patient with heart failure. I mean, uh, of course, if they if they need a VAD or a transplant, that we're talking about a lot of money. But even if they uh, survive without the need for a VAD or transplant, but with significant drop in ejection fraction, you know, we're talking about lifelong heart failure medications, possibly uh, ICD, things like that. So, I mean, those things can potentially be prevented by with native heart recovery with Impella, even though the upfront cost of the device is more. So that's that's the argument that I would I would say. Excellent discussion uh, between two speakers. I think Dr. Chirag Dosi is not there. Uh, Impella is definitely best, but in Indian scenario, there is a uh, still no availability of Impella in most of the centers. And uh, if at all it available, then to take the patient in the theater and insert the Impella and everything takes time. So before that, we can uh, go for the ICMO or uh, we can go for the IABP. ICMO is also some time consuming, definitely. But uh, nowadays, uh, ICMO is easy for us. Most of the centers are having the ICMO available. So we can... Uh, whatever the ICMO or the IIPP, whatever easiest uh, to insert and earliest to insert is the first choice. And then if Impella is available, then it's a great benefit for the patient, particularly such younger patients. But uh, Impella still, imagination of Impella at a first stage in the Indian scenario in all the centers is difficult. And uh, Aditya Shar, I would like to question you. Uh, how much time it takes to insert the impella when patient come, first come? 
door to impeller device in charge and time yeah that's a great question and actually like i mentioned uh, in national cardiogenic shock initiative one of the metrics that we had to meet was uh, instead of door to balloon of less than 90 minutes it was door to unloading of less than 90 minutes and uh, we actually met that metric in all these patients with cardiogenic shock so uh, you know we have a stemi activation when the er calls us and uh, dr bupesha actually mentioned the cardiogenic shock team so we actually have that at loma linda so whenever there is a stemi and that patient is in cardiogenic shock there is a shock team activation that goes out to everybody so the cath lab staff when they come in uh, knowing that this is a patient with stemi they know that it's they know that it's a cardiogenic shock so they prep the impeller device and uh, you know even though we are uh, predominantly radial uh, operators but when there is a patient in shock we always get femoral access for the same reason because we are already anticipating putting uh, an impella in so uh, it's it's really quick i mean as soon as the patient gets to the lab get the femoral access do a quick femoral angiogram go in with a pigtail get lv edp and put impella in so i would say you know uh, again you know we have we've met this metric of uh, door to unloading of less than 90 minutes uh, but if you're just talking about impella insertion i would say within 15 minutes we can get an impella in from from getting that groin access okay that's great and uh, would you go for all uh, blood investigation to take the patient in the cath lab before the procedure no not really uh, i mean all the blood is drawn uh but usually those the the results are not back yet by the time we we start the case so we just proceed we go ahead anyway uh the one thing that we have implemented in our center is to run an abg because you get a lot of information just by running the abg you get lactate and everything an abg is usually point of care so they run it very quickly in the emergency room so we have some labs available but but not all okay. thank you so much uh moderator can uh... have any uh, chat box question i think one chat box question is there okay so if there is no any question then we can conclude the session yes thank you thank you very much both the speakers all the three speakers uh, dr chirag is being connected but i think he is having some issue for the discussion but i could talk to him on phone Uh, thank you all the chairpersons dr jigisha dr gorav dr raj dr abhimanyu dr kilol and dr harsh gonia and thank you aditya it was great connecting to you and we'll be looking forward to have you and host you in uh, next year maybe hopefully thank you bupesh bhai and thank you dr chirag doshi bye bye take care bye 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 thank you very much thank you for the next session uh, we move to an interesting debate on rheumatic mitral stenosis for this i invite dr sunil karna dr kiran prajapati Dr. Tushar Bharti as the moderators, Dr. Priyankar Sena, Dr. Neera Bhalani, and Dr. Zishan Mansuri as the chairperson. Over to chairpersons. Good morning, and uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kamal sir. So, it is an interesting topic that uh, today we are going to discuss here. and uh, i would like to uh, introduce our first speaker for the bout uh, dr kamal sharma who is md dm cardiology dnb cardiology as well as dnb in medicine mnms fscc fsci the degree is going to justice to him he is the chairman and convener of the scientific committee of this cardiocon he is a senior interventional cardiologist with vast experience of coronary angioplasty stenting valvuloplasty pacemakers and pediatric interventions a combination of dn dnb and should i say on the verge of ias as well uh, he left uh, administration uh, he had been uh, selected for ias also so passionate clinician i would say apart from practicing at sal hospital also in un meta hospital and uh, is also been teaching the subject at bj medical college also been teaching the subject of cardiology as well as medicine has received and uh, worked hard for those 22 gold medals uh, for academic excellence during the medical studies and the uh, world's first uh, vagal nerve stimulation device in the anthem study was done by him he discovered winking coronary sign for vsr on angiography also known as kamal sharma sign of vsr uh, pri- uh, principal investigators in the trials like paradigm hf atlas timi tips serafin canvas more than 200 publication more than 1000 citations uh, more, sorry more than 10000 citations 
and awarded as excellent teacher by Gujarat University and the only cardiologist or I would say one of the rare uh, clinicians or uh, uh, physicians to have cleared the civil services exam in the first attempt is also an author of eight books and a lot many chapters that are uh, cannot be counted on the uh, fingertips. Our next uh, speaker would be Dr. Anil Jain. The legacy of his is unsurmountable. He is the owner, director and chief at Epic Hospital, Ahmedabad as a MS in general surgery, DNB in cardiac surgery, more than 28,000 cardiac surgeries in the span of 16 years with total arterial bypass, beating heart surgery, heart failure surgery, congenital heart surgery, wall repair, wall replacement surgery for atrial fibrillation and surgery for aortic dissection. So uh, an eminent surgeon and a very prominent name when you go in the uh, market. Our third speaker, next slide please. Yes, Dr. Tushar Shah, who is in uh, MS and MCH in uh, CTBS, has been practicing thoracic surgery for the last three decades. He had won uh, several gold medals and awards during his initial surgical training in Ahmedabad as well as Mumbai, one of the youngest recipient of Haryom Ashram Pradit Olympic Research Award in 1981, before I was born. So, interest in lung parenchyma saving surgeries for infective and malignant diseases of lung he started laser-assisted pulmonary metastatic tommy LFPM surgeries using 1318 nanometer diode laser for the first time in Asia in 2011. So I would like to welcome all the uh, speakers and uh, I guess we would start with the red corner uh, by Dr. Kamal Sharma sir. So over to you Dr. Kamal Sharma sir. Sir, you are not audible. Sir, unmute all your Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Zishan, for a uh, kind introduction. Uh, pleasure being having hosting you all and again speaking and with my colleagues and dear friends, uh, Dr. Anil Bhai and Dr. Tushar Bhai. Abhi aisa ho gaya ki agar Anil Bhai or Tushar Bhai nahi hote conference mein it's incomplete. So it's always fun to have you guys for the debate. So I'm going to talk about 33-year-old female, severe rheumatic mitral stenosis, Wilkins of 8, mild MR, severe pH, best, tra best strategy for him is going to be what? That's what I'm going to discuss. So this is the case. Uh, Dr. Zishan already mentioned that uh, a high gradient of severe critical tight stenosis with severe pH. So we have a three-cornered fight. And you need not guess who's not all the three heroes amongst the three who is not hiding his face is supposed to be the cardiologist because he doesn't have anything to hide. So he can be open and he can share so you know who is who. Why I would suggest and vouch for BMV, the reason one is just look at the STS course, how the surgeons interpret their own operative risk. If we were to look at the CMC, OMC or even MV repairs or MVR, look at the calculations designed by surgeons themselves. Mortality risk are almost one to one and a half percent. Reoperation rate 5%, morbidity or mortality 11 to 12%, and short stay is in minority of the patient. Long stay hangs to be in 7 to 12% of the patient as calculated by STS version 4. Compare this with BMV. Score less than 8, optimal results would be achieved in more than 90% success, less than 3% complication rate. Compare this with, say, complications here, which is almost four times, and 80 to 90% of sustained improvement even during the follow up of three to seven years. Reason two why I vouch for BMV is the guidelines. Look at any guideline, even the appropriate use criteria of 2017, or if you look at the ESC guidelines. All of them, they talk in the ACC guidelines, they talk about in mitral stenosis, it has a class 1A and 1B recommendation, even who are not high risk or who are not candidates for failed previous PBMV, even then it's 1B. First mention in these guidelines for surgery comes at level 2B, the mitral valve surgery, even when you're planning to do an LA appendage exclusion in severe MS, who have recurrent emboli while receiving anticoagulation also receives 2B. 
Reason three is it's an old data published from GB Pant itself. When they looked at the immediate randomization, and I'm going to talk about Indian patient and hence the Indian data. This is very old patient of Arora Ma'am, which shows talked about comparing the two, and it found out that the results were as good or even better with BMV with less complication. Internationally, this is one of the paper which actually changed the guidelines. Seven year follow up, Mohammed bin Farad's paper published in 1998, which looked at seven year outcome, and there was no early late but mortality or thromboembolism. between the three groups but mva was similar as compared to open surgeries residual asd was in only two patients so my surgeon friends may harp upon creating an asd it doesn't last there which actually is a beneficial thing that you can end up actually going through the pfo in most of them what about longer duration 12 years this is another data from bolletti et al long et al published when they looked at 912 patients followed for 12 years Overall survival rate of 20 years was 75 percent. This is the longest follow-up data that we can talk about. So surgeons can well uh, talk about you know valves lasting forever, which is actually not the truth, which I will again discuss. But uh, the BMVs do last for quite a long while, and this is our own paper published in Indian Heart Journal where we looked at even redo cases following previous mitral commissurotomy. So where surgeons have done BMV and OMC. or omc and cmc even those patients we did and uh, end up doing bmvs with fantastic results again you can see wilkins score was favorable in lean 2/3 68% of the patient uh, 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 in 31% of the patient most of these patients despite having and uh, having a wilkins score more than 8 after undergoing cmc omc actually ended up getting fantastic results This is the reason six, which is a new data, 2021. What about new si normal sinus rhythm? This patient is in normal sinus rhythm. AF group had less favorable outcome, but this patient is in sinus rhythm. And hence, compared the loop, it all published that the patient who do well uh, in on BMV uh, for the rhythm versus say atrial fibrillation, the normal sinus rhythm in this meta analysis of 6,000 plus patients actually did much better, especially in terms of the valve area. it doesn't mean otherwise but uh, you can do bmv and af afib as well but if you have normal sinus rhythm it's one of the important reason why you should go ahead and do a bmv of course the lesser complication out of 12% my surgeon friends may hop upon you create mrs and i have to rush no no that's not the case it's very rare that you get an and with mr in an improper technique or improper valve the survival rates in those patients actually who have mild to moderate mr it's better than compared to those who don't get an mr because the mr reflects probably a better opening of the valve so eight event free survival second pbmv heart failure requiring admission was significantly lower in patients who had significant mr post bmv as compared to those did not this did not mean severe mr but mild to moderate mrs post bmv are actually good in long term survival what about the comparison outcome per se with omc because i have to fight a double corner you have two surgeons punching at my jabs so i need to be debating that way so i'm going to take one of them one 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 by one so pbmv versus omc this is a 60 patient data from rice where they looked at the valve valve area going up from 0.9 to 2.1 as compared to only two so which is actually i'm not saying superior but surely non inferior actually probably surgery people are harping on being non inferior here after 3 years patients with percutaneous had a higher average valve area and a greater likelihood of nyha functional class as compared to patients who underwent open surgery now there is a the problem why the surgeons were wearing a mask why batman and spider man had to wear a mask because you end up replacing one disease with other this is not what i said this is what denton cooley said that leaving a prosthetic valve to a patient is replacing one disease with another and what is that disease it's a disease of prosthetic valve what is that the thrombosis or the bleeding what is the thrombotic risk in life threatening complication 1.8 to 5 per 7% per, per year per patient so that is per patient year you have very high risk of a patient coming up with a choke valve and then you will have to actually end up giving a thrombolytic therapy or maybe you'll have to reopen by doing another surgery what about bleeding if the patient is on vka 69% of vka versus 31% on even if they end up with prosthetic tissue valves tissue valve patients even on aspirin end up bleeding 
Three month post operatively, cumulative incidence of the combined endpoint was 9.2% VK, 11% aspirin, no difference observed in thromboembolic. So, VK aspirin should be have similar event rate of 10% during three years, three months after MBR in patients without prior AFib. Other my surgeon friends may harp upon is cost. Of course, balloon mitrals, even when you use new balloons, is going to be cheaper than having a replacement or open surgery. And on top of that, mere paas ma hai. So that's the mark card. That's the insurance that the government provides. You inflate the balloon uh, and, and, and uh, the balloon valve is actually better because you go fluoroscopically rather than a blind procedure like a closed mitral commissurotomy. What about duration of hospitalization? One to two days. OMC, CMC, MBR, even if you're a fantastic mini thoracotomy surgeon, five days. This is the pain, scar, anesthesia. That's all you end up. We just go from the groin. And remember, we are not even puncturing the artery for the sake of procedure. It's just the vein. The anesthesia, of course, we just do under local anesthesia as compared to endotracheal intubation. And this is how we actually have access not only to what we are doing, but also having a fluoroscopic look of inflating the balloon and controlling it and looking out for the procedure perioperatively by echocardiography. So... Why replace one disease with the another potential one? So the good news is that we have got very few customer complaints because the bad news is that most of the customers end up getting BMV. So you will have probably in the time of mitral stenosis may not have more patient complaining about valve thrombosis if they end up with getting more BMVs. Allied with the Joker's quote with the three uh, uh, heroes, I think the villain also has to come in. So who's, whoever fights monster should see to it that in the process, he does not become a monster. When you end up probably treating a disease, you should not replace that disease with another disease, which is a valve. Thank you very much. Over to chair. Thank you for patient hearing. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir. And uh, for the blue corner, I would like to invite Dr. Anil Jain, sir, for uh, his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Anil Jain, sir. Just yeah. mm. Just one second. Can you can you see my screen? Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, it's visible, sir. The presentation is visible. Yes, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, with all the bashing that uh, Dr. Kamal Sharma gave, I think uh, I needed a sip of water. So let's go ahead and see. You know, it's it's very easy for a cardiologist to say that surgeon can do nothing and they are like God. There was a time when cardiac surgeons were treated like God. And now today's cardiologists have come up and started saying, we are God, we can do anything you want. And oh, oh, oh. but they are the judge and the jury themselves. And hence they think that whatever they do is the best. Well, you know, actually, Kamal has forgotten to see what his patient is suffering from. The patient has NYHA class 3. She has got intermittent palpitation, which may be a symbol of fibr uh, which may uh, be underlying atrial fibrillation. And she has got severe pulmonary hypertension. And she has got a Wilkinson score 8, but there is no clot in LA. So let's see what happens. What is the aim of treating any patient with valvular heart disease? Our aim is to neutralize the disease. And survival and quality of life should be same as the age-matched population. I'm not talking of five years, six years, seven years. Patients should live as long as any other patient person lives of that age. And we want to neutralize the disease. How can you neutralize the valvular heart disease? If you get the patient 
into a normal atrial and ventricular function. There is no rhythm dis disturbance and perfectly normal long-term function is what we are aiming at. You're not looking at, she's 30 years old, 33 years old. She's got to live for 80 years. You can't talk of six, seven years of stuff and say that's okay. How can we do this? We should get her valve area more than two centimeters squares, and we should try to get her back into a permanent sinus rhythm where there is no episode of palpitation at all and resolve her symptoms. Mitral valve is not a simple thing. It's got cordy, it's got papillary muscle. There are two leaflets. I think I would like to invite Kamal one day to the theater and show him how complicated this valve is. Not something just to be blown up with a balloon where you don't know what's being blown up. So if I was a surgeon, what would I do for this patient? I would do a commission to complete, complete valvotomy. We would ligate the LA appendage. We will go down to see the subvalve, the cordy, split the muscle, split the cordy, remove whatever pathology is there, decalcify the leaflet, do a biatrial maze. And if this patient has got tricuspid regurgitation more than moderate, or if her tricuspid analysis is more than 40, I would also like to repair that. Mind you, this patient got severe pulmonary hypertension and she can have moderate TR. And by all the guidelines, if there is more than moderate TR, when you are addressing mitral stenosis, atrial uh, tricuspid valve repair is must. I have seen more suffering and more misery with tricuspid valve repair than I have seen with primary valvular heart disease. So surgical exposure is wonderful. There's a lot we do on the table. We split the commission, split the submetral apparatus, uh, split the papillary muscle, split the cordy. We make it absolutely normal and we put a ring. And what do we get at the end of the day? We get a patient who has a valve that has no mitral regurgitation or maximum mild possible regurgitation. We would aim for an area of more than two centimeters and a normal sinus rhythm with an LA appendix that's ligated. So basically, all the pathology has been corrected. So what have the results been? You know, what is the actual survival of a good open mitral repair? 94.6% at 14 years. Sorry, it's not four years. And an 83% at 14 years free from reoperation. And there is this uh, particular uh, study by Antunes, who was one of the uh, leaders in valve repair and leaders who promoted valvular heart surgery. He says that there are not one, but so many patients who have, you know, more than 20 years of survival without any reoperation, without a problem. I'm sure all of you have seen a patient of CMC, who, which was done maybe 20, 30 years ago, and still the patient has a valve area of more than 1.7 or 2 centimeters. In this study, he said that most of the patients who had pre-operative uh, valve area of 0.99, post-op had areas of 2.88 centimeters square or more, and 37% had more than 3 centimeter valve area. Means that's the normal mitral valve. That's what the surgeons aim for. We don't aim for slipshod or half-hearted jobs where we just blow up a little bit of commissure and say, oh, the patient is okay. We look at 98% freedom from uh, reoperation, 98% freedom from mortality. We look at 98% uh, freedom from complications. This is what we aim at. This is what valve areas we look at. More than 2.53 centimeters means the valves have to be wonderful. They have to look like brand new valves when you go and repair it. It's not just opening a little bit of commissure that makes a person okay. So let's get that one clear that surgeons do a very nice job, a complete job. And what if I'm on the table and the valve is not okay, I can just go in and replace it. Not like, you know, you've got a leaking blood into L, into the pericardium where something is punctured or a severe MR and the patient suffers all night. And in the morning, you come and tell me, oh, that patient has got severe MR. Can you do him now? And by the time that patient is dead, it's not like that. We can just go and straight away change the mitral valve and put a new valve. And prosthetic valves, they are wonderful right now. You have an actual survival of more than 75% at 15 years. And let me tell you, new valves are on the block. There is a new trial valve that's coming, which will not need anticoagulation and will last for the patient's life. It will be a game changer as it comes by. So surgeons have not said the last word yet. Let me tell you that. There's a lot that's happening. And there are not one, but ample number of trials that show 15 and 20 year data of mitral valve replacement or aortic valve replacement, where prosthetic valve patients have done very well. And I'm sure, Kamal, in your OPD, you must be seeing some patients that we operated in 95, 96, when I was at UN Meta or Institute of Cardiology, and they're still coming back to you for follow up. So prosthetic valves do well. Not all of them die with thrombosis or problems. That people die. Some patients die. And most of the data everywhere says that definitely repair is better than replacement, but replacement itself is not bad. So what should we do? Repair or blow up the valve? 
can sur surgery can neutralize the disease but can bmv give a better result let's see what there is to be said now look at this you have said that the wilkinson score is 8 what does wilkinson 8 mean let me tell you that wilkinson is a very vague scoring wilkinson score is a very vague thing it just talks about mobility thickening some calcification something like that there are four criteria and you just make eight out of this but does it look at commissional calcification no it does not look at commissional calcification does it look you know it, it that is the most singularly important thing in a valve does it have commissional calcification or not and there is nothing about that in wilkins score about commissional calcification so what are the limitations of wilkins score all the cardiologists jump around oh wilkins score 8 let's do it it has many limitations number 1 it doesn't look at commissional calcification it's very observer variable a observer may think this valve if it is good the other one may think it is bad and i've always seen even if i show them a report of 8 the cardiologist will say i'll have a look then he goes and have a look and there is no this one is calcified this one the commissures are not good something is wrong so let me tell you we are going on a very very you know a score system that is not perfect it has nothing about it 8 means nothing according to me so if you ask me and again wilkin score does not have anything about contraindication can you believe a score that there is no contraindication anybody according to this 16 scoring bus the risk is low or the risk is high go ahead and do a bmv you don't know what the leaflet is like you don't know what the commissures are like just a little bit leaflet thickness little bit the subval fibrosis and just go and do a bmv wilkinson is 8 i am happy wilkinson is 9 i am happy two observers if you sent for an echo both will give you different results on wilkinson so that does not mean anything let me tell you more than that does wilkinson identify the high risk subsets no you just look at wilkinson go and do a bmv no it's not like that acc ah and esc all have defined certain high risk criteria they say whether the anatomy is good or bad there are certain contraindications to bmv and in that they have mentioned atrial fibrillation and severe pulmonary hypertension this patient has severe pulmonary hypertension intermittent palpitation which definitely stands for Uh, atrial fibrillation in the developing means her left atrial appendage is already hypertrophied and she can get into trouble now what is a successful bmv have you ever heard what is a successful bmv a successful bmv is where the valve area becomes double or there is a 50% improved from the previous valve valve area do you know when a cardiologist comes and said valve fully gauge hai means from point 8 he has made it 1.6 and i would like to ask the audience how many have you seen valve areas post bmv that cross 2 cm in my life till now i have not seen one valve that has come with an area of more than 2 cm 1.5 is excellent result they will write excellent mild to moderate mr bmv area 1.5 this is very good but does everybody in the audience think 1.5 is good and suppose if the area is 0.6 and this is from their journal i picked up double the valve area or 50% gain from pre bmv area now what is 50% gain if it is pointed and you make it 1.2 it is still mitral stenosis so it this is a very subjective thing send me these echoes i'll have a look and tell you what the real valve area is so it's that a good bmv they're scared of mr so they'll inflate the valve a little come in come out bahut hai you have mr thai jaise hum bana rahe the dikh karu that's how it goes so that's not the way you treat a patient and this is totally subjective let me point out this paper to dr kamal sharma i think you should start looking at commissural area ratio and leaflet displacement these are better guidance than wilkins score for a bmv because this looks at commissural calcification which is more important also you should have a better look at the submitral valve apparatus that you carefully you may open the valve up there but if the submitral is bad the patient still does not make it that's very important people say commissural commissural anatomy outdated look patients have data of 20 years 30 years 40 years this data is up to 30 years where there is 45.9% survival at 30 years which is excellent this particular paper from antium says omc remains the best alternative for treatment of uh, treatment of all cases of mitral stenosis independent of degree of pliability in our experience the median long term results are significantly better than those usually reported in pbmc series and these are all big pioneers this is from shiv kumar choudhary delhi where they have seen an average mean area of 2.6 cm plus minus 0.6 cm and their long term follow up shows uh, excellent survival and good uh, results you know many times we wonder why should bmv 
not be as good as OMC. I'm sure none of you have gone and read your books of uh, rheumatic heart disease and its pathology after finishing MBBS. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is such that if there is turbulence, if the flow is not good, then recalcification can happen. The main reason, Spencer et al. have reported, the main reason for better result is reduction in turbulent blood flow created by a widely patent and competent mitral valve, diminishes progressive valve fibrosis, and generally obviates the need for future valve replacement. So surgeons can obviate the need for future valve replacement because we do a complete job, not an incomplete job like our cardiologist does. And uh, you have open mitral data of 18 years, 20 years. For years and years, we have data that is excellent. See, just they will show up a little bit, sir. Two minutes, yeah. just two minutes. BMV, uh, some data is presented to us, but go and look in general in the data. What is it like? BMV event from survival 69% and freedom from stenosis 71%. Actual survival, 56% at 10 years. This is the type of data I came across when I went on the internet. So what do you want? You want a patient who lives happily, who's got the disease neutralized, who does not suffer from atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, and multitude of complications. I've seen patients who had a BMV. After five years, they say, a balloon atlu chale. Now we go ahead and do, we do a uh, mitral valve replacement. And when that patient comes to us, that patient has severe pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, tricuspid regurgitation, and a multitude of complications. And then the patient doesn't do well. And they say the surgeons messed up the case. So I think a stitch in time saves nine. When the patient comes, do a good job, open the valve completely, make the patient normal and let her live. Don't do something like a PTBMC that is just for show. You've just blown up the valve a little. Don't know what really happened to the complete pathology in the valve and let the patient suffer for five, six years. Then say, this worked well for four, five years. That's enough. Now we can just go for an MVR. No, no, no. When you do a procedure for 30 years, the patient should do well. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal Sharma. I don't want to say more than this. I'm not here to criticize the procedure. I know it's a good procedure, but I think you need to go uh, go back to the drawing board and look up to everything and try to do something better than. And so don't think we are villains. We are very good people and we give a good long term survival and patients will live. We want them to live. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anand. We have no doubt on your competency as a surgeon. What happens is that whenever we refer a patient for an MB repair, uh, yes, surgeons only uh, advise that MBR is indicated and uh, what happens is that they uh, end up putting a process in the patient's heart. So yes, that's sir. why we are afraid to uh, refer the patients to you for repair. No. You, you have to find the right exact person reason for the why right I job. The debate. You can't send it for any person, <laughs> right person for the right job. We are more than 1,200. Right, when the patient holds right. up a trump card of a myojana, then you are not accessible. Well, <laughs> then your patient has to pay something for a good quality and long-term life. Ma is not the excuse. Let's yeah, hear Dr. Tushar Bhai platform. and then we can have discussion. <laughs> this is a scientific platform. Ma is not important. What is good for the patient is important on a scientific platform. Tushar Bhai is champion of yes, myojana. Yes. <laughs> So Hello. Yeah, please share your screen, Dushar. Uh, full screen. Yeah, I'm sorry. By the time he shares, I think we can. Uh, I can rebut at least one thing. What Anil Bhai said, you know, fifty percent and you get away. It's not like that. You say 35% mark, aate to pass ho jata. Aisa to hota hoga. you know, somebody can argue, but that doesn't mean there are not people who not get 99% marks in the exam. 50% is defined as passing of the BMV. If you don't do 50% of the area, your procedure is unsuccessful. And that is what I showed that even by that marking, 90% of the people are passing. That means 35% mark la ke pass hona hai, to class mein 90% people are passing. So 90% of BMVs get area more than doubled. That is what it meant. Don't try to twist that we always end up getting only half double the area. Most of the times, you, as I showed you, you can get area as high as 2.2, 2.1. And I showed you papers on that. We can come to that. I think uh, Sharbi is ready with <laughs> I don't want to argue on that point because Sharbi, all the results. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Can you see? There are two things which before I start my presentation to point out. One is Kamal has given 
a topic which is overlapping between anil and me so there is bound to be some discussion which will be common to both and secondly i want to remind all of you that uh, everything has been said before but since nobody was listening it has to be repeated again this is what andre gede said omv and cmv are very much alive extremely relevant and modern to consider them old fashion is wrongly banishing the huge patient population of patients of mitral stenosis either to incomplete treatment and that is bmv or unnecessary mitral valve replacement there is a great place of omv and cmv in this scenario of course i do admit bmv is a procedure of choice isolated uncomplicated mitral stenosis with very favorable morphology like nicely planned non calcific valve minimal subvalvular crowding consistent sinus rhythm not intermittent and no left atrial thrombus go ahead kamal do a bmv but remember what i'm saying the profile that you have given me is incomplete there is no mention of rhythm no mention about la clots and there is no mention of tricuspid valve disease this is exactly what cardiologists do they ignore rhythm la clots tricuspid valve just see wilkinson's and blast they are likely these patients are likely to be in uh, having severe pulmonary hypertension and therefore they have atrial fibrillation clots and tricuspid valve disease which has not been mentioned in the profile that you have given me anil has told you that mitral valve is not just cusp it is cusp cordy papillary muscles and rheumatic pathology affects everything unfortunately bmv just separates the leaflets cordy and papillary muscles are not touched and they form a formidable part of pathology this slide shows the progression of a normal valve to calcific valve stenosis valve the cordy normal cordy and then shortening of cordy and then crowding and papillary muscles getting attached to the uh, cusp tell me how balloon can do anything to this congested cordy and papillary muscles attached to the mitral cusp it has to be opened up mechanically at open mitral valvotomy we use cardiopulmonary bypass left atrium is open mitral valve pathology is studied systematically valve is open at cuspal caudal and papillary muscles there is if mild to moderate cuspal calcification cusp can be shaved off thrombus can be removed left atrium can be plicated in presence of giant giant atrium which we all know biatrial maze can be done left atrial appendage can be excluded and tricuspid valve is repaired if there is moderate to severe regurgitation so you treat the patient completely do not treat just the cusp which bmv does this is the technique of mitral valvotomy these are operative pictures anterolateral fuse commissures posterolateral fuse commissures are separated the subval structures are cut and division of the papillary muscles with port scissors is done so that mitral valve is competent and yet fully open what does bmv do it simply spreads the fuse commissures it does not adequately treat subval valve crowding which may form an important part of pathology and it ignores clots atrial fibrillation and tricuspid regurgitation what are the indications of open mitral valvotomy absolute indication presence of thrombus atrial fibrillation subvalvular crowding calcification failed bmv re stenosis after bmv re stenosis after cmv significant aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis which can be opened up very easily moderate to severe subval tricuspid regurgitation and large atrium mild mitral mitral regurgitation these are the plate times where open mitral valvotomy will be ideal dr sampat kumar's paper has already been referred by anil this is a landmark paper which established open mitral valvotomy as a technique which is not relegated to the past what are the advantages i mentioned again but it is important to reiterate direct inspection of the valve methodology there is no procedure neither bmv nor close mitral you see the valve completely and do whatever is necessary kamal will just see an image its image and then intensification of imagination but not real 
picture is seen by any cardiologist. There is careful debridement of calcium deposits. Subvalvular structures are separated and rest of the things I have already mentioned. If valve is bad in contrast to what was found on echo, valve can be replaced. 30% of patients with isolated mitral stenosis have atrial fibrillation. Stroke and peripheral embolizations are ever present threats. Atrial fibrillation reduces cardiac output. Tachycardiomyopathy is a end stage disease, and there is chronic fatigue and cardiac failure. This is the place where the appendage gets clotted, and then the clot spreads into the left atrial body. Incidence of atrial thrombus. 25% of patients with mitral stenosis have atrial thrombus. And routine transect esophageal echocardiography will detect many more. It is a major cause of morbidity and mitral stenosis. What can you do on BMV with these clots? I'm told that you give anticoagulation for three weeks and then you can do BMV. Now, here is what uh, <laughs> Cardiology Journal, Heart, Journal of Heart Wall Disease says. Effective resolution and organization of lateral atrial thrombi needs optimal six months. In order to opt for BMV, patients are asked to wait and suffer symptoms and take long-term anticoagulation with its possible complications. Some patients may embolize in spite of anticoagulation during this waiting time. Some patients go into severe symptoms, low output state, needing ICU care while waiting for BMV. While here we have OMV, which is next day procedure, quick, definitive, and removes all clots completely. So don't ask your patients with atrial fibrillation to wait for a long time and then persist with BMV. Offer them quick and effective solution right away. This is how we convert atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm. All the lesions, left atrial lesions are shown and left atrial Appendage is also excluded, you can see in the figure. And this is right atrial maze. Complete maze gives you 70 to 80% of the patients from atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm. Nothing can be done like this in a BMV. Left atrial appendage is excluded. Sometimes in exclusion of left atrial appendage is a hot topic in cardiology. So many devices and procedures have been described. But they ignore the same fact while doing BMV. Why not exclude left atrial appendage? We can do it at the same time when we are doing open mitral valvotomy. There is a comparison between BMV and OMV. B OMV gives better long-term hemodynamics and lower rate of restenosis. BMV is a ha. Huh. Yes, I agree. BMV is a procedure of choice only in selected patients due to its less invasive nature. Immediate, this again was uh, quoted by Anil, immediate and long-term results of balloon and surgical closed mitral valvotomy randomized comparative trial. 40, remember this, 40% of all patients with RHD have MS and MR together. Most of them have symptomatic severe mitral stenosis, but significant mitral regurgitation. For most patients with pre-existing moderate mitral regurgitation, BMV is out of question. It's contraindication. So how much? How many few patients left? Patients, 40% patients with mitral regurgitation are out. 25% of atrial fibrillation are out from BMV. 40%, 25% of patients with clots on trans thoracic echo, they're out for BMV. So just imagine how much is left for BMV. Mitral commissionotomy, a technique outdated. Here is a paper which has studied for over 25, uh, 35 years. Met this meta, uh, meta analysis says it, it's a systematic study of effectiveness of BMV versus closed and open surgical mitral valvotomy. It's a very, very painstaking study over 1974 to 2010. All clinical control trials were compared. Abstracts for major cardiology and cardiac surgery meetings were studied. References also were studied and even corresponded with authors of all relevant research. Very landmark article. And what does it say? Sorry. Now, 
no difference in mortality. Yes, we admit in BMV there is mortality of 4.13%. In surgery, that is 3.24%. Fine, we accept. Survival after BMV was significantly lower compared with OMV on long-term visits. Surgery has the inherent superiority over BMV in providing the potential for additional surgical techniques which may improve late survival and restenosis rate. Inherent superiority or over BMV. 30 to 50, this is very, very important, Kamal. Listen to us. 30 to 50% of BMV patients develop mitral regurgitation and 4% need immediate surgery. But let's not forget, mitral regurgitation begets mitral regurgitation. If you leave mild mitral regurgitation, oh, that's mild mitral regurgitation. After three or four or five years, it will be severe mitral regurgitation. Did not show any significant differences in terms of operative and late mortality and complication. Incidence of late new onset MR and late re-intervention were significantly higher in patients with balloon. Surgery remains the treatment of choice for rheumatic mitral stenosis. Here is another paper. Study of 314 patients, 32 patients had, 32% of the patients had moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. And the third point is absolutely important, I have highlighted. Tricuspid regurgitation did not improve in 88% of patients study. Don't say that this is functional tricuspid regurgitation. We have opened balloon. Uh, we have opened the valve with balloon. Tricuspid regurgitation will resolve. No, in 88%, it doesn't re resolve. TR, functional or organic, must be treated to avoid long-term disease of severe TR and dysfunction of the right ventricle. So, 32 uh, another group, 32% are out for out from BMV. It just takes 10 to 15 minutes to repair tricuspid valve and pa give patient a symptom-free life for long years, leaving moderate to severe TR untreated at the first instance when you do BMV is a crime. However, tempting and easy BMV appears based on into inverted commas Wilkinson's score. Reduced functional capacity, heart failure, massive pedal edema, ascites, hepatic dysfunction, and metabolic consequences are too well known because of severe TR. And it definitely pointed out to this. Long-term effects of progressive TR are grave. Leave the patient miserable and attempt to correct surgically will have mortality more than 50%. This is how the tricuspid valve is repaired in just 10, 15 minutes. A ring is established and that's it. And a long, good life is given to the patient. Incidence, prognosis, implications, mechanism, and management. This again is a very, very important article in cardiology journal. It says one third of the patients with mitral stenosis have at least moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and all moderate tricuspid regurgitations need treatment. BMV turns a blind eye to significant TR. They just don't look at it. This is what it happens. You leave TR, moderate TR, and over a period of three or four years, it becomes severe and patient's survival decreases to 50%. And if it is severe, it, it, the survival decreases to 40%. So the myth of functional tricuspid regurgitation. Let us all together admit that there is nothing like functional tricuspid regurgitation if the tricuspid annulus is more than 35 or 40 millimeter. And every... Day, day in and day out with BMV, 50% of the patients will have this 3R, which is tricuspid annulus, which will be 35, 40 millimeter, and they all will come back after five years with gross TR and ascites. Results of repeat surgery are extremely bad, and prophylactic tricuspid repair is also now indicated. If the patient has dilated tricuspid annulus, there is no significant TR, but dilated annulus needs repair, cannot be done in BMV. Giant left atrium is common in our country, though literature says it is just 0.3%. And in our country, it is much more than that. Eight centimeter or more anteroposterior diameter of left atrium measured in cis axis. And consequences, what are the consequences of uh, 
giant left atrium decrease cardiac output in spite of correcting mitral stenosis so we can have discussion tushar bhai now um, yes, yes just a second yeah, let me yeah. let me complete in defense of close mitral valvotomy this is the procedure and these are the articles proving recent articles proving the effectiveness of close mitral valvotomy CLD represents a satisfactory technique in terms of lower cost, high efficiency, simplicity, and reproducibility. When compared with balloon, CMV offers a satisfactory technique. It can be done in pregnancy, and we have done even at bedside. This procedure can be done at bedside. OMV and CMV, OMV is far better, but like BMV, CMV also has limitations in long-term results. BMV and CMV, we conclude with the immediate and long-term results. of bmv and cmv are same but cmv results in better long term survival and fewer valve related complications as compared to balloon mitral valvotomy and bmv are and omv are more or less same but late results are better with omv do not this is my message to all of cardiologists do not just look at the balloon able mitral stenosis as dictated by wilkinson score look at the patient's presentation do not do half hearted treatment at the first instance this is her only chance of a good life complete treatment at one go gives the best short and long term results untreated pathology spoils patient's medical history bmv but bmv has an excellent role in selected patients rheumatic mitral valve disease is a progressive disease these are the pictures of two grandmothers the first on left side underwent open mitral valvotomy in 1984 she was the first open heart operation of gujarat and in 1904 she underwent mitral valve replacement she is doing very well there is another grandmother who underwent close mitral valvotomy by us 37 years ago 1985 and everything is good with them there are no even needing hospitalization friends let me assure you that if you offer these two uh, this procedures in selected patients bmv will be out of uh, out of consideration in more than 30 to 40 percent of the patients. Thank you very much, Kamal, and all friends, Jignesh, Ladda, Kalpesh, and Prashant, for giving me an opportunity to talk something which I used to talk in 1985. Thank you so much. So I would like to uh, ask our moderators to give a quick bite of what do they think of these presentations, and then we can move on to the question and answer. So there are some questions in the chat box as well. So Dr. Sunil, Dr. Kiran, please. Uh, Uh, give us your point of views. Yeah, good noon. Uh, so basically, we are running out of time, but still, I have some question and the comments to make here. Like one thing, uh, MR begets MR. That is not for rheumatic uh, diseases. MR begets MR is for dilated cardiomyopathy, where uh, if there is MR, then it causes uh, heart enlargement and again secondary MR. For rheumatic, what we see is even if uh, people develop MR during the procedure. unless it is not tolerated or there is no tear uh, if it is due to tear then yes it is not tolerated otherwise many of these mild to moderate is well tolerated even if severe if the left atrium is very large they do tolerate and over a period of time it actually disappears like the rheumatic pathology is like that ultimately there is a commissural fusion and that is bound to happen after a bmv so there is commissural separation thereafter over a period of time we have few patients who develop a uh, severe mr during procedure uh, didn't require surgery uh, immediately because the la was large and some of uh, they uh, got uh, this blood was adjusted and uh, over a period of 6 months it became mild to moderate so this mr bigger mr is for dcmp that will not be valid for um, this uh, rheumatic diseases second is uh, for af uh, as to uh, sarsa said af is out no af is not out we do not consider if the patient is af it's not like we do not consider bmb uh, uh many af patients uh, bmb can be considered it is not a contraindication anyway the uh, third shall is, i respond uh, it is not a contraindication anyway shall i respond yes sir. come on let them finish all the questions then we'll okay. respond okay. together to okay. sharma let them come up yeah i think I let let's have all questions in a go and then we all get two minutes each to rebut i think that's how we should do then third is about like none of us are here cosmetologists so how it appears on table after a mbr like everything is open now this is open this is open that doesn't matter if 
but the outcomes are not different. That is what it is. Uh, none of us are cosmetologists. So it appears too good on table with MBR and may not be good because you are willing, uh, opening the commissions. That doesn't matter if the long-term results are okay. So this is third thing. And uh, another is about the males. So particularly these patients are young patients. So whenever uh, these rheumatic patients who need valve intervention. Anyway, even after males, if the patient is in air, you have to give anticoagulation with all its needs. So that doesn't make it that the anti uh, is not required even if you are doing a repair. So for AF, a patient is in AF, if you are doing maze during repair, then also patient need to be on anti -coagulation. And uh, the embolism risk, because the embolism risk remains uh, even after maze procedure and conversion to sinus rhythm. And third, uh, another thing about mortality. So most of uh, the papers quoted here are from uh, centers, uh, some from India, many from abroad. But the real life data, if you see uh, old data, I think some 20 years old data from AIMS uh, Delhi uh, by uh, Dr. Sampat Kumar. So what he has shown is the patients, many of patients at AIMS Delhi come from uh, Bihar, UP and so many uh, remote places. And the actual mortality at one year was 30%, that is too high after valve replacement. So valve repair, can be an option, but many a places valve repair is not being done. Once they open it, it becomes like the valve is too bad and it is uh, replaced. So it doesn't, uh, in an Indian scenario where the anticoagulation, uh, the compliance to treatment is not very good and the mortality, we cannot accept a mortality of 30% in the real life scenario at one year. At one year. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Priyankar, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Priyankar Sinha is there. Yeah, uh, the quick comments. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Priyankar Sinha, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, doing Hello, a lot of sorry. repairs. Please go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make a few points that there has been a lovely discussion. I have been traveling the missing bits and pieces of it. But the thing is, what we wanted to highlight is the anatomy. With the anatomy of the mitral valve, we need to understand and analyze the anatomy very well. Once we understand the anatomy and the morphology of the diseased valve, it becomes very easy to choose between whether we want to do a BMP or a CMC or a mitral repair or a OMC. They're all complementary procedures, complementing each other at various times. They are I would beg to say that they are all brothers and sisters. Everything has a place and I think <clears> that valve morphology would define what is to be done. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Dr. Kiran. Uh, good morning, Kamal sir, Anil sir, Tushar sir and other panelists. Uh, I want to uh, comment that uh, as we have discussed I think the uh, patient's uh, uh, condition of the wall and the timing more uh, for subjecting patient for BMB or OMC or CMC or MBR. Uh, one thing I want to ask to our surgeon panel that uh, uh, at what at which point you consider that this uh, OMC is, is successful and then uh, uh, long term outcome is good. So patient may not need a surgery maybe near 10 years or something 10 to 15 years at least. So just I want to know that. So because we have to tell that okay, this is no, no, you are now OMC is done and then mostly you will not require MVR maybe in uh, coming 15 to uh, 10 to 15 years. So just I want to know the end point uh, after surgery when you can say that now this is successful OMC and then the patient is now having a good long term outcome. Good question. I think I can, I'll just add one point. So, uh, Anil Bhai said, you have a double area, you have to know. If you do CMC, you don't know if it's double or not. Your counter on that. Uh, Anil, 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 let me reply to Kamal. Close Ka mitral how do on table do you how on table do you know that the OMC is successful when you've done a yeah. tubes dilator from the closed effects? Transition there are two things. There are two things. One, is, one is finger. Finger palpates the stenosis and finger palpates how much valve is still unopened. One. And we and see secondly, on echo. Secondly, secondly, TE during the procedure. 
and after the procedure and it is the ultimate cardiologist on table tells you that you have done a good job so it is a very controlled nicely controlled with finger itself yes sir and so we also see on echo if the area is not opened completely we again do another inflation by going up by hung's formula so but that's the answer to anil bhai's 50% no nothing better than digital palpation Yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, gynec and surgeons, prostate unless palpated PR doesn't work. Work yeah, otherwise, I, I, it's not a prostate. I just want to reply to Doctor Kiran. See, Kiran, usually if we see a valve area after we've done an OMC, we do a good, a complete job like ring and OMC and sub valve uh, uh, division and everything. We do a repeat echo, and if the valve area is more than two centimeters, there is no gradient. There is no. What do you say? No mitral regeneration is considered as a successful repair, and that is the benchmark. And we have to. We usually get that if we've done a good job. There's no problem. And with that sort of a repair, fifteen, twenty, thirty years is not a problem if the patient is put on penicillin prophylaxis. For the LA appendage closure, just my <coughs> counter was that a lot of trials have shown that it is not right. inferior to anticoagulation, including our Watchman devices. You know. we have got fantastic devices but still you don't have to choose them ahead of anticoagulation so just for the sake of ligating an appendage at least you should not be going in open heart thoracotomy for a surgery no, kamal that, that, kamal that is, i can i can, really I can tell no you that uh, if all the if, if you are going to the LA appendage are you going to stop anticoagulation after ligating the appendage if the patient is af yes or no i have a question for you why do you not do a bmv to a person who has got a clot in la appendage we do and we, we have published our case it. report you series of manjunath grade we have published in those in which NY, in which manjunath grade 1 1a b and no. 2a we have done no. appendage clots also this but case see if there is a large LA clot there is no debate what point is, it, is when a patient comes with mitral valve disease and he is normal sinus rhythm does not have a clot should he not be undergoing bmv was the question No, and no. The patient is intermittent fibrillation. The patient has got severe pulmonary hypertension. No, that's the assumption. Palpitation can be sinus tachycardia. Palpitation can be simply because of the exertion dyspnea. It's, it's nowhere mentioned AF. You, for that, you may do an halter and document an AF. Even then, I don't mind if the echo is okay. Report, I'll go ahead and do it. Even if it's so, an AF, and if the there is no clot, I'll go ahead and do a pulmonary hypertension. You should do a halter before that. Give me the halter report. Give me the tricuspid valve report. You've not put that there. And for the tricuspid. the btv balloon tricuspid valvoplasty is even easier safer method you actually have, never have a tv repair required for a tear in the tricuspid never reported tricuspid never reported tricuspid repair in tr PR, if it's organic if it's organic tr you always have associated ts the tr regresses when the ph regresses which regresses in 90% of the patients when you relieve mitral obstruction this is your belief it doesn't regress i showed you a slide it doesn't regress i showed you a, a reference from american journal of cardiology which says 88% of the tr does not regress if the tricuspid tricuspid annulus is more than 3.5 There yes, but that's not the case here. That is organic. Dreyfus, When you have three point no, no, five no, no, annulus, no, no, no. it's organic. No, Dreyfus, you must see. My dear friend, there is nothing Dreyfus's like papers. functional or organic. If it is dilated tricuspid annulus, it is dilated compulsory. tricuspid annulus. Compulsory. Exactly. Yes. If it is dilated, which is not here. No, no, no. no TR which is not here. Moderate, moderate TR with pulmonary hypertension, if present yes. at the time of surgery, should be corrected. And let me tell you, I've seen exactly. horrible results. If you have to go FBR, by the tricuspid annulus rather than just looking at the pressures and the yes. jet area when okay. you're looking to define okay. organic if the annulus is not dilated even if you have severe tr it is functional no it doesn't work no, that tr must be corrected regurgitation is a myth for most of the patients yes and coming back to dr sunil's question mr begets mr <laughs> this is a very well documented fact in all textbooks of cardiac surgery you take uh, take kirkling you take spencer you take wilkins everybody says mitral regurgit rheumatic mitral regurgitation by and large is a pro pro uh, progressive reason how yes i agree initially after bm yes you are right initially after bmv if there is little increase in mr with fibrosis it might decrease but after 3 to 4 months if there is mr it is bound to progress to severe mitral regurgitation needing intervention repair or replacement secondly dr sunil raised a question of uh, af is not a contraindication for bmv yes it is not but 
can you convert it to sinus rhythm conversion of sin listen, listen, let me co complete conversion to sinus rhythm obviate so many complications of atrial fibrillation which are well known to you more known to you than to us sinus rhythm there is worst rhythm in the body is atrial fibrillation yes. and sin conversion to sinus rhythm gives an, an excellent life which bmv just cannot whether you give anticoagulation or not if the ls size remains large we would still give anticoagulation in a very low dose but most of these patients more than 70 patients 70% of the patients have five years sinus rhythm what more do you want third question was atrial fibrillation tricuspid regurgitation versus faster yes if there is af the tr versus faster than the patient in sinus rhythm if you have not corrected the uh, tr and there is af all of you have seen patients we all know we all know that if you have to do a redo bmv the incidence of complication stay procedural outcome stroke rate which in our own paper published in indian heart journal shows that the mortality eventuality rate was lesser than the first mvr so even if i was to get a restenosis at 12 years i am okay in my case series we did two third of the cases where surgeons had done cmc or omc so sir i respect both of you surgeons you are fantastic surgeons your patients don't require a second surgery but i have done surgeries or bmvs for the cases where two third no, no. were cmc we omc we out of, of 70 patients no 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 you don't talk of data and good work. that is don't my data that data. i'm talking it's published no, no, no. it's published on indian heart journal Not it's a that data. publication what i'm saying is about this particular case what should we do yeah so this case good this long case, term result would be there long term result one bmv i do my event rate is less than 3% cmc omc rates mvr rates of complication i have shown you by sts score is almost including morbidity and mortality more than 10% four times that of bmv if you are arguing for long term outcome i can go ahead and take this patient for a second bmv based on our own paper which again says that we can still do a successful procedure without having complication of equal to even the first mvr or omc or cmc so you know what i want to say uh, dr kamal started ki who is wearing a mask see the surgeons are without mask our our patients are seen by the cardiologist echo is done the physician see cardiologist wear this mask of an echocardiography and they hide behind that echo machine they do their echoes you know just just say oh this area this is 1.8 if the cardiologist has done it and if i have done an omc oh no there is more than moderate mr there is mitral stenosis it's like that you behind hiding i i want to ask i have seen innumerable mitral bmv reports and the valve area is 1.5 1.6 1.4 good result continuum and you know what happens after 4 years 5 years this patient come back with severe tr severe ph a very bad valve they cannot be opened anymore and will need mvr and these patients have a higher mortality so i think doing a good job primarily when the patient comes first time do a complete opening and wilkins score that's useless i've read entire data in the past 10 15 days on wilkins score wilkins it means score. nothing It means nothing at all. It's not a cardiographic assessment. It's not a clinical assessment. Wilkinson's score is just to do BMV. No, no. Even echo card. It is not an anatomical assessment. It is nothing about. So you BMV. have even Nagayushi's uh, data, which also talks about another scoring, which is very much on the same line. Just no, for the sake, and I think we had a fantastic debate. We need to end the session. We are running late, and Thank we have so another much. surgeon and cardiologist <laughs> waiting in. And, and so it's Thanks always so pleasure to have you both. Uh, Nobody is hiding behind mask. We called each other Superman, mm. Batman, and Superman rather than patients calling us the Jokers. So better to be called that. <laughs> Thanks a so lot. Bye. Bye. The whole idea thank was you, to promote you, science, and thank you very much to have all of you. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, moderators. Thank you, all, uh, both the speakers and my co-debaters. Uh, we move to next session. Thank you. For this session, I would invite Dr. Ansisha, Dr. Lal Daga, and Dr. Pinkesh Parmar as moderator. Dr. Manik Chopra, Dr. Ramesh Patel, and Dr. Jayesh Menia as chairpersons. Chairpersons, please introduce chairpersons, moderators. Please introduce the speakers. Hi, hi. Good afternoon. Hi, this is Manik. Hi, Dr. Manik. Uh, Dr. Manik is one of the leading uh, 
uh, interventionist who does a lot of uh, tower and he is the right chairperson for the session over to you dr manik thank you so today we are here to discuss uh, a case of uh, 68 year old male with f ex- ex- exertional angina with mild copd control on oral medication occasional inhalers normal coronaries low coronary uptake for lmca and suitable anatomy sts score intermediate severe aortic stenosis so uh, it's uh, it should be discussed against uh, tower versus uh, milimini invasive surgery uh, i i welcome all uh, co chairpersons and uh, moderators i uh, it's over to uh, dr abhishek rajpopat uh, to to speak on behalf of uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement as a better strategy i think we 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 finished the, their presentations first and then probably at the end we can take questions for discussion uh, okay now i can share the screen So first of all I would like to thank you Kamal sir for giving an opportunity to be a presenter in this panel and thank you for giving a very specific case scenario so that the discussion can remain very well into the streamline so as Dr Chopra has already discussed about the case history so 68 years old male so we have a couple of hitches uh, when we are discussing cyber versus tower as far as our published guidelines are concerned so is a 68 years old male COPD no take off of left main and STS risk score intermediate and we are discussing the best strategy out of this so i think we have three points to divide or other fourth one is the modality and other one is the mode of now uh, what are the controversies so first of all let's go to the what guidelines says we have three date, uh, major trials for intermediate risk patients sertavi partner 2a and sapien 3 intermediate risk what esc 21 uh, 21 guidelines says in a patient with increased surgical risk there is more than no anything which intermediate and above we have to have a hard team discussion and it should be decided as a patient but we have to take care of other things like frailty porcelain aorta history of chest radiation before we take a call on that but it clearly mentioned that tavi is preferred modality for the patient who are elderly so now again the debate will start what is 68 elderly this is the lines from partner 3 trial where it says clearly that interplay age is just a surrogate for life expectancy the interplay between the expected life chances uh, life expectancy and prosthetic heart valve durability is the key consideration we are discussing because we take a young patient redo repeat procedure so the nearly because if you see the western countries developed countries the life expectancy is in the range of 84 83 82 but if you come back to india our life expectancy is 69.27 that to before covid so our indian patient lives more than a decade lesser as compared to the western counterpart So if they are saying 75 is the age for tower, I would like to you know correct the statement and bring it back to the lower one as per our country's life expectancy status. Second thing, what our surgical colleague debates is the durability of a tower valve. They debate that you know uh, you are crimping the valve, you are crushing the leaflet. This is the six years data from the Notion one trial where at the end of six years the prosthetic valve deterioration at the end of six years is 4.8 percent is a tower. and 24% with a surgical aortic valve so putting the surgical aortic valve is always a second choice as far as we are using the bioprosthetic valve what we are missing basically the small annulus is the problem this is the information from notion one data surgical arm in a danish population where the males are 6 feet or 6 and 1/2 feet and females are 5 feet 6 inch to around 6 feet 40% of the surgical valves with 19 and 21 what is happening in india 80% or more of more than that of a number surgical heart valves used are below 21 so what happens if you just roughly calculate the body surface area of a male who is 5 feet 9 inch and 70 kg that is 1.8 and if you take a body surface area of a 60 year 60 kg female and 5 feet 3 inch height that is 1.6 this is the expected uh, 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 <clears throat> or if his area of a metronic freestyle valve even if you put a 21 mm valve in a 1.6 body surface area you are having this effective orifice area per centimeter square per meter square is hardly 0.84 and for a male it is 0.75 so what is happening if you see the definitions of the the uh, outcome index orifice area even for a female 21 valve is putting this patient with a moderate prosthetic valve 
mismatch. And for a male, it is a severe PPM you are giving up front. This is from the Danish population. We are having Indians are making it. We are for us, the life is more worse. So putting a surgical wall is always a second choice because you don't have orifice area to fight with. Why surgeons are saying that our, <coughs> our walls are much better? Because their study said the freedom from the surgery and death. They were the, you know, if you need a re-surgery, then there is a wall has failed. But now the task force guideline says what is the structural wall duration? If your gradient, peak gradient increases by 40 or mean increases by 20 from the baseline, or velocity increased by peak of four or mean of two from the baseline or severe valvular regurgitation. That's a severe structural valve de degeneration. So the definitions were not appropriate at that time to analyze the results of those particular modalities. So now the third point of debate comes the low coronary. I would say, you know, just having the one number, we have to understand low coronary from the annular sets of one information. It is nothing to do with simply the coronary. We have to look at the aortic root complex as such. Next in the line is here, the IFU manual of metronic core valve does not mention anything about coronary. What they demand is the size of sinus of valve salva. This is very important question. Somebody can criticize your CT report just by saying that, you know, your coronaries are very low. You are not fit for tavern. That's not the situation. We are going to the next stage of analysis. It's the expected leaflet to ostium distance, which obviously takes the consideration of the sinuses. If your ELOD is more than two, the chances of coronary occlusion is very, very rare. Here you take a distance from center to annulus, which is indirectly the leaflet length matching thing. And then you take from the origin of the coronary midpoint to the center line. That is where the coronary obstructions are defined. On top, we have novel valves where the valves are taking support on the top of the leaflet and keep the coronary screen. We are lucky to have this upcoming uh, Boston accurate neo valve where the upper crown sits on the top of the coronary, keeps the leaflet inside the sinuses and in, a, in their IFU, the coronary height has been brought down by 33% from the other valve which are recommended. So just having a one reason you have one coronary lower, that person should not exclude the target. Our index patient is an intermediate risk patient, but yes, in a desperate situation, we can use a coronary protection just to ensure the coronary does not close, which can be used for both balloon expandable valve and self-expanding valve. In balloon expandable valve, you bring the stent above the crown level and in self-expanding, you bring it above the STJ. And we can certainly keep the coronary patent during the procedure. I would not recommend for intermediate risk patient, but yes, if the patient is at extreme risk, we have our Weaponry is to ensure that patient goes out of the cath lab safely and lives the normal life. Our surgeon has to understand that the surgical valve does not have much variety, but our transcathedral heart valves are evolving rapidly and they are having a multiple options to ensure that a given patient from the differences or many, many variety of the coronary aortic root complex, we are able to tackle them. Now, if we just think from the data, where the MICS was this tower data, we don't have actually any head-to-head -head trial. Whatever information we have, it is from the propensity match data. No patient in this data was operated after 24 from where the second and third generation valves were introduced. So if you say any data propensity match, and those are from the single center, big centers. If India doesn't have those kind of centers like Stanford. We have to see what is happening to, in, a, in the hands of average or regular cardiac surgeon in India. Nobody is, not everybody in India is an expert of minimal invasive. If my surgical colleague thinks that minimal invasive uh, AVR can replace the TAVR, then I would say only one thing. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Abhishek. It was uh, really very well summarized, and uh, I would I would ask uh, Dr. Jaydeep Brahmani to probably present his thoughts. Uh, is 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 Dr. Jaydeep uh, here with us? I think he's muted. Uh, uh, I, I can see him. He's muted.
Uh, Dr. Jaydeep, uh, could you share your screen and present your? Uh, Sir, on your screen uh, there is a notification. On your screen, to, uh, there is yes. a notification. Yes, yes, I am doing it. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, very much. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Just let me do the share screen. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. You can go on a so, screen mode. I mean, uh, slide mode, so it becomes a bit larger. The lower. Okay, okay. Did I have already done? Okay, okay, sir. So thank you, Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir, for giving me such an opportunity of presenting the minimal invasive aortic valve replacement. So this is like what it was look like in the past. It was considered to be the operation theater because everybody was used to see the all of the operation. So it was known as operation sir, theater. Uh, sir, can you make it on a slide for more? So now is it visible? Yeah, no, it's sir, possible, no. but probably you can you can uh, look at the, you can find an icon at the yes, lower yes, right. Yes, 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 sir. Click on that. Yeah, now click on that, and it would become still larger. Okay. I think it's working, but I think uh, that's fine. We can see. We can just go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, right now the operation theaters will look like this. So it has completely uh, replaced with uh, total videoscopic, total endoscopic, or even total robotic works. So basically, if you look at the evolution of minimal invasive any case, it has been pro uh, it has been evolved over the these five stages. First is the direct vision mini thoracotomy or mini incision around 10 to 12. So Jadeep, can you make it full screen? Second. Yeah, it is already full screen. It is already a full screen. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Then uh, third one is video directed or robotic assisted surgery. Fourth one is the robotic telemanipulation. And last one is percutaneous what uh, Dr. Uh, Abhishek Rajput. Your slides are not moving. Made. We are stuck uh, with the hybrid lab photograph only. So. Okay. Now is it visible? Yes, go. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this was what it uh, right now looks like that there is always a debate between cardiologist and cardiac surgeon for tower as well as tower or TAVI on uh, minimal invasive versus open heart surgery. So basically goal is STS database, what is minimal invasive cardiac surgery is any form of procedure which is not performed with full sternotomy with or without CPP support. So basically we have to look for only two things. First one is invasiveness and second one is requirement of CPB that is cardiopulmonary bypass. So there is always a question, can we get rid of open, in case of open heart surgery? Yes, right now it is absolutely possi possible in each and every case, whether it is coronary, valve, congenital, whatever the thing it can be done through the minimal invasive route. So if we talk about the minimal invasive aortic valve replacement, we have got two different options, two different uh, approaches. One is mini thoracotomy versus mini sternotomy. So if you look at the Jerry, try uh, pressing F5 and the screen can become a full screen. F5. F F5. Okay. Anyway, go ahead, go ahead. It's not, uh, it's still it's showing your slides uh, and the uh, half thing actually. No problem, but go ahead. I think click on the left side and on each slide you click so that, yeah, it keeps on. You click on the left side. Yeah. Slide so. So now it is visible. Since it is not becoming full, you click on the left side, which is the smart uh, thing on individual slide when you go on and talk on that. Sir, uh, once stop, share your screen and reshare again. 
ओके दरवाजा बंद कर देना प्लीज share again hmm that i am doing it but my net is very slow you switch off your video that may help no no that i i am doing it is it visible now yeah yeah it's visible i think you can click on the left hand slides and uh, that should be okay we, we can we can manage okay yeah you can so, go to the slide where you were we were seeing like this only but no problem yeah. you go to the next yeah yeah we were, we have seen this also no yeah, no next one next one okay. next one okay next one okay next yeah. one yeah this is where we were yeah okay yeah. so according to stds database minimal invasive cardiac surgery what does it define it is the procedure which is not performed with full sternotomy maybe with or without cpb ness then we have to discuss basically two thing while uh, considering any case for minimal invasive cardiac surgery that is invasiveness and cpb use of cardiopulmonary bypass machine so in uh, uh, every question is that can we get rid of open in case of open heart surgery yes it is 100% possible right now with coronary lima rima lima radial in any form of uh, wall like aortic wall or mitral wall it is absolutely possible so minimal invasive aortic wall replacement can be performed by two uh, different uh, uh, two different approaches one is mini thoracotomy second is mini sternotomy so if you look at the journey of minimal invasive aortic wall that starts from conventional means that is a full chest or full sternotomy to half or j sternotomy and right up to the right anterior thoracotomy so deciding before deciding for any case for posting for minimal invasive aortic wall replacement you have to basically consider few of criteria first adequate size annulus adequate size annulus means annulus uh it will decide whether you can go for the thoracotomy or mini sternotomy our criteria is that if uh, annular size is less than 20 then preferably we go for mini sternotomy or j sternotomy and if annular size is above 20 then any of case it can be done through right thoracotomy second important thing it should be free from extensive calcification though extensive calcified cases can be also done very easily but there is some difficulty in doing such kind of cases through thoracotomy but with small sternotomy it can be done very easily third important thing there should not be any intervention of aortic wall but still uh, uh, personally i have done few bentals with minimal uh, sternotomy roots also so if aortic root or ascending aorta replacement it can be if it is required like a bentall procedure it can be also done so pre operatively you may require first one is uh, uh, tt uh, that will exclusion criteria means required that is small aortic root and extensive calcification of annulus even in case of small aortic root the root enlargement by nix or manujian it can be also done very easily through either it may be half sternotomy or through thoracotomy root ct evaluation is always required in ct evaluation we basically look for two things first one is the angle from uh, angle of aorta if aorta is rightward means more than 50% of aorta from right sternal margin and second one is distance from ascending aorta to sternum it should be less than 10 cm if these two criteria fits then mini stern thoracotomy uh, minimal invasive aortic wall replacement can be done very easily and third important being that is angle angle means that is the vertical line which is drawn up to middle of annulus and transverse line through the middle of annulus so if this angle is more than 45 degree then you can directly approach is the aortic wall through the mini thoracotomy route but uh, routinely we don't do this such kind of investigation 
then important being you have to evaluate the aorta as well as the bilateral femoral arteries if it is totally occluded then mini thoracotomy uh, aortic wall replacement is practically contraindicated but yes mini sternotomy uh, aortic wall replacement still it can be done because you can directly cannulate the ascending aorta sometimes the pleural additions may also create a problem while doing a mini thoracotomy route but still through mini sternotomy it can be done very easily so these are the few data uh, which uh, shows the uh, minimal invasive aortic wall replacement which requires reduced ventilation time it has the lower incidence of new onset of post operative atrial fibrillation because there is less heart manipulation is done it is shorter icu stay most of our patients are out of icu within 24 hour and all our hospital stay significantly reduced because most of the patients are discharged on third day evening so these are the few photos i am showing you which uh, when minimal invasive aortic wall replacement has been done this is 12 year old boy with down syndrome with congenital aortic wall replacement is done this is degenerative aortic stenosis elderly patient of 80 years so bioprosthetic wall has been implanted these are the few young patient where minimal invasive aortic wall replacement with mechanical wall is done and this one is photo of through upper half sternotomy where uh, mechanical wall has been implanted so minimal invasive aortic wall replacement right now i can say it is 100 out 100 of 100 out of 100 patient it is it can be easily possible but there are the few exclusion criteria or few things you may require like patient's renal function patient's liver function they should be also considered because this whole procedures to be done on pump and on pump the pressure fluctuation is also very commonly seen otherwise whatever the profile of the patient whatever the bad wall condition whatever the small aortic root 100 out of 100 patient minimal invasive aortic wall replacement can be done very easily thank you very much well uh, thanks dr jayadi for this uh, presentation now uh, i would uh, invite questions from other co chair persons and and moderators and other attendees um thanks dr jayadi pramani sir and dr uh, abhishek sir for nice presentation uh and dr jayesh panya uh there is a significant or non significant increase of uh, my question is dr to dr jayadi pramani sir uh there is a non significant increase of uh, stroke that is uh, for the surgical uh, patient and also there is a higher incidence of ap in particular surgical patient so what what are the what are the percentage of uh, that ap and uh, disabling stroke stroke in case of mini surgical patient minimal invasive see in, in case of minimal invasive surgery the incidence of stroke is same as open heart surgery but uh, we usually okay. during the surgery we usually take care that small uh, debris or small debris or small particles they should not embolize to the heart so we after cutting the valve we give repeated wash that is same as given in case of open heart surgery or minimal invasive surgery so practically incidence of stroke in minimal invasive aortic valve surgery is still less see we have done almost uh, i can say more than 100 minimal invasive aortic valve replacement in last 3 uh, years but till in not even a single case we ever uh, mention uh, we ever notice the any incidence of stroke yes there may be the chances of retrograde embolization in few of the patients uh, like through the femoral artery cannulation but still we are lucky we we we, we never experience such kind of things in uh, icu so minimal invasive aortic valve replacement still incidence of stroke is absolutely le less if you take care uh, intraoperatively if you take care of the small articles while cutting the valve if you give a proper wash then chances of embolization is still very less all right uh, any any other questions by moderators and other chair persons i am dr ramesh my question to dr jayadeep is that uh, in minimal invasive aortic uh, valve replacement surgery percussionist is always saying that sir uh, drainage is very very less we are having in uh, they are always having uh, less reservoir uh, less volume in reservoir so what is your experience see generally we have a fixed strategy of using the fixed cannula whatever the weight of the patient aortic cannulation we use 17 uh, fr aortic cannula and uh, for peripheral uh, venous cannulation we use almost 20 24 29 or 30 by 33 venous cannula 
your perfume should be smart uh, if even in cases if you have some uh, problem with return or th this thing you can always cool down the patient to 30 or 28 degrees so it will basically reduce your flow and surgery can be done very easily so uh, i think your perfume perfume should be well trained uh, in uh, doing the various cases of minimal invasive cardiac surgery we are very lucky to have good perfume so return problem yes it happens but over the period of time these problems are usually they can be uh, very easily overcome so we never found such a kind of problem while doing any cases this one also we operated almost eight cases of minimal invasive aortic wall replacement through sternotomy and thoracotomy but uh, everything goes well there is not a issue so always cooling down the patient that that you know, solves almost 90% of a problem uh, related with the small cannula or uh, venous return all right so i think uh, most of the questions are being answered and we are also running short of time uh, it was a very good discussion only few things uh, probably if time permits i could add one is uh, as correctly pointed by dr abhishek that most of the indians would be having a small annulus and typically we find that surgical valves are undersized most of the times so i, I in general now there is a trend Uh, that before you take even and i'm not criticizing but i would say that surgeons should start assessing the annulus by doing a ct scan so that they know the exact number uh, before up front so what is the actual annulus of the patient the, it would be better assessed by ct scan rather than assessing on echo and probably your intra operative assessment of course uh, would be would be there but this would be a additive tool i would say and second thing is that regarding the clinical scenario which was given to us of course the coronary height is uh, was very low of around 5 but uh, it's not just that number it would be the whole aortic complex had, as it was discussed but what i suggest is like like of course the indian population has a less less life expectancy but the patients who are coming for tabor we would have to assess them in and in that group i don't feel that their life expectancy is uh, any less than the european counterparts because uh, they are looking at a good life uh, Uh, uh forward so you should also have a clear definitive lifetime management plan for the patient that if you are doing a tavoc valve in a patient of 68 years old with a coronary height of 5 would you be able to hook the coronaries if the patient comes with you at a, if with the acs at the age of 72 and second thing are how are you going to deal with a uh, tavoc valve and valve if the valve degenerates in next 8 years and the patient comes back to you these things also pertain to surgery this is just to uh outline these two points and and probably we also i i could i can also see rahul gupta there uh, if you would like to add something to it no dr marik i think all points are uh, very well put and summarized uh, i would agree with your view points and uh, i think we have to look at overall i think you have very well summarized so let's move ahead if there are no more because i i would just say one thing because see lifetime management of tower was a different uh, situation so i just kept myself focused on this particular case scenario and when we talk about 5 mm height i just mentioned thing this it's for a desperate situation we go for this gymnast stenting and all so indeed i my point is that you know there are no data which is very you know, randomized data of comparing minimal uh, avr versus uh, tavi so we should not just think because the surgeons are going from the small incision that's going to translate into the clinical benefit just matching with tower or approaching with tower and the tower has proven is a test of time as far as young patients and the you know redo tower in tower we know very well that the low frame height valves can give a enough access to coronaries presently not no you don't need to be a special interventional cardiologist to cannulate or cardiac coronaries if your valve is intraannular and low frame and that also gives an opportunity to put a tower, new tower valve down the line if such kind of patient develops a uh proper prostate equal degeneration of the given tower wall so that happens to be you know i kept it for the separate discussion all together for that okay. i thought i'll uh, just have a co closing comments from all of you uh, uh, about the technique that's a lot of uh, cardiologists actually park the wire in the coronary and keep the stent ready uh, when you they think that it's probably end, end up going to be compromising the left main and then go ahead and do the tower your comments on that just to uh, uh, complete the discussion on that viewpoint I mean, uh, I would. Oh, okay. Go, go ahead, Abhishek. It is all anticipation how it goes, and uh, we actually don't have much of uh, data of the how this chimney stenting is going to work. 
So if it is, as I mentioned during my discussion also, that if your patient is extreme risk, high risk, and surgeons are not ready to touch, you do it to chimney stenting. We don't know the long-term data of how the chimney stenting is going to work. So as I mentioned, for a desperate situation, such things exist. So any given case of tab uh, aortic stenosis, it cannot be handled universally by a surgeon or universally by interventional cardiologist. It has to be, a, as it is mentioned in the guidelines as well, it's a hard team approach. And by CT analysis, if your CT analysis is thorough, your understanding of anatomy is thorough. As I mentioned that we are changing from expected distance from the, from the ostium instead of just a coronary height. In tower, you can anticipate 99.9% .9 of your complication way before you take a puncture. I, I agree with Abhishek. The only thing I would say is that if you have a patient of low risk, which most of the patients are in today's scenario, are there in India, to be honest. And if you have low coronary heights and if you anticipate to put a wire in a coronary, even with your gut feeling, then probably it's better to offer patient surgical aortic valve replacement unless and until uh, the patient is a complete no-no or there are something which is uh, which is which is, which, which is, you know, uh, not taken. As he already told, it is only for prohibitive and high risk that you would like to uh, do such things because you don't know the future of these uh, expanded the stents which are, which are put as chimney because most of the times if you are going to put a wire, it is very difficult at the end to judge how the leaflet is going to behave once you pull out the wire because still the wire is in, the flow is good. The moment you pull out the wire, it behaves differently. There are chances of delayed coronary obstruction so all these things considering probably in the end, you would like to put a stent and come out for peace of mind. It is good at that moment, but we don't know how these stents are going to behave after six months. Of course, these stents are not there to, to solve the problem of coronary obstruction. They are there as door keepers or door openers. They are there to deflect the leaflet. So even if that gets stenosed, their cells are open and the blood is going to flow through. Most of the times they good well. We also have some one or two years data for planned chimney stenting patients. And so far it is good, but to hook such coronaries afterwards would be difficult. So again, uh, elderly patients, high risk patients, we are justified, low risk patients, a difficult intermediate risk, five, five millimeter. I would say if anatomy is very large, then it's fine. But if anatomy is borderline, then probably, I mean, but, but uh, clearly it was written that the anatomy was suitable for Tower valve, so I completely agree with the, whatever Abhishek said. Vascular closure, Sir, I think when we are talking about high team approach with the cardiologist getting aggressive and you end up with proglides, couple of them, and then you actually don't allow the patient, the surgeon to touch the patient at all uh, these days. So <laughs> quick comments on the proglide and the closure devices. How often you will actually require a surgeon to come in for that? Less than 5% in Indian scenario, I guess. In our, because we in India, we are not having a universal tower center. So most of the towers are happening. More than 50% of towers are happening in a center where the volume is less than two or three towers in a year. So going with those things and you are going as a proctor. So you just try to hand over most of the things to your colleague who is uh, holding the case. So indeed, it's tiny bit higher on our side uh, because in India, because of uh, such things. Second thing I would like say, I like to say about uh, elective femoral cutdown. I think giving anesthesia itself is a bigger problem. Whether you are doing appendicectomy in an 85-year-old or 80-year, 75-year-old patient, that carries a risk. So femoral cut down, you know, that any anesthesia you are giving that nulli substantially nullifies the advantage of transcatheter procedure. I would, I would agree. Again, uh, I, I don't consider uh, local vascular puncture complications as complications. I consider them part of a have a procedure as the same, at the same time pacemakers also probably are part of procedure i do not uh, consider them as uh, complications per se I, I i can see probably dr nc has some question or something to sir something there is to. a question from the audience to the cardiac anesthetist it's been written then what's your opinion about the risk of surgery anesthesia as the anesthetist observes all uh, and can give a best judgment Sir, I would like to say that age alone, alone does not determine which procedure is best. Age along with a certain capacities matters. And a careful assessment with the clinical, anatomical and the procedural factors uh, other than the, I mean, rather than the surgical risk uh, scores alone govern the risk choice between the two procedures. That's the answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It was again uh, discussed by Dr. Abhishek in his presentation that anatomical factors regarding the chest and probably the anesthesia risk was very well discussed. And, and yeah, I agree to it. 
I think the MICS carries an advantage. It's for somewhat in a pulmonary disease where the chest dynamics not, are not changed substantially with the lateral incisions and the mixed uh, sternotomy. But as far as the other risk of uh, organ problems like having a bad kidneys or bad liver or very bad LV function, I don't think so. That's going to make any difference whether you are doing a medial sternotomy or you are doing a lateral, lateral thoracotomy or right thoracotomy. So we are in, in, in so-called high-risk patients, we, we, everybody should extensively undergo the STS scoring system. We should realize why it is extensive. See, my, my surgeon can have an anatomical problem in assessing the valve or the patient is a bad patient. So that's two difference. Why? Then now we go to the second stage. Why this patient is the high risk? It's an anatomical problem. It's a physiology. It's a problem. And that can give us rather a better idea in Indian scenario where cost is very important concern that we can choose between minimal invasive versus the transcatheter procedure. Okay. I think we can end the session. We had a wonderful Dr. Manik closing comments and we can end the session. Oh, uh, I think everything was uh, very well discussed and um, I, I think uh, let's go to the next session. And many thanks to uh, uh, the speakers, the moderators and chairpersons to, to join and host. Thank you. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, moderators and speakers. We move to next session. And for this, I invite Dr. Benny Jos, uh, Dr. Anand Dahuja, Dr. Nikunj Koteja. And to chair, I invite my friend from Delhi, G.B. Pant, uh, Dr. Girish MP, Professor Kamath, from Bangalore and Dr. Jignesh Kothari from Yon Mehta. Over to chairpersons to introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamal, for uh, for the invitation. I, I think uh, the uh, conference as such is uh, doing wonderfully well with a lot of debates. And I was part of, uh, I was looking at the debate earlier, earlier two debates, which were uh, no, uh, fought with the right vigil and uh, right, uh, you know, my state of mind so that our patients are the at the end who are the ones who are going to benefit with these things so again uh, the topic for this is uh, very well chosen and this is uh, regarding a 65 year old female patient with unstable angina and triple vessel disease so unstable angina for this admission and uh, there was an history of TIA with some uh, obstruction in the left common uh, left carotid artery and carotid angiogram so I would uh, uh, invite Dr. Karthik Patel, who is uh, MS from PGH Chandigarh and MCH uh, from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is uh, presently Associate Professor of uh, CVTS in UN Mehta, and he has uh, many publications under his achievement. And he is on the editorial board of Journal of Sur Surgery Forecast, as well as World Journal of Surgery and Research. Dr. Karthik, please. So the second speaker would be Dr. Rahul Gupta, who is uh, MD Internal Medicine and DM Cardiology from Mumbai. And uh, he's consultant cardiologist at the Apollo Hospital in Mumbai, who has, he has uh, more than 50 years of experience in, uh, 15 years of experience in field of cardiac sciences. And he's proficient in handling procedures like uh, primary and complex angioplasties. He has been uh, a recipient of various awards and accolades, and he has a lot of uh, publications and research to his name. So to begin with, uh, I would invite Dr. Karthik Patel to delve on his uh, uh, lecture. Hello? Yeah, yeah, you are audible and visible. Your slides are visible. Yeah, my uh, slides are visible to all of you. Yes, yes. Karthik, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you, Kamal, sir, for giving this opportunity to uh, present uh, uh, this scenario in this beautiful academic fest. Uh, so, index case is 65 year female. He, she has TVD with unstable angina with minor dysfunction. She also had left sided TIA three months back. And on evaluation, she had found 95% stenosis in right, internocarotid with mild disease on left. So there are multiple questions which has to be answered before treating this patient, like whether she required any intervention or not, whether she will require character intervention or not, and if required, what will be the timing and the sequence of the intervention? As you all know, I am a surgeon. There is always a 
bias treating this patient. However, in these presentations, I would try to justify uh, what is the best option available for her uh, by more focusing on facts as compared to beliefs. You, I think this patient will definitely require CABG and which has been supported by even by many guidelines, even recent AHA has supported this. Before going further, just small, uh, very quick recap of keratodietary stenosis. It can be defined as symptomatic and asymptomatic, depending upon presence of symptoms. Uh, if the symptoms are within six months, then it is called as symptomatic. If the patient has symptoms of more than six months, then it is called as asymptomatic. Another classification is presence of a stenosis, degree of stenosis of internal extra, extra cranial internal carotid artery. Depending upon that, it can be classified as mild, moderate, severe or complete. Why it is important to know for us? As you know, this patient, this patient will require CABG. So a very beautiful article by Nilo says that risk of stroke after CABG is proportional to a degree of a stenosis. So if the patient has more stenosis, she will have a higher risk. And it is important to note that around 23 patient of patient will die. So not intervening carotid will lead to high risk of morbidity and mortality in this particular patient. Even recent guidelines says that a patient, symptomatic patient with, sim with symptoms with a 50 to 90 percent of degree of stenosis ICA should intervene. Carotid has to be intervened, but there is a they have told that method, timing, and sequence will depend upon the patient's conditions. So, what intervention available for carotid we have? As you all know, uh, the anatomy, which is the oldest and most commonly performed procedure worldwide. And second is standing, which is gain popularity nowadays. When talk about isolated carotid artery stenosis, we have multiple RCTs comparing both of these. They are mainly industry driven or a, a controlled RCTs. These are the some industry driven carotid trials out of which Sapphire was the most important one. It has shown a non-inferior of stenting over to carotid and atectomy in a patient of high risk. However, there are many caveats. One, it is heavily industry influenced. Second, there is a some amount of selection bias because out of 700, only 334 were included. Third, 25 patients of on both arms were died. And there is also a controversy about definition of MI, leading to a more cases in both arms. There are other randomized control trials like ICSS, uh, EVA, 3S, EVA space. They have all shown a CE is better as compared to standing. The most important, even ICSS has shown that around 50% of the patients have, which are undergoing CS, has having new MRI finding compared to any other technique. The most important and most talk about about this is crest trial. Even crest trial has shown that stenting has little amount of increased pre-procedural uh, death as well as stroke, where compared to anatectomy, especially in a patient of more than 70 years. They have also published a long-term data of 10 years. In this data, they have shown long-term anatectomy versus stenting is both are equivalent results. However, when we do a subgroup analysis, you can see the risk of stroke is more in a patient with more than 65 age, symptomatic and a female patients. So our index case is female of more 65 year with symptomatic. So in this case, an adult will definitely give a better short term as well as a long term results. These are the recent meta analysis which are summarized all these studies and which have shown similar results. Based on these findings, these are the recommendation by European which shows that an adult is a class one indication with level of recommendation of A. There is also a role of standing, but they have given a class two-way two -way class with a level of evidence of A. What are their indications? When a patient is very high risk of carotid because of cardiac or pulmonary disease or more age is more than 80 years in a recurrent disease, patient having previous radiations or a patient having bilateral disease. Even a recent stroke guideline have confirmed that anatomy remains a class one indication with a level of evidence of 
A. However, if the patient needed both, then what will be the timing and sequence? It will depend upon three important questions. That one, who is which vascular bed is more symptomatic? What is the anatomy? And what are the individual risk factors? Depending upon that, sequence will be concomitant, that is performing the procedure simultaneously, stage, that means carotid intervention followed by coronary interventions, or it is a reverse stage, that means a coronary first followed by a carotid second. So, what are the general indications for concurrent approach? If the patient is symptomatic for both, severely symptomatic for both vascular bed, then that patient will require intervention of both. Like in a cardiac, if the patient has unstable angina, just like our index case or severe LMC disease or TVD with liver LV dysfunction or critical LED lesion. Along with age, if patient had symptomatic, stenos uh, symptomatic carotid uh, stroke or anything with a stenosis of more than 50 degree or asymptomatic with high risk carotid, that is bilateral involvement of more than 80% or a one side total occlusion and a significant lesion on a one side, then this patient is more suitable for concurrent approach. If the patient has more severe symptom for carotid, then it is better to have a stage approach or if the patient has more symptom on uh, coronaries, then it is better to have a reverse stage approach. So, our index case has a symptomatic severe carotid stenosis with unstable angina. So, she is best suited with combined approach. But there is a still a choice, there is still a lack of data when a patient undergoing CABG. So, what intervention is we have to choose between stenting or carotid artery in a patient undergoing CABG? There are no RCTs available. The data is available are prospective uh, observation studies or most of the time it is retrospective. There is also heterogeneity of the population. Like some, they have included symptomatic as well asymptomatic patients for carotid as well as they have included patients with stable angina, unstable angina. Also, the timing of intervention is different. Like they have mostly compared us concurrent anatomy versus a stage stenting or they have compared a concurrent stenting or anatectomy versus a stage anatectomy or a stenting. Uh, in this beautiful article, which is the I got largest of uh, patient or uh, 22,000 patients by Fieldman at all, uh, published in 2017, shows that uh, anatectomy remains a most frequently performed procedure, but it has a least stroke rate, but it has a higher mortality rate compared to stage stenting. A recent meta-analysis also confirmed the same finding. It has shown that the risk of death is more when you compare when you when you uh, do a concurrent anatectomy with CABG compared to stage. Also, but but in this meta-analysis, they have also do subgroup analysis, and if they remove the patients with Feldman, they have shown that the mortality benefit of stent was vain. Whatever the benefit, when we see these results. It has been shown that we perform concurrent anatectomy or stenting. The risk of death or stroke will be higher, like around 6 to 10 percent when we do both. Why? Because in these studies, most of the patients underwent on pump CBG. They are no data of, they have very less amount of the patients are underwent of pump CBG. Based on these findings, the European have uh, given a recommendation of n to be along with CABG in a symptomatic patient with a high degree of stenosis with a class of 2A and a level of evidence of B. They have not talked about standing yet here. But important to note in India that we are routinely performing off-pump CABGs. And there are multiple data are available which shows when we do Concurrent anatectomy with oppum CABG, the stroke and death rate comes to less than 2% or equivalent to 2%. That is a patient, that is the same as a patient undergoing CABG without any stenosis of the carotid. So, my preferred approach in this patient would be anatectomy and oppum CABG simultaneously. So, my take home message is still there is a scarcity of data. Current evidence still leans towards the anatectomy combined. In this particular patient, combined anatectomy and off-pump is preferable 
to have better short as well long term uh, outcome list mi list death and list stroke rate there is still role of standing in this patient if it is a not a candidate of anatec thank you i think uh, very well put the uh, dr karthik patel and i would i would like to invite uh, dr rahul gupta for uh, his uh, talk on uh, the same topic so good afternoon everyone and thank you for having me here in cardcon dr kamal and uh, i think karthik uh, dr karthik has presented uh, his uh, facts uh, very well and i think this debate is going to go going to be there even after we finish our uh, uh, points so let's see whether carotid pta prior to cbg would make things easier and uh, let's see whether karthik can join hands on the other side in the red corner so we'll try to raise the bar so we have seen this uh, i think uh, uh, the uh, the things have already been our patient uh, who is little youngish uh, you know around 65 years old and uh, female with unstable angina so requires uh, you know a, a solution for both the vascular band so i think uh, i will go into the review of literature where i i think dr karthik presented the crest uh, data from the crest which is a longest 10 years data of a uh, lot of patient but uh, whatever data numerically even though it was uh, on the better side of the cae but it was uh, you know statistically insignificant i'll just point out that then then there are certain studies which i'm going to regarding the timing because this sequence whether reverse stage stage with cas with ca is all there are a lot of studies which are available lot of meta analysis are available i went through a lot of literature and uh, you can get all the literature of every kind but we'll see uh, our patients fits into the bis, uh, which category and we'll study the high risk uh, patient characteristic and benefit we'll see uh, whether our patient has any of the high risk characteristic and contraindication to one of these or not or whether it is feasible for both and then finally we'll conclude so i think uh, this uh, uh, the dilemma dilemma is going to be always there as to how to approach this patient and because in about 8 to 14% of patients uh, there is uh, concurrent uh, you know carotid artery stenosis in a patient who is undergoing uh, a cabg with triple vessel disease especially if they have a left main involvement and uh, as uh, dr karthik rightly pointed out there is always uh, uh, has been debates as to the sequencing and timing for the vascular bed will require one of these approaches so these approaches have been discussed uh, by dr karthik so i will not go into the detail but today's topic is more of carotid pta before cabg versus same setting ca with cabg so uh, the crest trial i would like to again emphasize uh, about this trial which dr karthik uh, uh, pointed the summary of this crest trial was that 10 year result demonstrated that stenting is a safe and durable as surgery at 10 years which is a very a uh, long term study there were 2500 patients 1607 consented for long term and finally there was no significant difference between stenting and surgery patient in primary composite endpoint so i'm talking about the statistical significance numerically as we saw in the graph the pointers were slightly towards ca but what is we are more interested in the uh, the the uh, the statistical significance similarly there was no difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic patients and in the rate of restenosis or revascularization this is the detail of the study where there is no significant difference between cas and ca over the 10 year follow up period uh, statistically not significant in fact if you look at the post procedure long term 10 year stroke the symptomatic 5 year rates at 2.5% for stenting and 2.7% for endarterectomy are very low especially when compared to the medical arm from the nesket trial and uh, if you look at the asymptomatic group uh, undergoing cas ce symptomatic cas ce so even rates were low and similar in all four groups so my point is when the event rates are equal or low in both group or statistically insignificant what is uh, in this cur current scenario where we are looking for minimally invasive uh, procedures to look for a procedure which will give us uh, you know minimal thing this is the graph which uh, dr karthik also pointed out across various age groups across the male female uh, status stenosis severity Uh, the statistical significance p value for interaction has been insignificant so this is what uh, i wanted to uh, point out so what was the conclusion from this crest trial post procedural rates of stroke for stenting and surgery are similar and they are very low 
there are no interaction between the treatment and symptomatic status and crest long term composite results are similar for stenting and surgery over a time horizon appropriate for elderly patient with severe carotid artery stenosis now this is a study uh, of a uh, 20 patients these are just pointers that people are studying and uh, there have been lot of such kind of studies i just put one of these studies where the uh, discussion was about the hybrid procedure of cas and cabg Uh, and uh, the uh, whether it decreases the risk of stroke and other complications uh, was the subject to study and it was concluded that the hybrid procedure of cas and coronary surgery might be a good therapeutic option and they studied in details uh, and it was cas was successful uh, there was uh, in the clinical outcomes in both the groups there was no statistical uh, significance uh, as far as uh, uh, you know both the arms were con- uh, concerned Uh, concerned and uh, uh, what it proved is CAG and CBG procedure were performed separately in the study time delay of two point. This was done intentionally in order to assess the neurological status. So this part is also important when we do a little stage. We know the neurological status of the patient from the uh, the carotid procedure versus the CABG itself has a, a risk of uh, causing a stroke because of the various reasons. So this uh, also helps us when we do a stage, uh, you know, prior uh, procedure and then uh, take it up uh, for this thing. When we do a symptomatic patients. uh carotid and artectomy these are the patients at uh, much risk for uh, uh, you know having a coronary mi and post procedural mi and uh, the trials and meta analysis have uh, uh, sh- shown uh, this is one study uh, meta analysis of five studies including 16712 patients where they compared the synchronous ca and cabg versus stage carotid artery stenting and cabg for patients with concomitant cat which is the uh, the case in our uh, discussion today and the conclusion was that this meta analysis did not detect statistically significant differences in the rate of perioperative stroke tia and mi between the group however patients in the simultaneous ca and cbg group had a significantly higher risk of 30 day mortality so uh, similarly uh, if you look at the timing of synchronous versus stage carotid and artectomy and coronary artery bypass grafting whether we should do a stage ca and synchronous we found that uh, this was of 11 studies comprising 44895 patients and the patients in the simultaneous ca and cbg group had a significantly higher 30 day mortality and stroke and lower risk for mmi as compared to the stage c and C- cbg group so again uh, uh, you know this data similarly there have been study about the synchronous uh, stage uh, carotid artery stenting versus uh, the uh, the uh, during the uh, bypass surgery uh, during the same time and there were four studies comprising 357 patients the simultaneous approach was associated with an increased risk of 30 day stroke compared to the staged cag and cabg however no statistical significant difference was found in long term results of mortality mi and stroke what i am trying to tell you uh, through these uh, uh, you know meta analysis and the studies is that simultaneous the surgery may have are related to most of the studies which i went through are related to increased mortality o- over 30 days and this was a article from the e journal of esc council of cardiology practice where they compared uh, both these strategies of treatment of carotid stenosis before uh, the coronary artery cabg and they found that the complication rates in patients who have undergone carotid angioplasty and stenting followed by cabg is significantly lower than in patient who have undergone combined carotid artectomy and open heart surgery and the meta analysis of 30 day outcome following stage carotid artery stenting before coronary bypass surgery showed that carotid artery stenting plus cabg is an attractive and less invasive alternative to carotid antrectomy plus cabg similarly about the risk of operative procedure what they concluded is that uh, the option which combined carotid antrectomy and cabg is related to higher stroke and death rates of 7.4 to 9.4% which is nearly twice the risk of each operation alone now these are some high risk features of ca and cas we should see whether our patient has any of these uh, anatomic or comorbidities so our high risk patients for uh, cea in fact unstable angina has been uh, considered as a, uh, as a risk factors for high risk factor for ca especially if you do a stage uh, ca and uh, you know uh, the uh, simultaneous one we know is associated with uh, more mortality which we went through all the papers now if you look at the high risk features for carotid artery stenting Uh, this patient uh, does not have any of these anatomies described in the thing and it looks pretty simple the age is 65 the possibility of tortuosity is uh, of the vessels vasculature bovine arch all these are little less which will make the carotid artery stenting more simple and easy and feasible 
so these are the advantages less invasive no risk of potential cranial nerve injury no arterial incision needed shorter hospital stay lower risk of myocardial in, in, infarction uh, we don't have the risk of kidney injury in this patient because this patient doesn't have any ckd uh, this patient appears to be suitable for dapt nothing mentioned in the history and the, there is a higher risk of stroke which has been described but these risks are non disabling stroke this is what i went through the literature that the disabling strokes are equal on both the sides so the advantage of cas plus cvg approach include immediate awareness of the procedural results in an awake patient shortening of the hospital stay less invasive procedure and even more acceptable cosmetic results looking at our uh, the the female in our uh, uh, you know discussion the efficacy and safety of cas and comparison with surgical procedure were extensively studied a recent meta analysis showed that overall in short term cas patient developed more strokes and less mi than those undergoing ca but the incidence of disabling stroke and death is similar so this is most important and the crest and space trials have shown promising results and from uh, finally everyday technology improvement which is happening in stent design structure use of uh, you know protection device might influence for the results in a positive way towards cas notably in stable patient with carotid artery disease so let us look at this patient and why i favor carotid pt in this patient is is a relatively young patient so vascular torticity calcification arch anomalies are less likely uh, which will make my uh, uh, carotid artery stenting much simpler no renal issues so no risk of akia anatomy seems favorable as only right ic is involved there is no bifurcation mentioned in the thing cosmetically better which is at 65 not matter but i think uh, one of the point again in favor i think we get the chance to evaluate the neurological stature, status in stage procedure which is not possible in synchronous procedure and the literature review meta analysis which i went through maximum studies are now favoring this approach uh, technology has advanced uh, cardio uh, the cerebral protection device also are being used the improved outcomes in cas plus cabg over time can likely be explained and which the meta analysis and recent studies are showing that it is improving and it has overtaken the uh, ca uh, especially in this kind of patient scenario it can be explained by more widespread use of embolic protection device and more experienced interventionist so coexisting carotid and coronary artery disease is common and the timing and sequence of myocardial is, is controversial uh, this was discussed in detail which vascular bed is symptomatic which approach anatomy i think this we discussed so both approaches are valid high risk feature which increases the chances of complication should be studied for both strategies and therefore individual is important needs to be discussed in heart team the but that centers and operator's experience is also important in a given case scenario my choice still would be carotid pta before cbg for all the reasons i enumerated and i think surgeons and cardiologists are a heart team and i think for this case i would request dr kartik to come on my side i have raised the bar i have raised the carotid pta i have made the bridge so welcome kartik thank you so much thanks dr thanks dr rahul for your uh, kind words and i see you wearing blue and inviting the blue team that is surgeon team towards you so that's a nice right. gesture <laughs> to begin with and uh, you know uh, it was a nice talk and uh, with a lot of facts and other things my only question would be uh, rahul if if at all if uh, there is an uh, problem with uh, prolonged hypotension following uh, uh, your uh, stenting so would that not undermine uh, the so, uh, the ca no. cardiac event which is acute right now yes uh, so exactly so i think we have to be very careful and very vigilant for these patients for next 48 72 hours we keep them in icu we stop their antihypertensive we make their so all those things i think those uh, care need to be taken not over dilating and uh, uh, you know not stretching the carotid uh, bulbs and all that area i think that can be managed most of the time we do it we uh, if we manage it well pre operatively pre procedure i think they do well that's what my experience is but those points are very well uh, taken and uh, we need to consider whenever we are dealing with uh, this kind of scenario uh, looking at the you know mortality uh, sorry the uh, stroke rate which was shown by dr patel uh, by neeler et al despite uh, a patient having 99% st uh, stenosis uh in unilateral artery and the, uh, the other artery is uh, by and large normal so the event rate is only 3% can we just do it with go away with uh, the coronary procedure first and maybe do it later yeah, so on so if you look at the a lot of meta analysis and trials this is a strong debate if the patient is completely asymptomatic on the uh, the uh, the carotid bed 
then uh, it will not make much sense to treat the uh, carotid just go ahead keep the carotids on medical management so this is a discussion and this is a point of debate also uh, based on uh, the lot of literature which is available that if the patient is completely because the event rate is very low if they are not symptomatic but yeah. if we consider our patient this patient has been uh, symptomatic had a tia 3 months back the symptomatic criteria is the patient has an event in within last 6 month is called as a symptomatic carotid artery stenosis so with that there is no controversy that we need to treat the carotid bed also but otherwise uh, i think your uh, point is uh, very well taken where uh, we can think about we can discuss and debate uh, and discuss in the heart team about this kind of scenario where it is just an incidentally detected uh, severe unilateral carotid artery stenosis uh, uh, where uh, you know the, the it can be discussed in the heart team but but again uh, this uh, event of tia was 3 months ago and uh, for all practical purposes uh, the patient would be on some antiplatelet and uh, uh, statins right so some amount of protection is already been given to the patient so yeah. can we the still consider the symptomatic tia within 6 months so symptomatic tia is within 6 months if they had an event with uh, severe carotid mm-hmm. risk called as symptomatic symptomatic cas yes. carotid yes. artery stenosis yes. i would ask my surgeon uh, friend Included just the presence of stenosis, so that the stroke rate is low in that uh, particular study. But if the patient hmm. is symptomatic with a stenosis of more than severe, then stroke rate would be a double, I think. There, and then is shown in that nilo because he has not included a patient symptomatic status. No, no. In the same trial, he says the that the stenosis and a patient knowing CABG, the, he has not included symptomatic or asymptomatic status of yes. the patient. That is no, no. now data there are coming that in a patient with symptomatic, the risk is higher as compared to patient who is asymptomatic. Yeah, but no. I in the same, uh, I may add, says, a, Naylor yeah. has told that approximately fifty percent of the patients have a cerebral event which is not related to stenosis. right because so you cannot stroke and the second question uh, to dr uh, no karthik is uh, now our friend dr uh, rahul has done a uh, carotid artery stenting he is on dual antiplatelet how many of our surgeon friends would be comfortable in doing a cbg at this that moment is the, that is the bigger uh, caveat that at least 4 weeks that dual antiplatelet has to be started and it is generally our preference that before of pump cbg at least uh, clopidogrel has to be stopped 3 to 4 days before surgery we generally continue on ecospin low dose 75 but at least a dual antiplatelet has to be stopped that is our usual protocol in in our institute whatever the if the patient suppose patient requires an intervention and we put a stent then at least we give them 4 to 6 weeks of anticoagulation then they we again admit them evaluate and then we operate the patient so usually we give that window period if the patient is undergoing a carotid intervention by cardiologist so any more questions from our moderators dr beni yeah i was just uh, pointing the same point out although the stroke risk increases the ipsilateral stroke that has been always told that there is the ipsilateral stroke is not been studied or it's even in meta analysis in the latest ones they were actually equal which means it is still debatable whether the carotid stenosis as such is the reason for the increased strokes secondly the the cabg itself we know has a increased uh, risk of stroke add to it the bypass or the on pump uh, hemodynamic changes that occur when a 95% stenosis on an ipsilateral carotid that could bear um, a slight a slightly increased brunt on that ipsilateral area but yes uh, like dr karthik said the minimal invasive uh, approaches or the off pump ones are probably more safe for in such patients i think if both are symptomatic that's when the dilemma arrives i think the symptomatics always determine what you do first if you patient if your patient had an acs and had an asymptomatic uh, carotid artery disease things would be easier if patient had a tia but it was incidentally found out to have a triple vessel disease which in a non acs then it becomes easier for intervening the carotids but when you have a scenario when both are symptomatic or one of them is a critical disease though not symptomatic like a left main or a say near total occlusion of a carotid then probably uh, i think it would become again a heart team approach though it's nowhere mentioned mm-hmm. per se in the guidelines mm-hmm. to have a heart team approach mm-hmm. when you're dealing with this yeah. but this is one gray area where probably you need to involve a neurologist a neurointerventionist a 
a cardiothoracic surgeon or maybe a cardiologist and nowadays kamal we are also getting the opinion of neurophysician also patient who are having symptomatic carotid or an patient who had a symptom of carotid we do get their help ke whether we should go and intervene in the carotids or not and personally i believe that it's always rather than pulling them the first slide which is showed by dr rahul we should put a ladder rather than the rope between them and we both of us should come to come together what i have experienced is that if we go undergo a carotid intervention with a stenting at least it gives some amount of relief while operating any possible that stage approach really helps to the benefit of patients rather than we should not think of ourselves or who is right or who is wrong in the betterment of patient that hybrid approach definitely helps definitely so, so what uh, about the problem the, uh, if there is disease um, in some other territories like femorals uh, just imagine that your femorals are too bad for any access so no, what would you do a uh, few then we explained the patient because in that case the patient undergoing peripheral vascular disease with coronary artery bypass disease the risk uh, definitely goes higher and in that case we have to decide whether the patient is really symptomatic for coronaries or not that is most important if it requires a coronary intervention and that is a surgical intervention then definitely risk goes very high no no sir and dr raul uh, your choice of uh, sorry dr girish was yeah, i was asking dr raul about has... choice of dapt So, uh, aspirin patient, and. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. You no, know, the dual antiplatelet would be aspirin and clopidogrel, and uh, you know, uh, usually a uh, few cases which we have done where the surgeon was comfortable with, uh, uh, and we can stop after seven to ten days uh, for a short while uh, the antiplatelets, and single ecosprin can be continued. Surgeons can operate on a seventy-five milligram ecosprin, and usually it it's not an issue. That's what I feel. the yeah, carotid stents don't behave like drug eluting stents that's the yes. fun of it the car- carapers are huge these are usually self expanding stents and the risk of stent thrombosis does not arise uh, as you yes. look at in the bare metal stents uh, so i think it's 7 10 days window is good enough that's what i believe any counters on that uh, dr anandan dr girish dr jignesh bhai kartik fair enough i think 7 uh, yeah. days is good enough but there are people uh, there are uh, surgeons who do on the same day because many a times you see that uh, uh, if there is an indication if there is an emergency indication they often do on dual antiplatelets not that they don't do it so but uh, yes sometimes scenario might change if there is an associated you know atrial fibrillation where uh, your anticoagulation is again indicated there there you might think whether to do or not to do so that might change that scenario might change no in cases of renal artery disease we do first we do advise renal artery stenting antiplatelets for 4 to 6 weeks and then later we operate the patient renals itself have become so much debatable i think next debatable, year you yes. to keep that debate as well so i'll have to yes. create uh, bilateral renal artery stenosis dtpa functional <laughs> and creatinine rising and yes. then patient needs a on pump surgery so something like that and then we can debate what to do first so just to know from the surgeon's point of view like for cas we have this embolic protection devices so how is the procedure for carotid endarterectomy actually performed um, you know just if you can just briefly tell us you have the same the, if, but the time permits i can show you the video there are balloons and stents are available which is just like a epd which will prevent EPD. a distal embolization as well as it will uh, perfuse the distal bed mm-hmm. so uh, the vd i have this life view most slide was there but due to lack of time i cannot show you yeah okay you want i will i can share with you the yeah, video please. i can share with you yeah please thank you i think this procedure can be done on uh, a local nurse right sir they are uh, even this is uh, the, our doubt see actually the the debate is a debate we have, we just share things but regarding the procedure there is a there is a serious misunderstanding between each of our procedures i mean i i find that educating each other should be more important than just holding a simple uh, factual debate about articles because more we know about your uh, procedures we can actually choose the right patients for you and you can also send the right kind of patients to us so that you know it becomes a win win situation for both yeah i think we should move to next session now okay uh thanks dr kamal uh, uh, thank you thank you it was a nice discussion on the uh, very difficult topic and with that uh, i would uh, end this uh, session and dr kamal for uh, the next session please
Thank you, chairpersons, moderators, and speakers. Thank you for joining and for a wonderful session and wonderful yeah. talk and deliberation. Uh, we move to next session. Uh, moderators for the session are Dr. Jasmine Vora, Dr. Mandeep Chellara, Dr. Utsav Unadkar, and we have chairperson. We have Dr. Tarun Dave, Dr. Surinder Devra, and Dr. Jayal Shah. I request moderators and chairpersons to introduce our speakers and then introduce the case. Show the PPTs for the same, and then go ahead and uh, have the talks. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please, Dr. Surendra, okay, go ahead. So, so welcome all of you for the CardioCon 2022. So, shifting our gears from carotid to again coronary back to coronaries, we have two wonderful speakers with us, Dr. Anand Shukla. I think uh, we all know him. He's a senior interventional cardiologist at Ahmedabad. He is a professor at uh, UN Mehta Hospital also. And uh, on the other side. We have Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Sidhana. Can we have that slide, please? Dr. Sanjeev Sidhana. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Sidhana, he did his MBBS and MD from BHU, Varanasi, and uh, from RML Hospitals. He did uh, his cardiology training from RML Hospital and did DM from SMS. Jaipur. He is presently senior interventional cardiologist and associate director at EACC Jaipur. So this on this hot uh, debate, the case, I will just brief about the case. So uh, yeah, the case is 68 years old male. He is having a new onset of atypical angina with an inconclusive at five minutes with fatigue. Angiography, which always, you know, which we uh, always see, it's around 60 to 70% of uh, stenosis on QCA at LED ostium with 65% at the large diagonal artery. Now, such type of uh, anatomy, they always have a dilemma. How should we proceed on? What should we do first? Should we go for imaging? Should we go for, um, you know, our eyeball assessment? How should we go uh, about this? So uh, I think uh, I will request Dr. Anand Shukla to start his talk about the imaging in uh, a role of imaging in such type of patient. Uh, Dr. Anand Shukla. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm try to share my screen. Can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Okay. Yes. Yes, so, thank, uh, thank, thank you, you Kamal much. and the... Yes. And a moderator to introduce me. So today's topic already that angiography has been so. So I will going into detail so we can have good discussion and debate. So myself in the I what is image seeing is the believing. How can if you see the pretest probability, the evidence are less with me as just like the pretest match result of this um, Indian West Indies match. So as we know that the moderate lesion, the still the Physiology has upper role as evidence wise. So I will divide my presentation into understanding of the given scenario and in what is the intermediate lesion, why we require the debate on the intermediate lesion, current accommodation, any role of imaging modalities, and what are the evidence for the intermediate imaging modalities. So as per the this this case fall in the no tested or tested performed with the intermediate result may be considered as per the appropriateness criteria for the revascularization. So we define the just briefly intermediate lesion. The definition given in 97 by the cold and a liposcum from animal model. After that, it has never been testified in the, any trial. The 50% threshold has been taken uh, consecutive as a part of intermediate lesion. QCA versus Experience angiography, there is always 10 to 15 percent observation variability. Till debate is today's going on, FFR still a gold evidence based support, support than the imaging. But 20 percent of severe LED osteal lesion may turn out to be FFR negative, and 10 to percent of FFR negative lesion carry the vulnerability. So we can focus on the, this part. So, why intermediate stenosis require the analysis before going? For, we can put the stand DS with the good success rate. We are good confidence. Why debate? Because by deploying the stand, we replace the atherosclerosis disease by the stand disease. So stenting itself is a iatrogenic disease. FFR ne negative lesions carries the event rate 1% per year, while 
if we take the conservative approach even modern strength carries the complication rate by 2 to 3.5 percent per year so preferable to have objective evidence or convincing subjective objective evidence of ischemia before going for the uh, revascularization so it is a debate like being human or being a cardiologist whether patient will benefit or not then will i take the decision so current accommodation for the fa part we all we know that is a much more mm-hmm. evidence in favor of the physiology physiology can be done instantly with the now more and more widely acceptable but adenosine induced vasodilators in is not natural physiology what we patient do the by exercise the neuroinvolvenol and vasodilators totally different than the it is a like vivo versus vitro model bifurcation lesion fa part major prone to error fa part and two lesion can be assessed cannot be assessed because there will be the cross talk also and what about it it never bother about flow across the lesion simply reason the lie our pressure different just there is a no severity criteria coaxation by difference of upper limb lower limb bp measurement so how accurately we can imply the fa per criteria to the final decision it is not we can we have to think of over and above fa per in certain not all scenario so if we ignore the morphology of lesion we know that eccentric soft lesion with the good distal ffr is a light coronary explosion yeah, these are the theoretical uh, uh, limitation of the ffr enumerate if you i am seeing the ffr in other angle that's why i mention in out it may be overestimate underestimate vasospasm tortuosity elevator right pressure order right side heart failure if mean during the ffr measure event your mean systolic pressure less than 60 then underestimate the ffr hypertension there is a left ventricle hypotrophy microcircular dysfunction aortic stenosis so these are the condition when we can because we rely on the simple digit that is 0.8 and if that point is going to influence by so many condition then we should be concerned care about that digital 0.79 versus 0.81 value so ffr is less than point definitely we revascular intermediate lesion but in the distal ala or proximal lad posterior lad and the bifurcation we may require or in the underlying condition if it is the unstable in this case definitely the we are discussing the stable condition stable angina i never come out of the any literature due to inherent nature of interventional cardiology to do, do something for the societal lesion so i could not find any trial for ffr positive and revascular different imaging basis that is a cardiology bias that is because we don't we want to do something we want to stand that's why i could not find any literature so if if ffr is more than pointed everybody agree that nobody touch the lesion but there are some data recently by the prospect and forza study so we can have so intermediate low image that is my main talk that is a two trial that i could find the some evidence for this this is a forza trial is done by the francisco barzota that is a aim of the study to compare the oct guidance and fractional floor guidance in patient with angiography intermediate coronary lesion angiography in a single center prospective one to one study the conclusion is that trial in the patient with angiography intermediate coronary lesion oct guidance is associated with the low, lower occurrence of composite major adverse cardiovascular event or significant angina ffr guidance associated with the more medical management and lower cost the oct is more stenting but outcome is not worse than the ffr guidance similarly there is a percutaneous coronary intervention of vulnerable coronary atherosclerosis by the gear greg stone and Uh, Jia Dali, the similar the occurs mild, the uh, more intermediate lesion. The PCI of angiographically mild lesion with the large plaque burden was safe, substantially enlarged the follow-up minimal, minimal lumen area, and was associated with a favorable long, long-term clinical out- outcome, warranting to perform the adequate power study. So these are the two study have shown that even though the FFR negative, one can take the decision on the basis of the image morphology. This is a proven FSOP trial. The outcome that is a blue line is a FSOP BBS plus guideline directed medical therapy versus guideline directed medical therapy alone. That is a red bar. So the 
less mesh in the uh, uh, EPSO plus gui guideline director medical therapy. Another side is optical OCT guided complete decision making, analysis as well as indication. So the new terminal has been introduced optical flow ratio. Just now computation, they are derived the mathematics of computer optical flow ratio. We can have as as physiological as well as anatomical. So these are the parameter may in future help to diagnose because physiological we have assessed by the FFR. But if we combine the anatomy and physiology, that will be the better for the long term result. So OCT can help to identify the morphology and physiology, therapeutic and therapeutic on the whole circle we can justify. Now these are the certain OCT criteria and how they are compared with the FFR cutoff value of 0.8. That is a potential sensitive specific ranging from different. There is no clear cut guideline that uh, these are the OCT values, this will have less than FFR. But these are the trials. You can compare the OCT data with the FFR. Similarly, the, there is I, IWAS data also, the assessment, IWAS assessment to angiography intermediate lesion. That is a MLA, that is a four millimeter black burden, more than 70, lumen, lumen and stenosis more than 70, and the arch more than 90 percent. That will identify to helpful to revascularization in a few trials. So these are the trials for the IWAS and FFR comparison, LMCA, non-LMCA. And these all trials, their baseline cutoff will be different area with the sensitivity, specificity, positive predict, negative predict value that uh, compare with the FFR trial. If you are angiography, if you are using the IVAS in the proximal LED or the proximal SR complex dominant, if MLA more less than six, then FFR or non-invasive trace is available. If it is not, then area stenosis more than 60 to 70 percent, black burden more than 80 percent, lesion length more than 20 percent one can take the decision for the revascular. If MLA more than four, then defer the revascular. These are the angiographic IVAS guidance for the intermediate lesion approach. So why the data is lacking for the stent stenting the vulnerable but fractionally flow negative result? Because this trial, there are three trials, one prospect absorbed trial result I have discussed that is a Stone, Greg Stone, and the Gia Dallari trial. Another two trial on the way that is a prevent and a practice, the result expected in 2022, where the FFR negative and the yeah, image guided trial. So, why there is evidence leaking? Because it required 23,000 intermediate lesion screening. Among that, 3,000 patients required to study for the randomization. The large number of so 20. 3,000 patients screening and approximately 4,000 patients to be enrolled for the intermediate lesion with FFR image to prove the image is additional to FFR. That nowadays is maybe the evidence based on not possible. That's why we are lacking the good clinical last <laughs> data. And approximately 60 to 20 percent of FFR naked lesion were having thin cap fibrous atheroma that is Zimmerman recently in Jack intervention they have published. So what are the vulnerable plaque? Plague burden more than 70, plague area more than 70, MLA in proximal vessels, non left men, non left men, less than 4 milliliter, fibrous cap thickness is less than 50 in the prospectile, but ideally 67 is taken for the thin cap fibrous atheroma. So these are the different criteria for the vulnerable. If you have find this vulnerable, like even the lesions are FFR negative, if the lesion is situated proximal LED in circumplex, then we we have to think of the revascularization taking the under overall holistic approach. So the future of OCT and IVAS or any imaging assessment may lie in the coupling with the computational flow dynamic that was CFR or any computational flow dynamic simulation of coronary flow and the pressure. Simultaneous anatomy functional assess may be the future of the imaging and the physiology to define the uh, approach for the intermediate lesion. These are the 3D IVAS and OCT accuracy against FFR point accuracy, 90% specificity, and the positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Because we believe that till that, as per the evidence, FFR is the gold zone. 
So uh, although the FFR and imaging are eloquent proponent for the either technique, both procedures are valuable in cardiac catheterization laboratory and provide critical information that supplement the foundation of high quality angiography. Is PTS is indicated, then we require the shift from anatomical revascularization to physiological revascularization. FFR is more applicable and I ever says role in the LA, proximal LED in the left man. If you want the PCI, these are the previous. Uh, if you want to do the PCI by any other, then get do the IVAS. If you do not want to PCI, then do the FFR. And mm -hmm. we were so long as you leave the judging the men by their outward appear. So we have to um, approach the patient as a whole rather than the lesion because we don't we are not treating the lesion, we are not treating the uh, uh, isolated PS symptom because we have to improve the ischemia or ischemic symptom by the objective subject. Really. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anand Shukla. I think uh, we will continue our this discussion on the other side, the role of uh, FFR. I will uh, request Dr. Sanjeev Sidana to please yeah. start the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Dave, uh, Dr. Devara, sorry, and uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, I think Dr. Anand has made my work very easy and uh, uh, will not uh, going to take this as a more of debate because uh, unfortunately there is not much of uh, randomized data is not available on this subject and both these tests they are so different that it is very difficult to compare them and uh, to make a debate uh, uh, because one is definitely anatomical test, one is physiological test so both are uh, very different and uh, uh, while searching for the data uh, only one uh, large uh, randomized trial uh, I could come across that was a flavor trial which is being conducted in the China and the Korea but unfortunately they have completed the randomization and the results are yet to be out so uh, there is not as much uh, of the randomized data is not available. So uh, we will con continue with my presentation uh, quickly and then we can uh, go on with the discussion part and uh, once we have done an anatomical test that is angiography then uh, definitely the next uh, logical step should be a physiological assessment of the lesion because ultimately the purpose of our treatment is to relieve the ischemia at the tissue level. And these are the, some of the unique features uh, which are which are very unique to FFR and uh, it is very easy to perform and uh, normal value is one for every patient and for one every T, one every artery. Uh, like uh, it is not like uh, I was that uh, uh, all the arteries they have different um, uh, areas and even the uh, areas uh, vary from the ethnicity to ethnicity like uh, criteria for cutoff for uh, Europeans are different from the Asians and uh, FFR is not influenced by the changing hemodynamic condition like heart rate, blood pressure and contactility. FFR specifically relates to influence of epicardial stenosis through myocardial perfusion area and blood flow. So that is very important and uh, it takes into account the collateral flow also and uh, it has got a very circumscript uh, single threshold value that is 0.8 that, uh, that is taken to indicate the ischemia and uh, FFR is very easy to measure and success with the success rate of 99% it is extremely reproducible. So uh, we know that angiography may always over or underestimate the lesion severity and even if the patient uh, we consider uh, with, uh, in which diabetes stenosis is from 50 to 70 percent, 65 percent of the patient they may have a uh, FFR value of uh, more than 0.8. So that actually emphasizes that uh, all the lesions in the intermediate severity uh, should be assessed with the FFR and uh, uh, and uh, the even the lesion uh, lesion uh, stenosis of 71 to 90 percent, 20 percent of the patient, they may have a FFR value of uh, more than 0.8. And uh, FFR is highly uh, it is it is very reproducible. Uh, uh, investigation and in this uh, we have compared that first FFR measure with the second FFR and they are high, uh, they are highly reproducible. And uh, uh, like I have said that uh, the cutoff criteria for cutoff for diameter and uh, area for uh, left main, non-left main arteries that is different and uh, it varies from ethnicity to ethnicity also and but in case of FFR it is uh, value is one for all the arteries and for all the patients uh, irrespective of the ethnicity and the size of the patient and uh, uh, like but uh, uh, this is how we actually conceptualize how to measure the physiological effect of FFR. Uh, the uh, the uh, aortic pressure is directly transmitted into the coronary tree, and uh, we can uh, we can consider uh, that. Uh, 
uh, this pressure is uh, equal to the aortic pressure and uh, if there is a stenosis then definitely the distal pressure will be low and once we induce the hyperemia we can actually accentuate the effect of uh, this stenosis and uh, then we can measure that whether FFR value is less than 0.8 or not. So this is the physiology again, uh, the FFR is the, the flow of uh, maximum uh, flow in the stenosis artery to the maximum flow in the normal artery. So that can be calculated with the uh, PD minus PV uh, uh, upon the PD, PA minus PV divided by the resistance. So we can simplify this by removing uh, uh, this uh, venous pressure because that is close to zero and by resistance by inducing uh, hyperemia and uh, uh, these uh, these two are very low, close to zero and we can remove them and we can easily calculate the FFR by just uh, taking the ratio of PD by PA. And uh, it is very easy to uh, do perform the uh, FFR and just uh, we need to take a FFR wire and uh, we need to actually uh, equalize it uh, to first to the atmosphere and then we need to apply after just uh, after taking it out of guide and uh, once we equalize and uh, then we uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, wire is actually advanced uh, uh, distal to the lesion and uh, maximum hyperemia is induced with the uh, with the most most commonly with the adenosine that is intravenous adenosine and uh, uh, and it is very easy to calculate the ratio and if it is less than 0.8 then we need to treat the lesion and if it is more than 0.8 uh, and uh, then it is uh, we can leave the lesion and uh, it is very easy to interpret the result of FFR when we compare it with the IVAS. Uh, it doesn't require much of technicality and uh, we'll get the result in a, uh, in a value and uh, we can actually decide whether to treat the lesion or not. And uh, it is equal uh, to one in all the arteries and uh, will be less than one. It will take into consideration the perfusion area also. So for the similar uh, same amount of stenosis, if the artery is supplying large area, then FFR may be significant. And uh, if it is supplying the small area, FFR might, might not be significant. And uh, again, it will take into consideration scarce tissue, which will not be considered in the case of IWAS. And uh, uh, because we are doing physiological assessment, so uh, because scar tissue will not require much of the blood flow, so uh, so we conduct if uh, artery is supplying scar tissue, then FFR might be normal, and if it is supplying uh, normal tissue, FFR might be abnormal. And the, uh, the other part is that it will take into consideration collateral flow also. So if it, the area is receiving collateral flow, FFR might not be significant, and we do not treat, treat this reason. And this part is again missed by the IVAS. And uh, although uh, it, it has been said that IVAS uh, actually uh, lead to optimization of stent and it will improve the outcome. But FFR also can uh, be used as, to improve the outcome. Like if this, uh, this is data which showing that FFR after st uh, stent deployment is if it is more than 0.96, then uh, the uh, TPR at six months is only 4.9, while it increases with the increase in the FFR value, in the decrease in the FFR value. So FFR data is uh, very much validated and it has been uh, validated against many uh, non invasive tests which actually used to produce the reversible ischemia that is exercise test, thallium scan and stress echo and 0.8 uh, auto value point rate has been correlated to all these, uh, all these uh, non invasive tests. And, uh, and this is highly uh, sensitive and specific. And if FFR is more than uh, 0.75, the ischemia is very unlikely with the sensitivity of 88%. And FFR is less than 0.75, it is very specific with the specificity of 100%. And we have a lot of clinical data in the field of uh, FFR. And these are the three last trials which have been conducted. That is DEFR, FAME1 and FAME2. DEFR trial actually... Uh, actually involved 325 patient uh, with the and uh, the patient who has got FFR of less than 0.75 they underwent PCI and patient with the FFR of more than 0.75 they were again randomized to PCI and uh, medical compare medical treatment and uh, this shows that uh, revascularization of stenosis with FFR of more, more than 0.75 is not inferior to PCI and uh, again in the FAME trial the 1000 patients were taken and uh, in one group the PCI to all the stenosis more than 50% was done and uh, uh, other group was randomized to FFR and uh, the PCI was done only if FFR was less than 
point eight, and this trial shows that revascularization of only the stenosis with the FFR of point eight is not inferior to revascularization of all the stenosis. FEM true trial again showed very strong evidence, and it was stopped prematurely because it showed that if we do not do PCI in uh, subgroup which has both FFR of less than point eight, they are going to have more events. And uh, again, showing the data from the FAME trial and uh, uh, FAME 2 trial again says that uh, uh, the PCI with DES provides sustained benefit in the patient who has got uh, FFR of less than 0.8 and, uh, uh, and reducing the incidence of need for urgent revascularization, rate of spontaneous myocardial infarction, symptomatic relief and without uh, late catch-up uh, phenomenon. And not only it actually... Uh, improves the outcome. It also reduces the cost also because in many of our centers also the cost of PCI is, uh, it costs around 1.5 lakhs and uh, the FFR can be done only with the 30 or 40,000 rupees. And guidelines also recommend uh, FFR as uh, class 1 in recommendation by the European guidelines and class 2A by the American guidelines. So to conclude, I would say that FFR should be choice of modality for assessment of borderline lesion and there is a lot of data to support that FFR guided PCI reduces the cost of therapy and increases the health outcome of the patient and FFR takes into consideration uh, the perfusion area and collateral thus guiding uh, on the requirement of DS implantation and ESC guidelines they classify uh, FFR as a class 1 indication and uh, uh, while amazing has been given class 2 indication and FFR is much better third eye for the borderline lesion when it is compared to amazing. So with this uh, I'll end my presentation and uh, we can continue with the debate. I think we agree, uh, we all will agree that uh, there cannot be debate between the IVUS or FFR and uh, IFR. One is physiological, another is anatomical uh, assessment of coronary lesions. But uh, uh, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Shukla and uh, Dr. Sidana what exactly to do in this patient who is having an austere LED yeah. of around borderline 60-70% of lesion. In this, uh, my personal feeling is that the FFR in this index case, suppose you take from the diagonal or do it from the LED. The Can FFR we have that angio please? Angio pick please. So that was an anecdotal example. Uh, we, the, that the lesion that we are showing is actually a LED diagonal bifurcation. But then the case that we have given here is an austere. So uh, we need not go by that. I think the case history is more important that we are looking at. So what we need to be discussing is a austere LED. How often do we end up not doing anything? And I think Dr. Anand Ahuja has also asked a very pertinent question. What if you have imaging positive FFR negative and what if you have imaging negative FFR positive? So, if you so either I of the scenarios, where would you end up? So first, I will start with the imaging part in the osteal. The osteal LED is not the isolated disease. Hardly 15 to 20 percent with isolated osteal disease. So some plaque distribution in the either distal left main or the adjacent circumflex. So this the osteal location is such a time bomb. If you be, we leave the vulnerable morphology, so my opinion would be that if you uh, decision take reverse curve in the FFR negative, but before giving the clear green signal, no need to only medical, then if possible, then the anatomical assessment would be the advisable as the osteal isolated lesion also spill over to the distal left main and also. Dr. Sadana. Yes. Yeah, definitely the important point in this particular case is that he has got a new onset of symptoms. So that that this particular patient might have an unstable plaque and uh, we might need to do imaging in this patient also. And uh, But uh, uh, if we uh, demonstrate that this patient doesn't have any vulnerable plaque, then FFR can be done. and Or we might do FFR first and then FFR. if FFR yeah. is... Uh, uh, so one of these uh, uh, these modality can be used first and both if both we use both the modality, then definitely we can plan the treatment better. Or nuclear trace test and FFR because functional assessment, any trace test, suppose TMT, you could not do the TMT more than fine, a TMT inconclusive. Then we can think of the nuclear trace test, exercise trace test or a pharmacological nuclear trace test to see the indiscible ischem in LED territory plus FFR before giving the, say that you are the safe for the medical management. Or the yeah, in the, in the same situation, when we have performed the angiogram, then definitely it is not possible for yeah. the patient to do a second procedure. So in, we have to decide in the same test. So then uh, definitely FFR, because the patient doesn't have a typical symptoms. 
yes, patient yes, has got atypical yes, yes. symptoms so ffr can be uh, first line of uh, and, investigation and no i no hypertension no other risk factor except the age so other yeah. panelist dr tarun dave and uh, your yeah other my your my suggestion is that suppose in this case you have done yes. an imaging and ffr yes. is uh, you you see 0.8 or 0.82 so you will differ but your imaging shows that the 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 indications for uh, intervention stands because this osteal location is really confusing yeah so, so if, again if at least again, my feeling is my feeling is that is either of one is positive then i think uh, the, in yeah, such location so, it should be yeah, done. either of one but there is a trial of treating the vulnerable uh, plaque but we yeah. have not conclusive good result with the stand as in my first slide if we replace the atherosclerosis with the stent disease the atherosclerosis the carries disease. the less mass than the stenting so till date the last decade when 2010 to 2015 the vulnerable plaque vulnerable patient all these concept has been uh, prioritized but mm. there is failed data to show the treat the vulnerable plaque if we give the high statin and guideline direct the medical therapy the vulnerable plaque turn to be the stable plaque they have shown so stenting is not the answer so on even the as per the evidence still date i still believe though i am i am given the topic of imaging if patient shows the high high risk of imaging but if i have to treat then i have to of the table indication for the revascular your ffr is negative morphology shows the high vulnerability that's why i am taking the disease of stenting that yeah. top level indication i am approaching that i have to discuss is there any is there any data that you see we know that uh, ffr is also negative in a critical uh, lesion like say 20% yeah. or 25% how, yeah, yeah. how much how much of these patients will be having an osteal led location is there any such data na let the professor you can uh, yeah. can yeah. No, yes, I, i don't think yeah. they have they have characterized the lesion into osteal or mid led or uh, that that particular data has how not been given how much is the policy of the but ffr i think i location. think ffr applies to all the uh, all this except uh, uh, left main lesions all this uh, trial actually included non left main lesions and uh, it uh, non left major main lesion will include a osteal led lesion also so uh, i suppose that uh, osteal led lesion must have been included in all these trials and uh, Uh, we need to uh, take this data uh, very seriously and uh, if ffr is negative definitely in this case i would like to uh, keep this patient on medical management yeah. i think no, fame 3 i'm sorry uh, in fame 3 fame 3 data we have clearly known that even if you guide your pcis and leave lesions which you felt were ffr negative were actually not going to yield you cv outcome superiority especially when you're looking in terms of cavg outcomes so that probably you can extrapole it and look at it in terms of that ffr might be good in this patient to leave not to stent but we don't know when you're looking at it in terms of medical management fine but what about if this patient was to have a multi vessel disease and you were guiding yeah. uh, ffr as a revas strategy for a multi vessel disease uh, strategy you're stenting one and leaving the other that way probably it's not going to be a good idea based on ffr uh, fame 3 True. Yeah. The second thing is that uh, we can do uh, many tests like troponin etc. to demonstrate whether this patient had acute coronary syndrome or not, and then we can take the decision based on uh, that also. If patient has got uh, troponin negative and uh, symptoms are atypical, then definitely FFR. If FFR negative is uh, patient has got FFR of value of more than point eight, then we can uh, manage this patient medically. But so yeah, I think yeah. everything it, has it, to be done. Even in the ACS, uh, ACS. as is category the ffr negative lesion carry the worst outcome than stable angina that is the data source so as is category is a different ball game that, and stable angina stable angina definitely, category yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah 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 i think a good excellent presentation by the presenters uh, mm -hmm. my question i would like to uh, ask uh, dr shukla uh, actually uh, sir what are your insights on the this hybrid coronary imaging at uh, the new uh, Data yeah. is coming in. So yeah, so OFR and all these things. We have to combine both. It is yes. a analyze the elephant as a whole. We cannot see ele elephant as a ele trunk or any as is ele elephant as a column or as is. A, we have to analyze as a whole. What we are treating, we are we are treating patient as a whole, not the lesion. So we have to understand ourselves and we have to supply the uh, supplement our understanding with the evidence base. So Dr. Kamala say ask Australia lady. We take the scenario, uh, tricky scenario that FFR is negative, or still LED, 
and so the vulnerability thin fibrous care then 67 then even evidence wise we difficult to leave the patient then we have to discuss it out with the patient the morphology you carry the some risk factor it is a like uh, though the till date evidence shows the medical guided guided, guided medical therapy will reduce your risk but it is not guarantee but recently yes, there yes. is a publication that even ffr guided intermediate lesion which you have left also carries a future event rate it's not always that they will not get the events so yes. both way so, we have now evidence so ultimately you have to, yeah. ultimately you will have to go with the patient and both the modalities imaging finding and plus the as dr sanjeev has said about the other uh, cardiac enzymes and other things and then take it call yeah one one more point i would like to add is that uh, recently because uh, british guidelines they say that uh, they use uh, ct angiography as a class 1 uh, 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 in uh, diagnostic modality in the patient uh, who are present with the chest pain so they have actually now included the ct uh, uh, guided ffr in the uh, angiography also so that has again uh, actually that has reduced the chances of uh, patient being referred for uh, the invasive coronary angiogram and uh, uh, the stenting so we can uh, that kind of uh, scenario can also come in the future when we uh, when we actually incorporate the ct ffr into the all the ct imaging and then uh, we can decide whether patient will require invasive angiogram or not So, Dr. Sidana, only challenge with the CT FFR and the CT angios, uh, CT angios and FFR, it it puts a lot of huge uh, radiation burden on the patient. That that's is, you know, always if you are in the somewhere yeah. dilated, yeah. then again you have to put patient on radiation. Definitely, that, that, no, that's true. That, that Contrast and radiation yeah. is very important. Yeah, Dr. Anand, another one question: FFR negative, morphology positive, still. scientifically we have to leave the lesion but if you have to discuss it out openly with the patient regarding the morphology it is a off label indication for reverse similarly they have, so we have to take the as a whole analytic whether where is it situated ulceration is there and if ever that was i believe absolutely and also the patient i mean whether the patient yeah, profile yeah. is of acs yeah, non acs yeah. yes, yes. stable atypical angina Any so other comments from the panel? Else, yeah, we yeah. had a wonderful just, session. Uh, we can just, move to the next uh, session. Uh, yeah, yes, Jen. Yes, Jen. Just for the sake of new fellows and recently passed out cardiologists, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shukla, sir, what are, what are the I think the difficulties and disadvantages of OCT, especially yeah. in LM interventions and other disease subtypes, or in relation to different uh, like anatomic subsets or uh, other yeah. lesions? So. Oh, OCT now initially the one is the one was a die RCA we can do without die also normal saline injection we can well do the OCT so the die contraindication of OCT is rule out in the RCA in left system still we require the die second is the larger the diameter then the OCT it it is reconstructed image the larger the diameter so then the left main is difficult particularly to osteal left main you one cannot assess the by the OCT. third is ocit and the actual coronary diameter matching much more if you analysis the diameter coronary diameter i was there slightly over estimate but ocit and the actual they have in in the analysis they are much more one to one comparison with the ocit there are more thin thin fibrous cap more defined with the ocit h dissection or more defined ocit the learning with the ocit with the less i was with the more that was So what are the salient difference I like to highlight? And is the limen you can point it out? I yeah, I think that also. session we had uh, Dr. Jail's question was very pertinent. That question, that session we already had for F, I mean Ivers versus okay. OCT. Okay. That okay. was a separate okay. debate that already was there. This was we wanted to pitch imaging versus FFR, but a very valid okay. question because some of those might have missed yesterday's session on Ivers versus OCT. Uh, yeah, Dr. Utsa was saying something. We can have your closing comments. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I would also like to ask, uh, in case of one scenario, what if there is a bifurcation lesion and uh, there is a stable plaque in the LED, suppose, and the diagonal is having a you know a vulnerable plaque with a significant FFR lesion? Uh, you know, what would you do in that case? Yeah, I think uh, uh, for diagonal only, I would not like to treat this patient with the stenting. Uh, I would like to keep this patient on medical management. No, Doctor Sanjeev, but if your diagonal is two point five, then patient is symptom. 
So uh-huh. it, if it is hostel, you you want to uh, you want to make us more than tricky wicket, both of us. <laughs> oh, we had another debate on that on a small vessel disease where we debated D B versus D S. Yes. So. <laughs> So we both we can go back to that session also. Yeah. So <laughs> only the symptomatic, then then yeah. we need not to do FFR. <laughs> then definitely without <laughs> FFR, so, we can proceed with the PCI. <laughs> the conclusion <laughs> remark is the stent is a hydrogenic disease. Native atherosclerosis is the still better. So choose so, the stenting in the properly properly indicator. Indicated. Limit the metal as small as possible. Yeah, as so, Denton Cooley said, replacing valve with another valve is replacing one disease with another. I uh, think we should be framing that dis- yes, replacing yes, a plug yes, stable yes. with an uh, unstable yeah. plug by a stent is also a dangerous thing. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. should yeah. all be knowing when not to stent before yeah. we know what to stent. Yeah. Okay. Thank very you. well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very much. Much. Okay. Thank you very much, all uh, both the speakers and the chairpersons. We move to our next session. Thank you, uh, moderators. Our next session, the moderators are Dr. Ravi Shravel, Dr. Janish Shroff, Dr. Suyash Tate. Chairpersons are Dr. Pintu Nata, Dr. Neeraj Yadav, and Dr. Bhavesh Roy. I would request uh, chairpersons to introduce both our speakers and then also discuss, uh, present the case, and then ask the speakers to go ahead uh, with their presentation. Over to chairperson. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is an uh, amazing conference going on, and uh, we have an uh, excellent uh, debate coming up uh, by Dr. Samir Rane and Dr. Dinesh. So, let me uh, cut short the time and uh, start with an introduction. Dr. Samir Rane uh, is MBBS and uh, consultant cardiologist who has done EP fellowship. Uh, and worked as assistant professor at UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology in Ahmedabad. And Dr. Jignesh Patel is also uh, MD medicine from VS and DM cardiology. Uh, he has done from Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center. He is currently associated with Saal Hospital, Shelby Hospital. And his special interest is in uh, pacing and uh, device implantation, ICD, as well as cardiac resynchronization therapy. So let me first introduce the case that we are uh, going to debate. So this case is a 60-year-old male with uh, class 2 shortness of breath showing LHB with right bundle branch block and QRS duration of 120 milliseconds with PR interval of 240 milliseconds. His 14 days loop recorder has shown PVC burden of 4.5%. And there is history of cardiac syncope twice over last two years. She has history of uh, old entroceptal MI with recanalized coronaries in a recent coronary angiography. Uh, this is proven by cardiac MRI, also showing small apical scar with ejection fraction of 42%. Apart from the medical optimization, what this patient should uh, be offered? So, Dr. Samir Rane will talk in favor of uh, ICD implantation as a more suitable initial uh, and preferred device therapy. And Dr. Jignesh Patel will talk in favor of dual chamber pacemaker uh, as a treating modality for this patient. Over to you, Dr. Samir Rane. Thank you, sir. I am... Yeah, am I audible and is the screen visible? Okay, so. You can start your presentation. Yeah, sure. So at the onset, uh, thank you, Kamal, sir, for giving me this opportunity, the opportunity to talk on this platform. And uh, congratulations to Team Cardiocon for organizing these uh, fantastic learning sessions. Uh, 
A warm uh, good afternoon to Dr. Jignesh Patel, my colleagues, and also to today's chairpersons and moderators. I'll be representing the blue corner in uh, today's discussion. So this is the case which uh, Neeraj sir has already pointed out, and uh, our this the ECG of this patient shows a conduction system disorder, probably due to a scar formation, maybe degenerative. But uh, we may consider that it, it may be because of a scar, which may also be progressive. Prior ECGs would have been helpful to compare. Then, uh, based on the information from loop recorders, there is no evidence of paroxysmal AV block or sinus node dysfunction. It shows an insignificant number of PVCs. Desirable information about the PVCs would have been uh, the site of origin, monomorphic or polymorphic. Also, if these uh, if these PVCs were R on D PVCs, which if present maybe would have been related to the history of cardiac syncope in this patient. Then episodes of cardiac syncope can be both due to tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. The loop recorder suggests that maybe bradycardia is probably not the mechanism for syncope in this patient. Then uh, most of the diagnosis of an antro old anterosuctal MI is made on the ECG findings of a QS pattern in the precordial leads of V1 and V2. Uh, Mac Alpine suggested that despite much information in the literature indicating that uh, this is an unlikely pattern for pure septal infarction, such ECG diagnosis is frequently given. There was evidence of LV dysfunction and this patient underwent a, ca underwent a cat, uh, which showed uh, recanalized coronaries. Then his uh, uh, cardiac MRI showed a small apical scar with LVF of 42%. Well, based on the information provided by the cardiac examination, I feel that there is a disproportionate LV dysfunction uh, when compared to the scar size. More information would be desirable on the characteristics of the scar, such as the pattern of uh, left gadolinium, uh, uh, late gadolinium uptake, like whether it's subepicardial, subendocardial, or intramyocardial in uh, location. Ischemic uh, scars tend to be subendocardial to begin with, whereas myocarditis can be subepicardial, intramyocardial, and can also have uh, mixed patterns. T1A weighted images are gaining importance for tissue characterization, also regional wall motion abnormality. The uh, extent and architecture of fibrosis of a scar, even in the absence of um, contractile dysfunction, leads to electrophysiologic uh, dearrangements that increase propensity for ventricular arrhythmias and uh, sudden cardiac death due to uh, scar-related re-entry causing ventricular tachycardias. And the uh, role of uh, cardiac MRI is uh, basically risk stratification in sudden cardiac death uh, remains impeded by one-size-fits-all approach with over-reliance on traditional factors like uh, reduced LV uh, EF alone. And then this approach uh, fails to identify majority of individuals around 80% who suffer from sudden cardiac death events. And a treatment pers a personalization of treatment and identification of the pathophysiological mechanisms for sudden cardiac death can help to identify these subset of individuals. Cardiac MRI is beneficial uh, to address these limitations, but uh, widespread implementation, then the lack of consensus regarding quantitative infarct uh, and tissue heterogeneity standards as well as uh, definite outcome studies are lacking. Uh, a prospective randomized control trial is based purely on uh, cardiac MRI guided decision making uh, for primary prevention ICDs uh, with, and including LV EF values of, uh, across a wide range will help uh, address all these issues. And uh, the role of uh, electrophysiological study in this patient is important whether cause of syncope is unexplained or non-invasive -in evaluation has uh, not uh, put much, given us much uh, information about the mechanism. There are class 1 and class 2A recommendations basically to assess the inducibility of VT, evaluate the episode of syncope with ar uh, ventricular arrhythmias as the suspected cause. Uh, you can guide catheter ablation if required and to assess the risk of progression to a complete AV block. Then in uh, patients with syncope and the presence of bundle branch block and reduced LVF, VT ventricular tachycardia may be induced during electrophysiological studies in up to 42% of cases. Using standard evaluation, electrophysiological studies and in implantable loop recorders, Moya et al. had shown at among 303 patients with bundle branch block and syncope, the episode of syncope can be due to VT and uh, bradyarrhythmias. 
so we have not ruled out the presence of infiltrative disorders like exam uh, like for example sarcoidosis whose uh, cardiac mri patterns can mimic those of myocardial ischemia uh, further investigations can be done like fdg pet scan or ct scan of thorax and the further characterization of the apical scar can suggest its role as a potential substrate for reentry uh, vt episodes and also the nature of the disease both eps and cardiac imaging can help select the appropriate therapy and catheter ablation aicd or both can then be offered then a, a detailed discussion with the patient and his uh, relatives is required prior to therapy and uh, recently dr neeraj had also posted this quote on the ihrs group in reference to one of his patient and also to stress upon the imp- importance of cpr training in the family the only difference between syncope and sudden death is that in one you wake up so thank you so uh, dr jignesh uh, uh, we can start your uh, talk and then uh, start a discussion on this so shall i start am i audible yes you are audible visible go ahead yes yeah. please go uh, good afternoon everyone so we already know the case history that has been already covered by our friend dr samira ane so he'll be choosing a acd in this particular patient considering the old mi and according to me the pacemaker is sufficient to treat this patient rather than over treating this patient with the acd why if you look at the case analysis here we have a case having a patient 60 year male having a bifascicular block with the first degree av block that is symptomatic because patient had a history of the syncope twice over last 2 years and other uh, characteristic which has been given are the very small of the scar on the cardiac mr and ejection fraction of just 42% and non significant findings in the loop record that has been put for the 14 days so uh, we'll not go in the details of the cardiac cause of the syncope that was already covered uh, in our case the detail history of the syncope is not given for example whether it's associated with the palpitation whether uh, syncope occurred during the excursion was there any relation with the position any uh, and other easy characteristics like rnt phenomena and all that so that will further help in guiding the treatment proper so here the further evaluation is definitely necessary either in form of the ep study as well as the ilr as the ep study is not specific because uh, the definitely a positive finding on the ep study will uh, help in guiding the treatment if there is a prolongation of the hv interval then it will definitely or there is a demonstration of the second or third degree av block definitely it will help to choose uh, towards the pacemaker and if there is a induction of the ventricular tachycardia then will we go towards the as displacement but the negative ep study does not rule out the possibility of the av block or tachyarrhythmia as a reason for the syncope so uh, second thing is a implantable loop recorder definitely it is costlier and but it will give a better insight in the cause of the syncope but it is even costlier than putting a pacemaker sometime so in our indian population it is very difficult to put a ilr in each and every patients now if we come to the data as uh if the patient having a bifascicular block in the baseline ecg and having a syncope if we look at the etiology in such patients around 40% uh, reason in in such patient is uh, neurally mediated in around 45% of the patients the cardiac etiology is found so uh, they studied the 55 patient prospectively out of the 55 25 25 uh, patient has a cardiac syncope and out of this 25 AV block was present, and it was the reason for the syncope in almost twenty twenty uh, percent, twenty out of twenty five patients, and VT was present in one out of twenty five patients. So that is the obvious reason. Whenever we have a baseline ECG showing a bifascicular block with a prolonged PR interval, the reason for the syncope in such patient is most likely a AV block, and that is a conduction disturbance rather than a tachycardia. so uh, another prospective study and another uh, <coughs> prospective uh, various data has shown that uh, most of the bifascicular block will have a progression to the higher degree av block over the period of time so that will be also defined by the hv interval in the ep study if the hv interval is more than 70 milliseconds 
there are 12 percent chances uh, 12 percent more chance to the progression to the heavy block similarly if the hv interval is more than 100 millisecond uh, at the risk of the progression to the heavy block doubles so we can say that in our patient at least in this particular patient having a baseline ecg showing a rbbb plus lab with the prolonged pr interval uh, most likely reason for the sync up in our patient is heavy block and as uh, the tachyarrhythmia or the ventricular tachycardia is very less likely or the remote possibility we can say because here we can see that the ejection fraction of just 42 percent that is a mild LV dysfunction with the very small apical scar as well as there is no any significant arrhythmias noted on the loop recorder the chances of uh, having a tachyarrhythmias and giving a sync up in this patient is very very less so uh, we'll come to the various data which will support that why we should choose a pacemaker in this particular patient if we look at this prospective study, uh, they randomized around 27 patients having a biphysical block with the unexplained syncope, and they were offered a UVI pacemaker with the bradycardia detection ability. And they were follow up for up to 60 months. And uh, what they found out of these 27 patients, 14 patients, that is almost half of the patient had a progression to the higher degree AV block. That means that uh, most of the patient uh, having a baseline biphysical block with the syncope over the period of the time, they needed a pacemaker over a period of time in the lifetime. So uh, there is another study which compared the permanent pacemaker implantation versus the EP study in patient having a biphysical block in the sync up. And what they found that uh, this is a prospective core study and they randomized the 77 patients out, out of the 77 patients, 36 patients were uh, given an empirical pacemaker therapy and rest of the patients were offered a decision based on the EP study, whether to put a pacemaker or whether to put a AICD or not to just treat and wait and watch. And what they found in the result, in the pacemaker group, there were less chances of the sync up and the, when the decision was taken after the EP study, there were more incidents of the sync up at the end of the follow-up period. So we can say that whenever we are putting a pacemaker in patient having a biphysicular block and the sync up, uh, we are definitely giving them a sync up free survival over the period of time. And similarly, if we compare uh, this study, that is a, a prospective study, around 56 patient uh, underwent the pacemaker and 59 patient underwent the ILR implantation. And what they found at the end of the follow-up, the in the pacemaker group, the sync up free survival was more as compared to the ILR group. And on top of that, uh, of those who were offered ILR, around 60% of the patient had to cross over to pacemaker because of sync up and because of the progress into the AV block and because of the uh, <coughs> finding of the high degree conduction disturbances during the ILR monitoring. So if you coming, if you come to the guidelines for the indication of the pacing in patient with the bundle branch block and the sync up, here we can see that uh, whenever there is a bundle branch block with the sync up with the abnormal EP study, definitely when the HV interval is more than 70 milliseconds or there is a demonstration of the second or the third degree AV block, then it's a class one indication. As well as when there is an alternative bundle branch block, it's a class one indication. Our case falls into this. It becomes a class two B indication because uh, whenever there is a bundle branch block, there is an unexplained syncope and the non-diagnostic investigation. Uh, we have not uh, given a data of EP study or ILR. But uh, here we can say, even if we consider that EP study is not di non-diagnostic in the, our particular case, our case will be a class 2B recommendation for putting a permanent pacemaker here. And another important thing is, if we look at uh, the uh, indication and the guidelines for putting an ILR, it's a class 2A recommendation in such patients because uh, the ILR is a costlier thing. It will be better to put a pacemaker rather than going for ILR in such patients if the patient is not affording. Because anyway, the putting a permanent pacemaker, it will also give a, a bradycardia event monitoring over the period of time. And second thing, uh, the EP study. EP study itself is a class 2B recommendation because the, the findings of the EP study in this particular patient will not be that will be uh, it will it will not be that informative because the negative study will not rule out the uh, cause of the syncope, whether it's a heavy block or not. And I will leave this part to the EP specialist on after my topic discussion. Now coming to the why not to put a AICD. Uh, if you look at the guidelines, it clearly says that because in patient with the bundle branch block and the unexplained syncope, the AIC will be recommended when the ejection fraction is severe. Uh, LV dysfunction is severe. Ejection fraction less than 35%. Then only it is recommended because 
the ventricular tachyarrhythmia causing a syncope the uh, incidence is only when it is a significant lv dysfunction in patient with a mild lv dysfunction with the small opisical scar such patients are very less likely to get a tachyarrhythmias in their lifetime so the acid is not warranted in such patients so here in our case ejection fraction is less than 35 so we have to take a decision after uh, doing ap study or ilr whether to put a pacemaker or not so coming to the another thing that is a guidelines for the acid implantation as i already discussed it clearly says that uh, primary as a primary prevention in patient with ischemic heart disease acid implantation is a class 1 recommendation but when when it is less than 30 ejection fraction is less than 35% not when the patient is having a mild lv dysfunction and the small apical scar so in a patient in our patient having a bifascicular block with a prolonged pr with symptoms it becomes it become a indication for the permanent pacemaker implantation with a mild lv dysfunction small apical scar with epc burden of 4.5% there is no need of icd and no need to over treat such patients it is a uh, putting a icd in this patient will be something like uh, uh, telling a fan in the cricket stadium to wear a helmet just to uh, prevent a head injury while uh, while watching a test cricket so i'll not put a acid in this particular patient but the permanent pacemaker will be a sufficient enough and uh, you, even you can give a argument that the acid will protect from both it will protect from the syncope as well as it can even uh, give a shock during the ventricular tachycardia in the future but is it really needed but i think it's not required and there is no need to over treat such patients so we can go away with just putting a permanent pacemaker so to conclude the evaluation of the patient thoroughly before choosing a device device is really very necessary in our patient permanent pacemaker implantation is more sensible and it is sufficient enough because the conduction disturbances av block is a most likely reason in our patient considering the fact that patient is having a bifascicular block with the first degree av block and second thing the ep study findings are non specific even a negative ep will not rule out the av block as a cause of the syncope and similarly uh, putting a ilr ilr will be a cost there affair even it is expensive than the pacemaker itself when it is kept for the longer period of time so even a significant number of the ilr patient will need a ppm approximately 60% of the patient so the vt is not a obvious reason here and spreading the mild lv dysfunction in the small apical scar there is no need to treat the overtreat this patient and we can go away with putting just a dual chamber pacemaker thank you thank you uh, thank you samir and uh, jignesh both of you have put your points really well forward uh, i think uh, i would uh, like dr ravish and dr janish to come and uh, give their comments uh, good afternoon everybody uh, very good discussion uh, on the versus acd versus ddr i would like to put out my points in very simple way first evidence evidence is that av block is the most common cause of syncope in such patients second guideline again the guidelines will suggest only a ddr in such a patient with low scar volume and all those things so and only syncope no documented vt and with ep study becoming un- inconclusive third but what is important is the clinical details of the patient the devil lies in the details what details it's a young patient having a so called trifascicular block it is nearly very you have chhb in young patient that is completely different degenerate or uh, congenital chhb patient having a trifascicular block in a young patient is not very commonly heard of it will be an elderly post ihd patient having multiple attacks having lot amount of scar in the myocardium so unlikely this scar which is there on the apex is related to the disease which is there in the conduction system not directly in that that's not like from the ischemic only ischemic damage what they sold only 42% here you will not get a trifascicular block like situation so what i am trying to tell that a scarring and the degenerative disease might not be only the ischemic heart disease we are not knowing what infiltrative thing is going on inside we don't know have not other studies definitely which is affecting the degenerative system as 
uh, the sorry the conduction system as well as causing an apical sparring it may be a sarcoid also we don't know i am not confirmed saying that but it may be two separate places for the same infiltrative disease and we may only by putting a this icd the dvd chair pacemaker because we don't know in such a patient clinical history is such worry such difficult in this patient young patient with trifascicular block and an apical scar you don't have seen any other evidence of ihd recanalized artery we cannot confirm it is ihd also so maybe the scarring is also due to the infiltrative disease maybe the conduction tissue disease is also due to implemented infiltrative disease and we may not get time for a third vt or whatever we the infiltrative disease is causing and the dddr may not be in such a young patient so when young that is important if it were to be 70 they the different thing altogether the clinical characteristic the ecg finding they don't match up in a young patient to only in post ischemic heart disease patient and so uh, even if the ef is uh, on the higher side i would give a dddr basis of the evidence on the basis of even the uh, guidelines but because in this specific patient there is the problem of chance of having a any the other infiltrative disease which is causing damage to both and hence i would in such a case rather go with the icd than the dgd yeah that is the whole purpose so, of keeping this debate and i think uh, that's what the work up i uh, i believe was being uh, brought out by uh, dr samirani yeah dr neeraj yeah please yeah so uh, the same thing i wanted to convey uh, the dr samir had put also the same similar uh, thoughts actually see there are a lot of presumption when we are talking uh, number one presumption is cardiac syncope while evaluating a syncope any syncope patient because cardiac syncope is one that you prove after establishing the cause of syncope uh, from the history you it is it is really not possible to stamp that this is the cardiac reason for syncope or and dr jig in one of the jignes slide if you have seen uh, 40% of fascicular blocks had a neural mediated syncope right so uh, history is very important to uh, first of all second point in this patient a bifascicular block uh, and whenever you hear of recanalized coronary with old antivol mi just to explain the ecg abnormality and lv dysfunction that is found on echo you have to become more alert because recanalized lad is one of the you know diagnosis that we have picked more and more uh, etiologies of different all sort of cardiomyopathies so uh, bifascicular block is a conduction system disease with pr prolongation uh, but there is an evidence of scar there is an uh, lv dysfunction and uh, in this patient i agree with uh, uh, you know that sometimes it is difficult to establish the diagnosis but i would definitely still subject him uh, for another imaging testing like uh, pet scan for inflammatory workup also i would like to subject this patient to undergo an ep study ep study will serve two purposes uh, monomorphic vt induction as well as assessment of the conduction system i agree that majority of this cases turn out to be negative ep study in many of the times and then probably the next step uh, ahead is uh, ILR or uh, long term uh, monitoring which is definitely ILR would be the best solution for that uh, unless there is some evidence that there is a scar which is not likely of ischemic heart disease there is an inflammatory process going on in pet scan uh, i would not implant i would not uh, go ahead with the decision of any device so first of all uh, Uh, establish the etiology symptom and uh, ecg correlation is must in such patients if there is imaging evidence of something very serious like uh, infl- infiltrative or inflammatory cardiomyopathy subject them to dual chamber icu dr janish and uh, dr suyash your comments yes, sir uh, uh, 
first of all thank you for inviting on this uh, uh, wonderful uh, platform uh, sir uh, the picture here is really not clear like patient uh, it could not be established that the patient uh, uh, really had bradycardia induced syncope or vt induced syncope uh, as neeraj sir told i think the dual chamber icd would so uh, the uh, the desired purpose of pacing as well as uh, you know uh, icd so i think a patient can be subjected to uh, dual chamber icd but definitely sir uh, ep would give uh, some answer so first of all one ep uh, study should be done uh, if vt can be induced then definitely a uh, uh, little uh, we can put icd with little bit more surety i think so oh. Yeah, so let us uh, let us uh, understand that EP study in this case would be like a rapid test for COVID. So if it is positive, you have you it is easy to make decision. But if it is negative, you still have to you know uh, yes. uh, try to establish the syncope as well as some arrhythmic uh, connection. So yeah. yes, the ultimate answer will be dual chamber ICD. Uh, yes, so yes, after. Uh, yeah. Fully, fully agreed with the discussion, sir. But uh, I would like to say ICD is a weapon that we have. But uh, when to use it uh, needs proper evaluation uh, in order to avoid unnecessarily shocks to the patients. And uh, if we, if it's totally indicated, then it's true. Here we need in this patient further evaluation, as we have discussed the morphology and other. things then only we can go further with icd otherwise dual chamber please thank you sir well sir your final comments no no final comments have to come from you neeraj you are the ep guy no this is this is more of a, this is a problem that we see very often young patients with conduction system disorder and some uh, somehow we we have tried to you know now doing more and more imaging in this case cases because we are surprised by uh, some of the you know results that we get so uh, initially yeah any bifascicular block trifascicular block syncope which looks like uh, arrhythmic syncope uh, with uh, no other we used to put pacemakers but we have burnt our hands we have seen these patients coming with uh, lv dysfunction in follow up and uh, patient have come with vt episodes also so it is always better to you know uh, invest investigate it thoroughly and take help of imaging uh, uh, in such patients yeah. thank you thank you very much thank you chairperson moderators and both the speakers i think we learned a lot uh, that uh, point was very validly brought out that a trifascicular and a young guy you're missing out on something you must work up devices are not the final uh, and you don't have to bomb a uh, mouse hole with an atom bomb to kill all the mice so uh, that brings us to the next session which is um, being moderated by dr mithilesh dr kaushik trivedi dr rushab parik chair persons will be dr atul abhyankar dr sharad devan dr kushal pujara over to chair persons to introduce both the speakers and then also give the case outline and then we can have uh, the first talk over to chair persons dr abhyankar yeah sorry uh yeah it's a pleasure to introduce uh, dr jayesh raval uh, he is uh, well known amongst gujarat and even national cardiologists he is a professor of cardiology at vagodia and interventional cardiologist at the kd hospital he was a former hod at un meta uh, obviously he is a great interventionist and uh, am i going to introduce only one at a time or Yeah. Please introduce both. Uh, also, the case. Yes, the, that's my friend, uh, Dr. Mohit Gupta. Please introduce him. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I also have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mohit Gupta, who is a professor of cardiology from G. B. Pant Hospital. Uh, he's the scientific chairman of the Delhi Intervention Council meet in seventeen. Uh, Delhi C S I secretary, executive editor of uh, Indian Heart Journal, C S I Innovation Awardee for twenty twenty one. Uh, awarded excellence in cardiology in 
Young Scientist Award in 18 by Vice President of India, has huge number of publications, more than 150, and he is a well-known speaker in various forums. Uh, so, uh, so we will uh, be discussing about uh, this case. Uh, is any other chairperson going to do this, or am I continuing? As you please. please. Yeah. Okay. Let the other chairperson have a chance to do part of the job. Sharad bhai. Yes. One moment, please. See, this is a young patient, and uh, we commonly see this dilemma in our practice. Is a forty-six-year-old male presenting with non-ST elevation marker infarction with a trop troponin I of two thirty-two nanogram per cent with BP of 110 and 60 millimeter of mercury with history of hypertension and diabetes. He's preloaded with uh, ticagloral and aspirin. His heart rate is 60. ECD is showing deep T inversion, one AVL V5, V6. On angiogram, it reveals critical 18 millimeter lesion with 95% stenosis in 2.25 millimeter long first diagonal artery. The preferred revascular, uh, revascularization strategy would be that uh, Dr. Jay Shawal and Mohit Gupta will discuss with us. Please go ahead, Jay. Please unmute, unmute your mic, Jay. Am I audible now? Yes. Uh, respected chairpersons and colleagues, I'm going to uh, talk about something which is uh, recently used in the uh, market, drug coated balloon or drug eluting balloons. And uh, so far as uh, I'm, I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, We are, we are dealing with a small vessel coronary artery disease and here the question is whether to go for drug eluting balloon or a small uh, stand placement. And a uh, very important aspect is that whether uh, drug eluting balloons will stand the uh, taste of the time in the long run. Uh, now we have probably uh, longer data. I'll narrate in a uh, few minutes. In 2001, we started with having one uh, stand placement uh, data and then later on, uh, we had the first data of 2006 where uh, drug coated balloons were introduced into the uh, therapeutic armamentarium. We have uh, problems with the stand placement, delayed healing, stand thrombosis, Sometimes benign new intimal hyperplasia will be progressing into a uh, uh, new atheroma or sometimes a late loss, malposition and so many things. So stents were posing problems uh, in uh, next few years and we started scratching our heads to go for uh, new innovations. So what are the challenges uh, we encountered in uh, different scenarios in uh, coronary stent placement and very important Thing came to our mind was small vessel disease. Small vessel disease is defined as less than 2.8 millimeter and uh, very small vessel disease are between 2 to 2.25 millimeter. Nowadays, 2.25 millimeter stents are very easily available. And uh, as of uh, Southeast Asian countries are there, 40 to 50 percent of coronary lesions are in small vessel disease. And uh, 30 to 50 percent of our coronary interventions are being done in a small coronary arteries. Female, old age, diabetes, peripheral uh, artery disease, all these things are uh, predisposing factor for our uh, pain in the neck, you know. And so uh, recurrence is also very, very peculiarly high in uh, small vessel disease. Uh, whatever type of stent you use, uh, older generation or a newer generation stents. And the use of drug eluting stents in a small vessel disease was associated with very high risk of maize and stent thrombosis. This is very peculiar even in diabetes. I'll come to the data later on. So 
overall picture is that we lend up with three to five percent of the instant risk analysis and uh, that small vessel disease has remained a very peculiar problem in our uh, day-to-day work. Similarly, bifurcation lesions. Whenever you encounter a bifurcation uh, stenosis, side branch involved are very important and side branch risk stenosis rate, uh, recurrence rate are very high as compared to the main branch. We have identified that side branch uh, stenosis are to the tunes of 37 percentage in uh, bare, as compared to bare metal stent implantation. So we need to go for a uh, very nice objective and that data started some powering in from 2005 to 2006 and initial uh, evaluation of drug eluting balloons were tried in uh, instant resinosis and uh, later on uh, denoval lesions were also being tried. Uh, since 2010, we have a number of trials. In 2012, we got Bello. In 2018, we got uh, Basket Small. In 2018, again, we got Restore SVD China. And all, almost all uh, these data, apart from uh, initial 2006 and 2010 uh, data, all other data have shown more or less the same uh, MACE rate over a period of one year or three year duration. So initially, uh, look at the initial data where the trial was abandoned because of uh, poor uh, response to drug eluting balloon. But then came the Bellow trial in 2012, where 182 patients were being evaluated. Really, really small vessels uh, were uh, evaluated by paclitic eluting stents as well as drug eluting balloon. And you can see the data. The data outcome clearly says that MACE is less with a drug eluting balloon in small vessel. Target vessel uh, revascularization was also less and target vessel uh, failure rate is also less. So more or less uh, encouraging data started powering in, in 2012. This slide is very peculiar from Bellow study that uh, there is a quiescent phase of coronary artery disease after the initial 200 or 250 days of uh, intervention and that continues for three years. So somewhere from 250 days to 1000 days, more or less the quiescent phase of coronary artery disease is there in that uh, era, you have a very clear cut advantage of drug coated balloon. So uh, drug coated balloon fares well over a period of three years time. Different different types of drug coated balloons are available from different manufacturers. Sometimes they have different concentration of uh, cytotoxic drugs. They have different salt as a medium. They have different particle size. So no single uh, drug coated balloon is similar to the other one. Uh, we uh, got the first very nice data from uh, Restore China. It was uh, probably the uh, best uh, uh, trial we can have. Somewhere around 230 uh, patients were randomized and nine month angiographic follow-up was available. One year clinical follow-up was available. And this is the baseline characteristics, almost identical to the all groups. And look at the target lesion failure rate and p-value. P-value is non-significant. That means that target lesion failure was more or less equal with the drug-coated balloon as well as our latest generation stent placement. <clears throat> In nutshell, uh, though numerically this looks larger that uh, the drug-coated balloon was faring bad, but look at the uh, p-values and the p-values are really non-significant. So the data is equivalent data uh, favoring coated balloon, non-inferior to uh, drug eluting stents. Restore SVD data was available in October 2019 and it, it was very clear non-inferior trial uh, where the latest uh, uh, drug uh, Drug eluting balloon was a drug eluting stent was used. Data was available angiographic at nine months and clinical follow up up to two years. Similarly, side branch involvement was also evaluated in different trials. Now we come to the another uh, trial from uh, 
Switzerland University of Basel. And this basket small trial was all comer trial. Every patient coming will be randomized. Follow up was up to 12 months. It is the largest randomized clinical trial with a drug eluting balloon, 758 patients. And they were first treated with simple balloon. And after uh, pre dilatation, they were randomized either to get DES or DCB. And what are the results? Majority of patients were randomized after the pre dilatation. So there was a bias and one can claim that there was a bias to uh, receive drug coated balloon. But nevertheless, probability of or definite thrombosis was practically nil in drug coated balloon. That means that drug coated balloon uh, has a less uh, immediate risk. The rates of major bleeding are also numerically less. While less because uh, we give well antiplatelet agents for <coughs> one month and then we stop it. So, what are the uh, messages from basket small trial? Uh, there is no permanent implant inside. The results are more or less same as drug eluting stands. Uh, there is an advanced solution for high bleeding risk upper GI bleed, lower GI bleed, cancers, and there is a promising result where uh, promising results with uh, less number of stent being deployed. Three-year follow-up non-inferiority data is available. You can uh, avoid uh, unnecessary stent. DAPT is only for one month. And very important aspect is that late lumen enlargement. When you uh, implant a stent, there is a late lumen loss. Here, because we have released the drug into the tunica intima and tunica media, uh, the tunica media gets a remodeling, and this remodeling is so favorable that you end up in a larger lumen diameter over a longer period of time. This hypothesis has been confirmed in IVA studies also. So, basket small uh, two study from University of Basel, uh, three years follow up. Look at the data. Drug-coated balloon and drug eluting stands, both of them are running parallel up to 36 months. That means that major adverse cardiac events are more or less same. So it's non-inferior. Uh, putting a, a drug-coated balloon is non-inferior. So I would definitely go for non-inferior uh, results of this coated balloon. And look at the different varieties. The latest good quality balloon is Zion's good quality stent is Zion stent. And with the Zion stent, a parallel line comes and that is drug coated balloon. That means we have a very similar data for even the latest uh, generation balloon so, uh, stents also. And that has been maintained that good uh, results are maintained up to three years of time. I don't go into details of these things because I have to go through uh, various uh, recommendations and guidelines, consensus guidelines are gradually coming up for small vessels and bifurcation also. Uh, a word about drug coated balloon uh, consensus group and there are problems with the dosage schedule of different balloons, formulations with different salts, release kinetics are different. So balloons are not equal to each other. Pre-dilatation is always necessary and then you can randomize to uh, receiving these things. Diffuse long lesions where you cannot have stent more than 48 millimeter size, then you can definitely place a drug coated balloon and give a good result. Different trials I have already narrated. Small vessel disease is very peculiar in diabetes. We, we know right from 1998 that whenever we have a small vessel, we have a higher racinosis rate. Uh, late lumen loss of 45% will be very detrimental in a small vessel. Diabetic patients have smaller arteries that we know. Diabetic patients have mace, very major cardiovascular events, very frequently higher. So we are interested in looking at the results of diabetes and drug coated balloon and need for target vessel revascularization was significantly less. Look at this uh, bar graph, very clearly say that this is non-diabetic patients, but this is diabetic patients. And diabetic patients over a period of three years are equal. 
And when you see the target vessel revascularization rate, it is really less. That means that we are uh, really justified in using drip coated balloon. Non inferior study in diabetic patients, use of DCB in small coronary artery vessels is superior to DES. That is what has been a conclusion in the uh, Journal of uh, American College of Cardiology uh, Interventions 2021. The latest data. I have already narrated about class effect for all DCBs cannot be assumed. This is a, a graphic depiction of uh, uh, granules of uh, salt and drug. So in that cell, I have enough data to use a drug coated balloon. I have few slides for rebuttal, but that after Dr. Mohit Gupta uh, puts his uh, view forward. Dr. Mohit Om Shanti. Hello, Dr. Mohit. Yeah, can I start my presentation? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So my topic is small vessel coronary artery disease. The case in question is this. Long diurnal disease in a 46-year-old male, diabetic, hypertensive, and a case of non st elevation. So you have faced a real big challenge for me, my dear friends. This is the small vessel disease in form of a sumo wrestler. And this is myself, a drug eluting stent. I'm really laughing whether I'll be able to defeat this giant or not. Let us see who survives the test of the time. No doubt, small vessel disease, we all know less than 2.8 or less than 2.75 or less than 3, whatever definition you use, it's fine. And very small vessel disease is 2 to 2.25. Approximately 30 to 40, 50% of the coronary interventions are in today's small vessel disease. Which substrates, as Sir has very nicely highlighted, long lesions, diabetes, hypertension, old age, women, and peripheral arterial disease. These are the substrates, and our patient already has a diabetic, and he is a hypertensive. Why it is a challenge? We all know because of frequent diffuse nature, higher restenosis, as Sir highlighted, more chances of dissection and perforation, and obviously thrombosis. You know, you put a small stand high gain and the patient is going to have a thrombosis, which is really serious complication. What are the modalities? We know it could be a best medical therapy, a plain organ building angioplasty, BMS, DES, or a DCB or DES. The question that I have been given is to answer DES versus drug coating balloon. The management spectrum, as you just saw, I am not going to repeat that. Functional assessment is very important for small vessel disease because almost 30% of the small vessel stenosis are only are hemodynamically significant, which are actually angiographically significant, deemed to be angiographically significant. So, small, strongly recommended is to do a functional assessment of these lesions. So, the first thing that comes is POBA. POBA is a viable option, probably technically impossible in many of the cases, can increase a risk of a vessel rupture, not going to discuss much. BMS versus POBA, BMS is definitely better. The meta-analysis in European Heart Journal shows in almost more than 4,000 patients, it de decreases the incidence of repeat revascularization. Let us come to the deaths straightforward, like to the Mundeki bar. The first generation deaths have significant lower TLR. So there is no doubt that in certain cases, most of the cases, as compared to BMS, Sarolimus eluting stents in various trials are far better. Look at the TLR, which goes significantly, significantly lower, significantly lower, but definitely at a cost of increasing stent thrombosis. SR Smart, as again highlighted by Sir, Cyber versus Texas, first generation DES, you see, Sarolimus is performing better as compared to the Peclitexel. Now, look at this. Most of the trials of DCB have been carried out using only Peclitexel eluting stent. So that means the comparator arm showing the equal efficacy or the superiority has been only with Paclitexel and very few cases, which I'll be highlighting, have shown uh, efficacy comparable to the salinimus eluting state. So what is the verdict in first case? First generation deaths are better than the BMS and CES is better than Paclitexel eluting stents in small vessel disease. Whether the diabetes or not, it doesn't matter. What is the problem with first generation? Sustained drug disease, higher inflammation, 
paradoxical vasoconstriction is very very serious and definitely higher risk of stent thrombosis as my senior colleague dr raval very nicely highlighted now come to the second generation this basket small study as again it was studied well uh, highlighted well first generation pairs versus second generation zotralimus luting stents 191 patients the tvr was significantly low so second generation stents right from beginning have started showing a better result as compared to the first generation paclitaxel luting stents but this is only comparison between this where does gcb come in let me come to that thin struts versus thick struts thin struts are definitely better what predicts restenosis in a second generation des it's a longer lesion length our patient has a longer lesion length that's against going a des has a larger strut thickness that depends on us which strength we are choosing and minimal stent lumen diameter so overall but the second generation des are associated with good outcomes and a lower risk of instant restenosis the various uh, dacotic balloons are available not going into the details because this is out of the question but we must be aware the commonly available drug eluting balloons and why paclitaxel has been used because of its high lipophilicity that is why this molecule is used repeating the same slide which is very pertinent and important for me is the trials comparing des versus tep now let us go to each trial and see what are the results the first one is the picoletto trial picoletto trial was the first randomized control trial to control dc to compare dcb versus des in less than 2.75 stop prematurely why because des was superior if i am to say des was superior that means i won the case i was superior to my colleague but there were limitations in that what were the limitations first generation balloons tissue delivery were low and very poor lesion preparation which is very important for a drug coating so giving a neutral input these were the major limitations and that is what led to the underperformance of the drug coated balloons as compared to des look at this amaze it's much lower in the des as compared with dcb then came the bello trial bello again it used a mean diameter of 12.15 very small vessel is a falcon balloon versus a texas des the results were almost comparable now see the comparative arm is only paclitaxel luting stent in one with paclitaxel luting stands the paclitaxel luting balloon is showing comparable result comparable is not superior but comparable result. that means a possibility that if it would have been compared with the silent muscle luting stands the result would have been superior with the drug luting stand but that this trial concluded that they have similar trends of outcome of mace as compared to the other one the basket small study the basket small study was a small coronary arteries where both these stands were used even the paclitaxel as there is the sarolimus luting stent both were used but a very small number so the results of this particular study again showed similar death mi and tvr in drug coated balloon group and the drug eluting stent group 7.6 versus 7.5 so again the results were comparable and dcb was non inferior then came the restore as sir again highlighted restore was paclitaxel coating balloon versus resolute test 2.25 to 2.75 and at one year they had comparable incidence of target lesion failure so it was non inferior look at this evrolimus promas all the zotra all the molecules were used and the results were comparable but not a very high number look at 114 is not a big number to generate a great data so what were the problems with all these analysis balloon pre dilatation is essential for dcb the major role only 25% in picoletto and 96 in bello underwent it after successful balloon pre dilatation dcb indicated not inferior to new generation des on cardiac death mi and tvr so that is the verdict so if you prepare a good uh, bed then probably the comparison or the performance of both is relatively okay scar registry talked much in favor of the drug eluting stand talked about the real world registry almost 14000 patients they said that this is significantly better as compared to drug coating balloon as far as the mi death and all other outcomes resources are concerned but there are major limitations of this registry no report on coronary segment no angiographic follow up no lesion data on pre dilatation the rate of tlr and tvr in setting of small vessel disease is not detectable so this is a major limitation so using this data to win this particular battle is probably inappropriate from my side what are the drawbacks of drug coating balloon they are good but they come with a price with the limitation elastic recoil and dissections 
that is vela to we may require bail out 7 to 8% of all the studies are showing that they required a bail out syndrome due to effects of shortened balloon inflation time it is question whether the sufficient drug is delivered or not do this is dealt by the second generation drug coated balloons in a significant way so what is my verdict on this particular trials and my trials dcb may perform at least as good as des but remember the competitor arms unfortunately included majorly paclitaxel looping stents and that is why the results of both the groups have shown a comparative out let me tell you two or three meta analysis and the retrospective studies the sinaga et al study showed no difference in mace and tlr as compared to dcb and the second generation test again one of the meta uh, studies by sim et al second generation 2 mm only the drug coated balloon versus des they had similar tlr and death and this is the major meta analysis published in 2018 that outcomes of seven trials seven trials more than almost 2000 patients Use of DCB in seeing a small vessel disease is comparable outcome when compared with this as compared to the balloon injuries. So this is very important. Look at this: the TLR, the maze, and the binary resonances all are comparable both with DCB and this in this meta-analysis. But meta-analysis, you know, have their own limitations. Then the last meta-analysis that came in 2019 was by Lee et al., which again showed. new trials all these trials were included three non randomized and three randomized that drug coated balloon strategy is again non inferior delivering a good outcome in non fatal mi and can be recommended as a optimal treatment strategy guidelines still are reluctant to include this but they are there to stay so what is my verdict my verdict is a balanced verdict very clearly so my case or if you say a patient has a vessel which is less than 2 i would definitely choose a pobi probably if i need i will go for a drug eluting balloon in this particular case if the patient has a dissection always a possibility if there are flow limited issues which are related this is always a possibility in all the spectrum everywhere this can be used but deb has a role only in less than 2 and 2.25 liters so when would i choose a deb when there is optimal flow after pre dilatation i am good with deb no dissection i am good with deb no residual stenosis i am very happy with deb timi 3 i will go for a deb and diameter 2 to 2.5 i'm happy with that but if it turns up in a dissection if there is a residual stenosis if a timi flow is compromised and if the diameter is relatively higher i would choose a des what is my verdict my verdict is this this is the giant we are dealing with remember if you ask me to defeat this alone with a des it's not possible if dr ravel also tries to defeat alone with a dcb not possible together we can win this battle that's the message we have to use both the tools judiciously because i have firmly lived in my life that all modalities should be used with clinical experience a fool with a tool is still a fool so don't be clinically focused that i only have to use this have an open mind and you'll get the best one thank you folks have a growth mindset and have a great conference thank you for this great opportunity i think it's a great discussion uh, i am dr pujar here is a dr ravel sir and dr gupta sir is a great debate very interesting subject uh, i think the wise full question from dr sharma selected this one because of young patient 46 years old and you always think uh, what is bet- better it will be more interesting if there will be third debate about the medical management aggressively in this case so we don't have, have some debate better. but i think uh, uh, what uh, we both have agree both are right in their own way so in the cath lab in conclusion they should have both in the shelf and you tried with the with the uh, dab first if there is dissection as you said uh, impaired tb flu- uh, tb flow then we should have a uh, uh, thin start dab should be ready on the shelf and i think the informed consent to the patient and family is very important here because young patient you are putting metal or you don't want to metal dab has chance of resonances and all the trials are up to one or three years data so i think we should have still think for the patient's choice and then uh, get the verbal consent informed consent of the patient and decide both should be all all over the shelf great discussion thank you thank you thank you so much for this opportunity thank you so much. i have some rebuttal hello yeah please go ahead uh, kamal i have some rebuttal and uh, that yeah please go ahead please uh, go ahead jayesh bhai i'll share i'll share my i'll share my screen uh 
See, the thing is, Dr. Mohita's very nice last slide, which showed a which showed a, a very clear uh, flow chart. Message at all has very nicely described that flow chart, how to go about DCB in small vessel disease. But there are peculiar scenarios which I have narrated, and I'll just uh, go through that. There is one situation where you have a lesion in mid to distal LAD, where most of the surgeons are happy to put a graft and estomosis. At that place, if you put a stand, then surgeon will be annoyed in near future or a late future time. So this is the place where I would uh, I would love to put a DCB. Similarly, if I have an RCA very tortuous leading into PD and PLV, then probably if I tackle PD and PLV, I would go with DCB. If we have a large diagonal osteostenosis and where the angle with LED is not permitting two stand strategy, then probably uh, drug coated balloon for diagonal would be a better option. Similarly, a uh, Narrow angle circumflex and uh, OM osteum, we have to go uh, with the coated balloon. Patients with high risk bleeding, I have already narrated GI bleed and all those things. There is a peculiar phenomena in Indian setup. Some of patients are present with segmental ectasia and stenosis. This graphic presentation is there. Some ectasia followed by stenosis, then ectasia followed by stenosis, tandemly located. They are probably drug eluting balloon would be very nice to do. And of course, um, if I am to tackle myocardial bridge, I would uh, love to have a uh, decoded balloon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I totally agree with this. No rebuttals. I would be happy to use DCBs in many of the cases in my. So <laughs> I'm not here to argue with, sir. I think, you know, it's important to find what is right and a balance of both is uh, very, very important. So very nicely summarized. Thank you for this opportunity, Kamal. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah Chairperson, yeah, you can continue well, the well, session well, if any well, comments. Well, 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 both have, both the uh, presenter have done the justice. And the last slide shown by Dr. Gupta, flow chart of how to tackle the small vessel problem. But you see, in our practice, we see even LED many a times not more than 2.5, not more than 2.75. There, I think uh, a drug eluting stent is a must because it is supplying a very large area of myocardium. But uh, in rebuttal, what Jayesh uh, Rawal showed the slide was perfect and both have their roles. Like, like, but I have doubt in active I see, Jayesh, how many drug eluting balloons you will use? If there is a long segment ectasia with multiple lesions, anyway, <laughs> it is it is it is the operator's uh, choice when uh, the decision has to be taken. And in our country, as patients pay from their pocket, it is always uh, the consent which matters the most. Thank you. Can yes, Atul. Can I make a quick comment there? Too? One. Uh, it, the cardiology science is always evolving and I think the definition of small vessel would need to change. That's one. Second, probably uh, at, as of now in India, if you look at the cost effectivity, the drug eluting stents cost half of drug eluting one. So in terms of cost effectivity in India, probably it is more cost effective in terms of putting a stent. The third is that now we have 50 micron, 60 micron stents. And we need to have a data before we say the equivalence. And one suggestion is that probably in India, we put maximum number of thin strut stands in small vessels. And we should generate uh, our own data because I think probably we do the, in India, do the highest number of thin strut small vessels. Thank you. Yeah, I think well summarized. I think we should... Uh... I would thank profusely all the chairpersons and speaker, uh, Dr. Abhyankar, Dr. Sharad Dewey, both the speakers, Dr. Mohit Gupta, Dr. Jayesh Ravel, uh, uh, and the moderators as well, uh, Dr. Kushal Pujara, Dr. Mithilesh Kulkarni, Kaushik Trivedi, and Dr. Rushab Pari. We move to next session. Our moderators are Dr. Rupesh Singhal, Dr. Riyaz Charania, Dr. Dennis Rozivadia, and chairpersons are Kapil Veer Pariya, Dr. Gajendra Duben, Dr. Ritesh Shah. Over to chairpersons, you can introduce the speakers the case, the images, and then we can have the talks in tandem and then do the rebuttal. Over to chairpersons. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, 
the first speaker is dr tarun madan uh, tarun sir <coughs> is uh, uh, expert in not only in coronary he is expert in peripheral as well as well as in the structural intervention uh, he did the peripheral plasties uh, in a short time then the uh, we did coronary plasty so sir is expert in the peripheral interventions uh, uh, i uh, learned a lot from uh, him when i was resident in un meta uh, he is a very good person uh, the next speaker is dr vishal gupta the vishal gupta is a, a cardiac surgeon at, at epic hospital ahmedabad uh, uh, he has a uh, uh, experience of the 20 more than 20000 surgery and uh, over a period of the 15 years uh, he is expert in total arterial bypass beating heart surgery Uh, congenital uh, heart surgery valve repair uh, redo surgeries uh, uh, over to dr tarun sir for uh, the case thank you uh, dr kapil and thank you dr kamal sharma for uh, giving an opportunity to discuss on this case can i start sharing my screen yes sir yes uh, is it visible now yes so the, given the case here i have to speak on endovascular aneurysm repair is a preferred strategy what is the case being given here is a large supra uh, renal saccular aneurysm which is ending above the superior mesenteric artery the dimensions of which are very huge 13 cm by 11 cm he is a 77 year old gentleman whose neurological examination is normal if we go by the guidelines endovascular society for vascular surgery and other important guidelines they suggest endovascular approach rather than open aortic repair for such patients and though we need to jail the celiac artery or will need to do a fenestrated endovascular repair to, see, to save the celiac artery so here is the case uh, of a saccular aneurysm so definitely he needs a intervention as early as possible risk factors for this case are old age underlying cad probably with the history has not been given he might be having some carotid artery disease also so minimal invasive intervention is the best way to go now let's see what the scoring system says if we look for a pre operative plan the mortality risk score scheme for a patient undergoing intervention for abdominal aortic aneurysm the evr edges over the open aortic repair supra renal aortic surgery carries a four points like endovascular carries zero point age wise also there are two points given for more than 65 years and more than 75 years one point now we if we add up the score the endovascular repair has a lower mortality risk score in comparison to the open aortic repair so again if we go for the probability of mortality endovascular aneurysm repair is a better modality than, rather than the open aortic repair risk of mortality is lower supra renal open aortic repair is a very very risky procedure and mortality of the patient increases multifold now we look at the comparison of some trials dream trial eurostar evar and over the latest one was carried out in late 2002 and beyond it all favors that endovascular repair has got a better profile less mortality early recovery <clears throat> now we look at the aortic zones if we start from the ascending aorta our case lands in zone 6 and 7 zone 6 is where the celiac artery originates and zone 7 is where the superior mesenteric artery originates so this is being a saccular aneurysm means it has a neck which is opposite to the celiac artery ostium and it is compressing in the vertebral area but since the patient doesn't have any neurological signs right now so we'll plan this case for endovascular intervention what would we do we put a covered stent in the supra renal aorta and end the graft at the upper border of the superior mesenteric artery we pre cannulate the superior mesenteric artery and celiac artery if there is a need we can do a chimney snorkel or we can use a branch device also we deploy the covered stent we embolize the celiac artery and if there is a need we choose to proceed with the chimney to the superior mesenteric artery or fenestrated device 
And in the last, we close the femoral groin axis with the ProGlide, which is a percutaneous vascular closure system. And if there are financial constraints, we can go ahead with a small arteriotomy in the groin. This is how the fenestrated devices look like. We can see there's a aneurysm stent graft in which the holes have been made and radiological markers have been created. And we can, through these fenestrations, put another covered stent into the branches. So this is another way how the fenestrations or scallops are made. This is how our case would look like. The given picture shows a fusiform aneurysm. But the diagrammatic representation shows a covered stent being deployed in the suprarenal aorta and there are two chimneys, one to the celiac artery and one to the superior mesenteric artery. In the first part of the picture, we can see the chimneys coming from the sandwich devices, one placed above the celiac artery and one placed across the celiac artery. And in between the two devices, we have two stent grafts which are giving flow to the celiac artery in the SMA artery superior mesenteric artery and in the transfer section the C picture shows how would it look like. Newer generation devices have very improved technology. They have very low profile that means 18 French to 20 French. Very sleek slender devices. Tip capture mechanism is very nice. They are resheathable. If the device is not appropriately uh, deployed we can resheath or recapture and the graft material is very excellent non-porous. So endoleaks are virtually very less. So this is a a diagrammatic presentation of our case we can see there is a large secular aneurysm just below the celiac artery and above the superior mesenteric artery renals are quite away we need one centimeter of sealing zone and this is how our covered stent should look like we embolize the celiac artery deploy a covered stent if required we do a snorkel or chimney to the superior mesenteric artery and we are good to go what do the guidelines say? EVAR should be considered a preferred treatment modality in most of the patients. It is reasonable to go for open repair if the patient is younger because younger patients should not receive the implant because they have a long life expectancy. So what is the advantages in endovascular? No laparotomy, no thoracotomy, minimal blood loss or no blood loss, very quick recovery, low end organ ischemia to the mesenteric vessels, there is no cross clamp in the aorta. Fewer respiratory complications because surgery would require intubation and long ventilation. Overall, EVAR edges above the open surgery in the given case. So my plan would be endovascular as the first strategy. Though I do not say that open surgery is not good, we should plan the intervention case to case based. Guidelines are our, for our guidance. They are not 100% sure that you should follow them judicious, uh, judiciously. Final good outcome is what that matters. Thank you. Dr. Vishal Gupta. Yeah. yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kamal, for the opportunity to speak. But when I got the topic, I already knew that I am fighting a losing battle. And I thought before I lay down my weapons, patient is a 77-year-old guy with an aneurysm. Everybody will keep coming on me. How can you do an open surgery for such a patient, an old man with a lot of comorbidities? I knew it was a difficult case to defend, but still would like to try and put my viewpoint. Tarun is an excellent, all said and done, is an excellent interventionalist doing phenomenal work with his aneurysms. But let us uh, try and make a point for surgeons here, right? So we'll not get into details of aneurysm uh, already. Most of the people know what aneurysms are and most of these abdominal aneurysms are asymptomatic to begin with and 70% of the times they are usually detected on an incidental ultrasound for some other pathology. And in case they are ruptured and in this patient, as you see, 77-year-old guy with by 9 and 11 into 13 size aneurysm, the incidence and the chances of rupture are very high and carry a very high mortality if the patients, if they are able to reach hospital, still they carry mortality upwards of 80%, right? So the treatment options, as Tarun also discussed, there are two treatment options, open surgery and endovascular stent grafting surgery. Open surgery would be either a midline approach or a retroperitoneal approach. In a patient who has had a previous surgery, we can go for a retroperitoneal approach so that we can avoid all the adhesions of previous surgery. But we don't know the history of this patient, whether he had any surgery in the past. 
But retroperitoneal approach, that way is a very safe approach because you don't enter the abdomen, you reflect everything medially and that entire aorta with cilia, exoperium, eccentric and renals are in your site to do any type of surgical procedure. So these are some of the pictures for surgery where we clamp. In this patient, because the aneurysm is arising at the level of superior mesentric, in all probability, if we do an open surgery, we will require to clamp at the level of crust of diaphragm. So this is how we expose. And type C, if you can see, this is the aneurysm, especially in this particular patient. It is an aneurysm which is arising at the level of suprarenal. So though endovascular is... Uh, Fantastic option if a person of this age would have come to me, the first thing that would have come to my mind would have been an endovascular repair. But it is a complex abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's not a regular routine uh, infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm in which endovascular strategies, even I would agree, they are phenomenal. But as Dr. Tarun in his talk said that in this patient, because the celiac superior mesentric renals are so close by to each other, you will end up either doing a fenestrated EVAR or fever, or you end up putting a chimney or a snorkel to supply blood to the celiac and superior mesentric. Whereas surgery, though technically challenging, but if centers which are doing such procedures on a routine basis, on a retroperitoneal approach in a patient who's otherwise fit, who does not have uh, severe LV dysfunction or he's not a bad smoker and does not have COPD, surgery would otherwise be a reasonably okay option wherein you replace the aneurysmal aorta with the Dacron graft and you can put, you can either re-implant these arteries or you can put a respective graft to these particular arteries. Or as you can see in the figure B, you can do a Carroll's technique where in you take out a mound of aorta with superior mesentric and the celiac and the uh, right renal and you put it on the grafted aorta and left renal, of course, if it is going to be get replaced with a graft, you put a graft to the left renal. So this is how it would look. The advantage of surgery would be, this is a very old time-tested technique. There is no incidence of uh, late aneurysm formations as it is to some extent common with endovascular techniques, once you put in a graft, the only ins uh, complications that you can see in an open technique over a long period of time are incisional hernias. That transperitoneal approach with retroperitoneal approach, the incidence of incisional hernia is negligible. Yes, I don't deny surgery have a significant incision. There will be a significant surgical time with patients at a 77 year old who have a lot of morbidities. So these things, they will come into play. But over a longer period of time, if you look the results, I'll come back at the results of all the trials. Now, what should you offer to this patient? Open surgery or EVAR? I think more than the patient preference, appropriate anatomical criteria are very critical in deciding between an open surgical repair versus endovascular. It's not stressed on his lecture is many times with these patients, you really don't know how much is the neck length, how much is the, the diameter of the aorta at that level, what is the angulation, because all these things come into play. It's not just, I, I can understand devices are fantastic and with uh, all new and new things coming in the market, it is really becoming technically very simple for an interventionalist to address these problems and a lot of fantastic options are there and we subject these patients at our center to endovascular on a very routine basis. And really, I'll definitely agree, makes the life much easier for such patients. But yes, there are ideal cases that you would need certain amount of length of the neck. The diameter of the aneurysm should be within the limits for that endovascular stent. The angulation should be ideal for placement of the stents. If all these things, they fit in, I would definitely agree that stent is a better option. But there are certain complications also associated with uh, endovascular uh, stent placements. But with masters like Tarun, deployment related complications, I won't even mention because with these newer stents, you really don't need to do a cut down in the femorals. All those complications which are related to cut down like hematoma, lymphocele, all those things can be taken care of and provided in place. These things are just not heard of. There are some device related like structural failure and related endo leaks, especially in this particular patient who is 
to end up getting a chimney or a snorkel in the celiac and superior mesenteric the chances of type one endo leak is a possibility in such patients right limb limb occlusion is definitely not a case stent migration sac these are just to name a few so get into details of endo leak classification this is one patient who would all an endo leak happens in these patients would be a type one endo leak so we just have to weigh the benefit endovascular over the long term the risk of device related complications the so survival rate the cost effectiveness most of the talks uh, that i've attended or listened to today end of the day it all boils down to the cost right when we are living in the era of my yojana ayushman bharat the moment patient enters and you shows you a ct scan of a large aneurysm Definitely, Tarun. I would tell you the first thing that comes to our mind is also endovascular. That if we can do an endovascular for him, but that would be wonderful. But the moment we open our mouth and utter six lakh, seven lakh, eight lakh, it's about oh my God, this is such a difficult thing. How can we do it? So endovascular is fantastic. But let me tell you, Tarun. Even a nicely done surgery for such patients, long term results are fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. We have done is seventy four. and that patient is still in follow up with us it has been 8 years now they are doing very well so cost effectiveness reinterventions radiation exposure yes in expert hands the amount of radiation i would not say is much so i would just again as you mentioned there are four major trials ivar1 ivar2 dream and over which compare endovascular with open surgery and as you would see in most of the results you would see the early mortality definitely with surgery endovascular has less but when you go over a period of 4 to 8 years the rate of reintervention with endovascular group is much higher compared to open surgery the open surgery the only reintervention would be for incisional hernia very few incidents of pseudoaneurysm formation at the site of graft implantation as you can see the complications for evar group yeah. is 41 over a period of 6 7 years compared to 9 of open surgery and the intervention is 20% compared to 6% in patients with open surgery so in endovascular repair 50% of the patients at the end of 5 6 years will get into some sort of trouble whereas 85% patients with open repair will have an uneven free survival so this is again endovascular evar2 this trial mainly compares endovascular with medical management and aneurysmal related deaths reduced from endovascular but there is no reduction in all cause mortality at a later stage in these patients similarly dream trial also compares endovascular most of the trials if you would see they come initial period definitely endovascular scores over open surgery but over a long period of time because of related to the device and the complications they have lot of reinterventions at a later stage so i would conclude by saying the anatomical suitability for evar is a proxy for complications and potential aneurysm related mortalities the rate of reintervention continues to increase with time regardless of the device the compliance with evar device guidelines is far too liberal i would say it's all related to demand and supply profiling industrial interests so patients with acceptable operative risk and longer life expectancy though this patient does not fit in that criteria are best still best candidates for open surgery in high risk patients with marginal anatomical suitability or short life expectancy will not benefit from evar and so on so i think i would end as i still said because we talk of cost and cost is always a constraint so we can still offer surgery this is where tarun we will end up scoring it is very unfortunate that surgeries like this require an extreme amount of skill and surgical expertise but just on cost we lose it against you it is very unfortunate many times we also feel that it is a good treatment for patients and if you can get away with endovascular if the anatomical criteria are perfect and the device is perfect they definitely score but yes you will also end up getting some patients who will not be so affording to get a chimney and a device and a proglide and you may you may want to send them to surgery as dr mohit also said in his previous lecture that this is the surgeon up against the interventional cardiologist 
and the device industry. And we are trying somehow to keep ourselves up and about. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. No doubt surgery is evergreen. And uh, there is no doubt that surgical patencies have been extremely uh, well in the last 40 years. And uh, endovascular re-interventions are very high. Cost is a major issue. Planning is a major issue. Devices are not hand, hand means readily available. Uh, given a scenario, if this is an impending rupture, immediate surgical results are extremely well and they are uh, long lasting. But though uh, we should use them judiciously from case to case basis. Absolutely, totally agree. I am all for in a large subset of patients, totally agree with you. But yes, there would still be some cases in which you the technical challenge and I think there are certain endovasculars like fenestrated, it takes really time for the companies to prepare the graph for you, you check them a CT scan and based on the images, the distances, the length, they will make a fenestrated endovascular stent for you, all those things that take time. But in an emergent situations, yes, we the surgery definitely plays a role. Great. Dr. Kamal Bhai. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, we, we had discussed this uh, when we were framing the case, uh, whether to keep uh, a thoracic aneurysm or a abdominal aneurysm, and then we uh, decided to go for abdominal one. Thoracic, then I had framed that we'll keep uh, artery of Adam Kivik's coming from it, and then we decided it's a very small branch. And then I think uh, last year, Dr. Gajendra was there in that session as well. Uh, or no, I, I think Gajendra was in carotid session last year. But then we thought of that, whether maybe we will just discuss it out, uh, leave the Adam Kivix aside and discuss an, a AAA actually and then uh, take a call as to how to proceed. But I think we, uh, Dr. Vishal brought out very important concept of the angulation, 60 degrees. I think that's something that is often under-analyzed and uh, uh, probably over-treated as well, I believe. Uh, Dr. Tarun, your comments and over to chair, everyone, Dr. Gajendra, the rest of the chairpersons. So, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it was a very informative talk by Dr. Tarun, sir, and Dr. Vishal, sir. Oh, uh, I think local expertise also matters a lot in making the decision because uh, not everyone will be able to do a fenestrated uh, tevar. Mm -hmm. so, is an expert, but I don't think that such expertise will be available everywhere. So that too should be in consideration. And otherwise, as they have already told about the options, and uh, it was a very nice uh, session by both of them. Thank you. Last year, I could convince Kamal to keep the age at 50 so that let's keep it a little competitive. But this year, he did not show any money. This year, I had to favor Tarun. <laughs> no, no, but in all, Kamal, I have been listening to the talks. It has been wonderful and the meeting has been great. I think there, there is an important uh, person in the uh, team, Dr. Ritesh Bhai. He's a cardiac yeah. anesthetist, senior cardiac anesthetist. What is your experience about open surgical repair? How many cases do well? Yeah, surgical repair for these type of injuries, which is uh, actually doing nice. Uh, but we have seen your uh, endovascular repair, particularly the uh, patient with 110 kg weight and uh, endovascular. And in that patient, I see a very good result. We have to intubate that patient uh, 110 kg and you have done endovascular repair. So I think it is, it is more case to case. Based. Yes, true. So, overall, we should get a message that surgery versus endo, we should not favor either of the strategy. Surgeons are definitely our backbone. Without surgeons, cardiology doesn't exist. So, any bailout, surgeons are always there to bail us out. And we can't manage everything in cardiology. So, we have to understand that. Thank Same you. Holds true for us. Dr. Gaj uh, Dr. Rupesh, Dr. Riaz and Dr. Danish, your comments. Mm -hmm. Rupesh, you did an anaconda recently. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, a, a very excellent talk by Dr. Tarun sir and Dr. Vishal sir. Just, uh, I mean, uh, all has been mentioned by them. I just wanted to uh, seek sir's comments on uh, what is his, like if you do a multi-layer flow modulator for such a kind. I mean, we have so celiac and SMA is coming. And given that this is a secular aneurysm, just flow modulation, would it help in this case? Like how would it compare to other covered strain graphs that are available? Definitely multi-layer flow modulated MFM stents are available, but the cost of one stent is around 18 lakhs. 
it's much more than uh, three endovascular procedures. They are costing around four to five lakhs one endovascular. So MFM would cost 18 lakhs. It is much beyond the uh, expectations. Like MFM uh, registries are showing that branches keep on flowing thrombosis over a period of time. I think Dr. Vishal would uh, agree that they did one case uh, on the principles of MFM recently, few months back. Yeah, yeah, you remember that case. Yeah, that was, I think it was an infective etiology, Tarun. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Because we thought anything we do, maybe that patient was HIV positive and an infective etiology, we were not very sure. So we did this. It's a layered draft. Uh, I think one or two cases have been done. We were joined by Dr. P.C. Gupta from Hyderabad. And uh, it was a perforated stent. It was a, basically, it was not a covered stent. And we put three layers of stent, one over each, so that it continues to maintain flow into the renals. That patient got subsequently readmitted a couple of times with renal failure. And we had to dialyze him. But in the end, we had to, uh, that patient was taken in the cat lab. And then that stent was perforated in place. And we put a stent in the renal artery at a later stage. Same patient. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the basic principle of row modulation comes from any stent for that matter. Basically, the more number of layers you add, you're going to create more of laminar flow. So uh, even like the coronary aneurysms that we see, when you put a stent across a small aneurysm across, most of the time the laminarity would actually make the side branch aneurysms regress. So it's basically a physics principle of laminating the flow when you actually create a conduit which is going to create a, a laminar flow rather than turbulent flow. And the more number of layers that you have in a stent's design, more likely that you'll have more smooth and laminar flow, which is going to regress. So I think the cost, of course, is a big factor, as both of you have mentioned. But I believe uh, with time to come, uh, it, the technology per se is not extremely innovative. I mean, it's overpriced for the technological innovation that is involved into it. You know, 18 lakhs for... Uh, that compared to say a EVAR of which you can easily get in three or five or seven lakhs. So uh, I think the, the three layers shouldn't make it, you know, three times the cost because technology of creating them is pretty much the same. I think it's it's uh, just adding on a layer to it uh, beyond, of course, the side branch access and the other uh, parameters that you're talking about. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you sir. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chairpersons. Two fantastic talks. Uh, thank you, uh, moderators, Dr. Kapil, Dr. Gajinder, Dr. Ritesh, Dr. Rupesh, Dr. Riaz, Dr. Danish. Uh, we move to next session. And for that, I have moderators, Dr. Vishal Poptani, Dr. Anil Jain, and Dr. Nitin Jain. Uh, and I have Chairpersons, Dr. Swati Garikar, Dr. Tushar Gajar, and Dr. Tarun Parmar. We have a case on pediatrics. Over to Chairperson to introduce the speakers and the case, and then the debate. Over to Chair, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati Garikar or Dr. Tushar Gajar, please introduce the speakers and then we can have the case presentation, uh, case discussion. Yes. yes uh, I'm, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. All right. So, uh, pleasure being here. Good evening to all of you. We have Dr. Bhavik Champaneri from the prestigious UN Mehta Institute, Ahmedabad talking about uh, the case today of a 10-year-old with a BSD and his perspective on things. Dr. Bhavik. Yeah, so can I share my slides? Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so is slides visible? Hello? Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm thankful to the Committee of Cardiocon uh, for giving me this opportunity. So the case which has been given to me is basically a 10-year-old female uh, who is having exertional fatigue, uh, fatigue. She's in NYHA class 2. She's having a grade 4 by 6 systolic murmur and she's diagnosed to have a, a perimembranous VSD, which is measuring around 4 mm in diameter and which is uh, away from aorta 6 mm uh, in length. She is having a mild pulmonary arterial hypertension and QP by QS calculated is somewhere around 2.1 is to 1. So uh, looking at this data which has been provided, there is no doubt that this patient requires some sort of intervention. Uh, it can be either a uh, transcatheter device closer or it can be surgical closer. 
but being a pediatric cardiologist i'll always uh, prefer uh, transcatheter intervention because overall looking at the data it looks like a straightforward case for a device closer so my strategy would be to do transcatheter vsd device closer in this patient and my device selection would be 64 ado2 that's an amplexer duct occluder uh, second my approach would be atrial because uh, it's relatively easier you don't have to make atrovenous loop and you can finish uh, this device closer within i would say 15 20 minutes of time so uh, uh, so first of all uh, i don't have doubt on capabilities of our surgeon dr mishra uh, and i would say uh, it's beyond a point it's proven that sur uh, surgical vsd closer is very safe procedure very effective and it can be done without any um, uh, complication as well so my focus would be uh, how i will be justifying my procedure uh, would be on few advantages which i will focus uh, uh, over the surgical vsd closer and one more thing i would uh, uh, i have to confess that any uh, cardiologist or any pediatric cardiologist who is doing intervention he becomes more and more confident and he become more aggressive if you have a surgical backup like amit misra sir so i have to uh, uh, give respect to uh, surgeons as well because they increase our courage and they increase our aggression so coming to the uh, case so what what we, what is what are the advantages of transcatheter vsc device for us so first and uh, foremost we will avoid sternotomy by doing transcatheter vsc device for us we will avoid cardiopulmonary bypass by doing transcatheter device it will have a short icu and hospital stay it will have less icu complication because anyway child is going to stay less in icu it will have a less psychological issues so i have actually uh, focus more on psychological aspects of uh, surgery having a scar on body rather than uh, uh, listing the demerits of surgery because uh, anyway surgery is proven uh, to be very effective so i would focus more on a psychological aspects uh, of uh, having a surgery versus transcatheter device closer and first is a sternotomy scar so actually once you do sternotomy that scar is going to have with you for your lifetime and no one has given thought how uh, that scar is going to affect is day to day life or various domains of life and this is the study uh, uh, where I, which i have come across where they have studied the uh, effect or significance of sternotomy scar it was a questionnaire based study 100 patients were included in the study all were adults above 18 years of age 53 were male and 47 were female so on asking question nearly 60% felt that uh, having a scar affected their life during adolescence period so 60% of patients told that adolescence they were very much conscious and they were it was affecting significantly to have a scar on their chest 60% felt their body has been disfigured by having a sternal scar 50% of population feels that they want to conceal the scar so that again uh, uh, shows ke how uh, mental uh, mental trauma or i would say what is the psychological impact of having a scar on them attention or uh, to the scar by other people 19% felt that they have they are having a negative impact on or, or, on attention to the scar With nearly 60% felt they are not feeling anything to that and actually 23% had a positive effect they were feeling positive to have a scar on the chest there was no effect of uh having a scar on choice of their career success in life friendship sexual life etc coming to uh, cardiopulmonary bypass complications there are pl plenty of complication which has been described and various reason for that but with over a period of time with newer strategy ctv strategy this complication has overall come down significantly and nowadays we don't see much of complication but i if i i i, I would say ki majority of uh, cardiologists cardiac surgeon and intensivists sees a complications which is related to cardiopulmonary bypass and we come across very frequently a cases where you, you have a renal dysfunction or liver dysfunction post cardiopulmonary bypass often it improves over a period of time but it accounts for some morbidity and increase in your icu and hospital stay uh, coming to psychological impact this is an important paper published in cardiology in the young where they have actually studied what is the psychological impact of having a surgery and what is psychological impact of having a device closure and in this study they assessed and compared the behavioral and emotional outcomes after surgery 
or transcatheter closure of BSD device. Actually, it was again a, uh, a checklist was given to parents about child's behavior. And another 28 item question and was also given to assess parent psychological stress which they are uh, undergoing after surgery or after device closure. 29 patients were in a uh, surgical group and 35 patients were in a uh, device group. The results was behavioral problems were greater in both the groups when it was compared to normative data or normal population. But when you compare between the surgical and de uh, device group, the depression and somatic complaints were higher in patients who have undergone surgery and risk factors which were found to be uh, significant were young age at repair to have a sternal scar, atrioventricular block, maternal anxiety, etc. So uh, this is again, it's, it, it focuses that psychological trauma after surgery is uh, 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 relatively on a higher side as compared to transcatheter device closure. Uh, what is data on comparing uh, the VSD device versus VSD surgical closure? And this is a, a randomized control trial which I have come across, which was published in Jack in 2014, where they have actually compared uh, in a randomized manner, percutan uh, perimembranous VSD device versus VSD surgery. Actually, they uh, after analyzing 465 patients, totally 101 patients were analyzed who were having uh, transcatheter device closure and 99 patients underwent surgical closure. And if you look at the chart, both the groups were actually age matched, weight matched. So there was no discrepancy. Actually, manifestations were also more or less similar. Echocardiographic data and invasive data were also not significantly different. They were more or less similar. So they wanted to... Uh, have two groups which are more or less in a similar aspect. But if we look at the procedural details, blood transfusion requirement was significantly higher in patients who underwent surgical group. Procedural duration, if we look, which was very high in patients who have undergone surgical group, hospital and ICU stay obviously was higher in patients with a surgical group. Most important thing was time to return to normal activities. So this is very important in uh, current scenario. Uh, that time to return to normal activities was significantly higher. That was somewhere around 18 days in, in a surgical group while patients with device closure uh, were normal after three to four days of procedure. When we are looking at major adverse events, uh, there is no difference between surgery and uh, transcatheter group. Minor adverse events, they found that surgical group was having a significantly increased uh, risk of minor adverse events, but they included actually blood transfusion as a minor event. So if we remove this blood transfusion, there was again no, not much of difference between surgical and transcatheter group. You can see here arrhythmias were also more or less similar in both the groups. Uh, this is another uh, uh, study which I have come across. It's a systematic review uh, published in CAT CVI in 2015. Uh, total 3,300 patients uh, were enrolled in the study. Device patients were around 1,300. Surgical patients were around 1,800. Success rate when they, it was compared between surgery and device group, it was more or less similar with a p-value of 0.67. Major complication they included death, re-operation, uh, permanent pacemaker implantation for heart block, and there was no significant difference between these two groups. The residual stunt again, which was significant, was again not. Uh, uh, it was similar in both the groups with p-value of 0.41. Aortic regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, they also found to have similar in both the groups. Need for blood transfusion and hospital stay was higher in patients with surgical group. Uh, what is Indian data? Uh, so I have taken four case series, which are the largest case series of uh, published from India. The first one is from UN Meta, having a, a, a case series of four, 430 patients. Dr. Nageshwara is from Hyderabad, Dr. Jairangnathan from Bangalore, and Dr. Parath Talvi from Mumbai. And if you see the number, it's a quite a good number uh, published before 2012. Uh, and uh, the majority of patients undergoing VSD device were perimembranous VSD device closer. And if you look at the success rate, it is very high, more than 98% in majority of series. And if you look at the incidence of hard block post uh, procedure, uh, it comes to less than 1%, or I would say around 1%, and risk of embolization was somewhere around 1%. Uh, on follow up, they didn't have any patient with complete heart block uh, with nearly three to four years of follow up, and residual strength was also not very significant in uh, follow up. Uh, so, I would, I, would, I would like to have a case example similar to the case provided to me. It's an eight year old female. She's having five to six mm of perimembranous BSD and aortic rim of seven mm. 
This is an echo picture. You can see LLV is dilated. This is a perimembrane is VSD, measuring 6 mm, and aortic rim is around 7 mm. Patient has been taken into cath lab. She underwent integrated venous approach device closure uh, using 10-8 ADO1, that's an amplexed duct occluder 1. Uh, post procedure angio suggesting no significant residual flow. This is a post procedure eco picture showing mild or trivial TR and device in good position with no residual flow. Similar 14 year old female, she is also uh, diagnosed to have moderate perimembranous VSD, but she is having a severe tricuspid regurgitation because of indirect hair bone. Uh, actually, patient was referred for surgery. On evaluation, we found to have moderate perimembranous VSD and significant TR, as you can see here. Uh, patient was taken into cath lab, she underwent device closure with a 10-8 ADO1 device and TR has come down significantly with eventual uh, uh, TR remaining mild, device in good position, no aortic regurgitation, no residual flow across device. So this, I wanted to highlight another case. So uh, it's not always surgeon who is bailing out uh, uh, cardiologists. Cardiologists are also there bailing out surgeons. So this is another case, 12 year old uh, male patient who has underwent intracardiac repair for tetralogy of fellow and he's coming back after, uh, after six to eight months with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, right ventricular dysfunction, severe uh, and uh, residual VSD of around 9 mm. After discussion with surgeon, patient was taken into cath lab. He underwent VSD device closure with a 12 mm muscular VSD. Uh, Darling, device. Yeah, time is up. You try to uh, conclude. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just finishing. Yeah. 12 mm muscular device, patient did well uh, and he is uh, two years post procedure follow up, he is doing well. So, coming to the conclusion, if we are selecting cases very carefully, intervention is superior to surgery if we look at in terms of cosmetic results, psychological outcome, financial result as well, hospital IC paid, blood transfusion requirement. Transcatheter intervention is non-inferior to surgery in terms of major and minor complications. So I would like my child to have a normal chest without scar as compared to a scarred chest. Thank you. And I will uh, look forward to Dr. Amit Misra sir for his uh, uh, explanation towards surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavik. Very enlightening. Let's now look at what Dr. Amit Mishra has to say. He's a senior pediatric cardiac surgeon, also from UN Meta. Dr. Mishra. My slides are visible now. Yes, sir, it's visible. Sir. You can go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, the details of the patients and most of the advantages of devices are already covered by Dr. Bhavik. And he's already covered 50% of my things. Uh, debate should be um, there as we get to see a lot of variety of the cases, variety of the VSDs and all that, there is always some controversy whether it can be done better in a device or it can be done surgically. Being a surgeon, I always think that it can be, it's a simple thing, can be done on the surgically. But no doubt, no doubt, surgery is not, not free from uh, any side effects or complication because surgery is surgery. A lot of people are involved, anesthetists are involved, heart lung machine is involved. <laughs> pre-operative, post-operative, inotrop, ICU care, blood, all these things are involved. So if, if a good job can be done in by intervention cardiologist, we have no harm. We have absolutely no harm. Like in this patient, 10 year girl, 4 millimeter VST, 2 is to 1 shunt, no subaortic membrane, no right ventricular outflow tech obstruction. I, I, I think that in a 10 years old girl with a restrictive VST for so many years, there must be some fibrosis in right ventricular outflow tech. Possibility of same. There is a possibility that right coronary cusp is prolapsing, and maybe that, that this is the tricuspid valve uh, is obstructing the VSD. That is possible. But having said that, 
the case is different what we are discussing now and honest honestly speaking we hardly see such case we hardly see such a clean case for vsc closure because the cardiologists are gatekeeper they will finish and you don't even know that such patient has admitted or gone home unless there is some problem then only we are in picture otherwise for such cases we are not been called out now catheter management ado and this is the first time i was going through ado 1 2 3 and uh, avp 2 they are not yet i recently saw in the article i don't remember the year which it is published but they are not yet us fda approved and device closure is recommended as whenever you have a 2 to 3 mm rim just beyond below the aortic annulus now and device has its own complications there is a higher incidence of arrhythmia we don't see so many arrhythmias in a clean vsd closure like this there is a very high incidence of complete heart block if you go by surgery there is less than 2% especially if the experts are there then less than 1% incidence of heart block right bundle left bundle branch block and there is a very high almost 3.2% incidence of the permanent pacemaker implantation other there can be a traumatic injury to the tricuspid wall aortic wall ar is there ar is most of the time it is progressive once the ar is developed or you injure the aortic wall there is a fair chance that ar is going to progress over a period of time then we also get a residual vsd especially if it is at the junction with the tricuspid wall there is a possibility of 1 mm vsd residual vsd can be there but most of the time it should heal so devices also have a incidence of the 5 to 6% Uh, incidence of the uh, residual vsd then there is a pos- possibility of uh, iatrogenic embolization it may go to any place once it is you have in, uh, left the device it may go into aorta into pulmonary artery or into branch pulmonary arteries anywhere and cost is of course a major factor devices are are expensive one more thing which i was going through the article there is no long term study which has shown what is the status of left ventricular outflow tract especially after 5 years or 10 years of device because these are a nitilol mesh there is a endothelialization and that that endothelial portion is going to come in the left ventricular outflow tract so how it is going to behave over a period of time that we don't know when we put a patch it is on the rv side only and it is just thin less than 1 mm diameter of the patch 0.4 mm in fact so the left ventricular outflow tract is not a question in vsd surgical closure so this i am not sure how the uh, in the coming time this left ventricular outflow tract issue will be there and how the patient will be behaving in the coming time especially the post device closure because you are close to two valves and the left ventricular outflow tract then this is one of the article we have published few years back i still remember that patient he was a small 8 to 10 years old child from the rajasthan and uh, he had vsd ps in fact there was a ps also so they did the balloon dilatation of the pulmonary stenosis and did the device closure of the perimembranous vsd incidentally this device is slipped into the arch but the cardiologist was so aggressive that he has pulled back the device and put it again into the perimembranous vsd and after 4 years 4 hours i got a call that device is embolized back into the arch so in emergency i have to go back and i have to remove this device it was just in front of the innominate artery and you can see the device is quite large it can obstruct both innominate as well as the carotid artery can have major disasters so devices are not free from the complication this is what i believe i've done few more cases but this i could this is we have published so i could immediately retrieve all these things so this is we have retrieved the device and see last device in a 8 year old child from the ascending aorta then i would like to conclude here that please do it devices we um, we all are working basically for the patients whenever it is safe please do it and the best part you people have you always have a surgeon on your phone call so if you if you are any mess we are there if we are there you know but you will not come and rescue the yeah, of course you have shown the examples that you are coil embolizing residual vsd this that's a joint effort no doubt but you know if some if there is a surgical bleeding there's nobody you are the only one or maybe glue that's all these are the two things which you are going to help so and uh, i personally believe we can close these kind of vsd and we can retrieve also if it is required from here there we are well versed with the i told you if the surgeon is experienced there's less than 1% chances i believe i don't know exactly what is my result but less than 1% chances of heart blocks in there 
and we can avoid injury to the aortic valve tricus especially if the surgeon is experienced this least chances of tricuspid valve injury or aortic valve injury or if there tiny pfo that will also be close if there is small pda that is also will be taken care so all these things are complementary when you are doing this thank you thank you very much i think i am in time <coughs> any questions Thank you. Is is Dr. Tushar there, my co-chairs or the moderator? So just one thing. You told that it's not US FDA approved, but most of the device you told are US FDA approved. I have seen in the article. Yeah, but LVOT uh, actually uh, it's never a concern because uh, no one, nowhere, uh, uh, anyone has found to have LVOT unless it's a very much oversized device. Usually on follow-up, also we haven't come across a single case. Where LVOT O is a concern, no, but still, it's a long term. It's a long term. There are there are article which says that there is a nitrolol disc lying on, on the LV side of the VSD. Yes, and yes, it lies definitely. So thin, thin subaortic membrane gives you the gradient. Yes. If this fibrous tissue keep increasing, there is a possibility. I am just saying that this is there is a possibility that these things can can occur in the future. I am not saying this will happen, but there is a possibility. Ki, you may see these things in the coming future and you are close to two valves tricuspid aortic conduction all this all the area around the vsd is surrounded with the problem but it's still you go and put it we don't mind in muscular vsd and all that you please do it and as i said earlier please do it we are there don't worry in the last case which i uh, posted post uh, surgical that was for my uh, safety i was sure you are going to jump on something so i had to show that case <laughs> Is it my case? I don't remember this picture. <laughs> I think it's a great discussion on this uh, simple case. Uh, it's good to have this such simple case for surgeon, uh, but I think cardiology should do this case uh, uh, very nicely. I have a few points to say uh, as a surgeon. Being a surgeon, I would like to say that many a times, uh, straightforward VST, as Dr. Mishra has already mentioned, they have severed, uh, they have non-obstructive subaortic membrane, which you might have missed on the echo. You have missed many a times such patients going into gasudization, which is not producing even PS. They have bundles in the RVOT. They have additional PDA. And most of the time, such simple case, but there are a lot of corda crossing there. And your device is hanging in between and you are damaging the tricuspid one. So we have retrieved such cases, uh, such devices on uh, such simpler cases. Uh, coming to the point of scar, I think 10-year-old can be done, such simple VST can be done through minimally invasive VST closure through thoracotomy. Is it possible? That is also a possibility. So uh, given a point, if it is a really straightforward case, no cord crossing across, device is best. But yes, long-term results are required for the uh, knowing the LVOT obstruction because our patch even causes uh, some amount of... Uh, fibrosis on the LV side and leads to subaortic membrane later on and produces LVOT obstruction. And when this such big disc is prolapsing into the LVOT, it is going to produce LVOT obstruction in future. Probably it may come up after few more years and then we'll see retrieving device and putting a patch again. No, it is horrible. It is horrible. To it's going to be a horrible. It goodness. will be a nightmare for us. It, it is just not possible. Then it will cause damage to the aortic wall as well as it will cause conduction damage. Well. You, will, you will not get such case, sir. We, we uh, pray uh, to God no, that you, it you should not do, come. Because, but uh, we are just predicting the possibility. Unless the predicting, possibility, yes. problems will come, we can't comment anything. Yes. Okay. That's a nice discussion. Thank you, both Thank of you. you. Thank you, sir. Tarun you wanted to say something? Nice discussion and uh, very nice psychological aspect uh, bring uh, on by the Bhavit Chapaneri. Uh, we do not, you know, uh, uh, very much uh, concern about those things. We are very much into the intervention and surgery, but the psychological aspect is very important. And as Dr. Mishra said, like uh, being very aggressive uh, on every every intervention and every VSD to do device closer, like. In this case, uh, like uh, there is six millimeter of margin is there, but sometimes uh, interventional cardiologists become so aggressive because of availability of the surgeon that there are chances of AR. And uh, when we do the uh, device closure from the aortic valve, so because of the cable and everything, we cannot judge properly. 
uh, before releasing the theme. So any degree of AR, it will increase in the future and all. So tricuspid valve involvement and other associated lesion always go for the surgery. But otherwise, if this is the, I mean, straightforward, pretty straight, straightforward case for the device closure. Otherwise, uh, one need to, you know, a properly evaluate the case and then accordingly decide. Very nice. Uh, my question to all of you, 10-year-old uh, presenting 2.2, I think Dr. Mishra pointed it out, UPQS, quantification, would it matter whether it's echocardiographic, invasive? Uh, again, uh, European guidelines are more strict for perimembranous because of the CHB and the rhythm disturbances and the subsequent LV dysfunction for devices. American guidelines, though they are not FDA approved for the devices per se, as Dr. Mishra pointed out, but are more liberal in terms of doing uh, devices. So comments from all the chairs and uh, uh, panel. I think we have, yeah, sorry, sorry, ma'am, continue. No, please go ahead, Dr. Bhavik. I think we have enough data from Indian cities as well, sir. We have actually 2012 before, uh, 2014. Problem is in India, we don't publish. Yeah. No, it's the published guideline, what I'm telling, sir. Published yeah, the guidelines sir. still don't call perimembranous into class one, as far as I know. I mean, yeah, you can yeah. clarify. It's a class two indication for perimembranous. Yes, true, sir. But still, that guideline will change over a period of experience. Yeah, we'll see. Agree. So, um, uh, if I may add, uh, it's very clear that the way for a PDA, it's standard of care that transcatheter is one. It's not true for a perimembranous VSD. It is not. So, I don't know if Dr. Kamal had me on as a chair purposefully. I'm a non-interventional pediatric cardiologist and perhaps I have a unique perspective because of that. I believe that the most important aspect here is patient selection, number one. I feel all patients uh, pre-intervention or pre-surgery need to have the feedback from both the cardiologist and the surgeon. The surgeon should know that such and such patient is going to the cath lab. And uh, I think I think that's where the whole thing lies. I think uh, once it's decided it's a transcatheter uh, procedure, then everything should be straightforward because your whole strategy should be you know sorted out. Uh, I would also say that follow up is vital, whether you do it surgically or you do it in the cath lab. Follow up one year, five years, ten years later is vital. And. Uh, um, uh, I, I think as long as we remember that, you know, whether a surgeon or a cardiologist, we are working for the patient, I think everything falls in place. Thank you. Thank you all, both of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swati, Dr. Tushar, Dr. Tarun, Dr. Anil, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Nitin Jain, uh, yes, and both the speakers, Dr. Bhavik and Dr. Amit, you did wonderful. Uh, Thank you, Kamal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Very well organized. Thank you for being here. Yeah, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.